Hi everyone, and welcome to this longer than usual take on a series of games and the story of their development. Those of you who are regulars here know that while the Legend series has a few entries under its belt, it's rare for me to tackle such a big project like this. And all things considered, this isn't something I'll be making a regular attempt at. If you're new here, then please come in and sit down and enjoy our little campfire talk. And then maybe take a look around at a few of the other talks we've had here. Maybe leave a like and a comment and a sub while you're at it. I basically make content about whatever games I want to play and do it in whatever way I want at the time. I don't think chasing the algorithm is a good way to go about building an audience per se. Unless of course you're really looking to build the latest channel with all the hottest takes on whatever is trending at the moment. But I don't know if you've seen the things people choose to get upset about on here, but I'm really not interested in any of that. That being said, I do try to look for places where the algorithm and my personal interests intersect, which is basically how this happened and how it became one massive video rather than five smaller ones. Like a lot of you, I'm sure, I'm something of a fan of I Finished a Video Game and other channels that make multi-game content like him. One of my first interactions with this kind of content was actually Pixlr Day's two-hour retrospective on Ninja Theory, telling the stories of their games and threading it together with the larger narrative of the studio. It's a very heartfelt piece that really doesn't feel like two hours by the time you've got to the end of it. And I heartily recommend you all go take a look if you get the time. So that and I Finished a Video Game's lengthy talk about the Lord of the Rings games were my big inspirations here. The Divinity games have been on my radar for quite some time, not least because I was in a semi-regular online Original Sin 2 game with a few bros over here. At that time, I had absolutely no idea what was going on story-wise, as our rogue, who'd already finished the game several times, would just run off and get all the quests while the rest of us went shopping, and we'd then just mess about getting into absurd combat situations and cheesing the ever-loving crap out of every fight that we could. It's a really good time, but not the best way to get immersed into the story and the world of Rivalon. Prior to that though, the entire catalogue of games had wound up in my Steam account as a result of various sales, and they'd all seen several hours of play, proving themselves to be fun and things I wanted to explore further later, before sliding smoothly into the backlog sandwiched between Dishonored 2 and Ninja Theory's DMC game, which incidentally, I absolutely love. So when I got the idea to try this out and needed a series to work on, these leapt out at me, and the upcoming Baldur's Gate 3 release also played a big part in me deciding on this as my project. The issue of course is that these aren't 6 or even 10 hour action or horror games, these are 60 to 120 hour RPGs full of deep stories, well-crafted characters, exotic lands to explore, and basically all the stuff I love in games. But still, man this was going to take a long time. I'm not one to shy away from a challenge though, and I knew that if I fell off the horse early, I could always just do a couple of the games as individual videos and leave it at that. Which brings us to today, with you sitting at your PC or on your phone, maybe in your bedroom or on a train or in a cafe, Maybe you're taking a dump and watching this intro wondering when the hell I'm going to get to the point. Fair enough. Let's get started then. Before we do that though, I do have a Twitter. I'm never calling it X. Which I don't use anymore. I mean, I share video links there, but honestly, fuck that place. I have a Facebook page that nobody follows, but as soon as people do start to follow it, I'll begin sharing things there. You can tip me a coffee here, and if you do like what you see, please throw me a comment. I especially love hearing about other people's experiences with the games I cover. We all have only one story to tell after all, and that's our own. So since you're here listening to a little of mine, why not share with me a little of yours? This should probably go without saying for a video of this size, but from here on out, expect spoilers. Lots of spoilers. Okay losers, get in the car. We're going to save Rivalon.
I've been going back and forth on the order in which to talk about these games for quite some time now. I am a story first kind of gamer, and I love talking about stories, themes, and getting a little philosophical here, which had me thinking I wanted to talk about these games using their story timeline rather than development. This is not only because that's very interesting for me, but also because I think games matter. I think games are one of the best and most important art forms and creative mediums we have. It's one thing to watch a movie or read a book about a protagonist dealing with serious mental trauma. It's quite another to move that character around and be a part of their struggles. The other side of this though is the story of Larian themselves, which, to put it mildly, has been one of great tribulation and struggle but is ultimately a very inspiring story of success against all the odds, about how game development can be poisoned by publisher greed, and how foregoing said publishers and chasing a creative vision can produce a final project that ultimately speaks for itself, and elevates a studio out of relative cult status and into the realms of true success, leading to Larian making the games they dreamed about making back when they were just a bunch of friends coding their Ultima 7 fanfiction into an actual game in their spare time. So while I do love a good romp through worlds of fantasy, I think it's best if we stick to the release schedule here. In truth, while the games do jump around the timeline somewhat, this is no indication that they were designed with some great long-running continuity at the start. Back when the talking cat Ahu was written into Divine Divinity, no one in the writing room had any notion of Bracus Rax or his Soulforge sister Cassandra. Hell, Soulforges hadn't even been conceived at that point. This is okay though, because Divinity isn't a series that relies on heavy, consistent lore across all of its games, and Rivalon and its various races, and even their unique aesthetic looks, is something that's been patched together over time and, much like Evolution, only looks like something that was designed with a grand purpose when viewed in hindsight. So, that's nothing to worry about really. Well, it could be argued that programming is the ultimate barrier to game design, it is by no means the only obstacle a development team has to overcome. Even in the modern world of proprietary game engines offering code-free game development, there are still numerous mountains to climb to get from idea to finished product. So, back when even the game engine had to be built from the ground up, well, you can see how much harder it was, and how naive you'd have to be to think that you and your mates could have code meetups after your day jobs and put together the bestest RPG ever in your spare time. But I feel like all the best developer stories start this way. The road from game concept to final product is long, filled with hard work and a lot of redundancy. No work is truly wasted if something has been learnt from it, but delays and development hell can come from the best of intentions as well as mismanagement. The final release project is nearly always something smaller that was carved out of a much bigger and more ambitious idea. The problem arises from not really knowing how well a big idea will actually work, or what it will contribute to a game, until you've actually put in the work to make it and test it. This is actually why, in the modern gaming landscape, AAA games are very formulaic and derivative. They're playing it safe, bringing in features that have survived the trial by fire, and leaving the innovation to the indie devs who operate with much smaller overheads and as such, much less risk overall. Then they just see what is good over there and bring it into their own games. Creatively bankrupt for sure, but also smart business practice. I'm getting a little off topic here already, but my point is, it's easy to have a big idea. To want to make a game and just put all the things into it. But the reality of level design, character animation, concepting a gameplay loop, and the endless, endless debugging is much less glamorous than that. Ragnarok Unless was the product of Larian's first attempt at creating an RPG, and was an incredibly ambitious project for a fledgling development team, with nothing under their belt. In the fairly lengthy Divinity Anthology Developers Journal, that can be found in the Extras folder for the PC version of Divinity 2 Developer's Cut. There's a pretty in-depth look at how Larian formed, and how they started their journey to making one of the greatest RPGs ever made, and the many pitfalls they had along the way doing just that. A developmental build of the final form of this game is also available for people who buy any of these three games on GOG. Unfortunately, my copy is on Steam, which of course meant I had to buy the damn thing again to get this. You're welcome for the $5, Sven. Buy yourself a nice coffee. Starting back in 1996, 
The design document for Ragnarok Unless, at least the parts we can see, is overly ambitious to say the least. The list of features reads, This plot gradually unfolds to the player in a series of unpredictable and impressive events of a sort that has never been seen in games of this genre. To reach the ultimate goal, the player and his party have to solve a series of quests which are all very non-linear and original. These are not limited to picking up an object and bringing it to a certain place, as is often the case in games of this type, but range from influencing natural events to seducing somebody. The fighting part of the game is fast-paced and happens in real time, more than often resulting in a complete war since characters that pass the fighting area get involved. This can happen because a lot of attention has been given to the artificial intelligence that drives the in-game characters. To any situation the player causes, they will react. Alternatively, if the player chooses to stand still and just watch them, they will also act, just to make life a bit more interesting. We can see here a lot of big ideas, especially pertaining to a world space that isn't focused on the player, where people just live their lives and everyone has their own day and night routine. This is something elaborated on in later documents used for the game when it was picked up by its second publisher, the first being Atari who pivoted to other things well before release. And the project had transitioned into what would be its final form known as The Lady, The Mage and The Knight, a game I'll be referring to as LMK from now on to avoid breaking the pacing here. Here's another little snippet from an LMK design document. There will be a high level of inter-NPC communication. Using built-in messenger boards, the NPCs are capable of interacting with each other in what seems an intelligent fashion. Examples of this are trade, exchanging of rumors, and combat communication. This is expressed to the player using speech samples. Trade communication is witnessed that when a player trades with an NPC, and later comes back to trade back something he gave to that NPC, the NPC might have traded it to someone else. When a player steals something and someone sees this, this creates a rumor. The rumor spreads as the NPCs that saw it talk to other NPCs, who in turn talk to other NPCs again. But as they talk, they thicken the story. You know, the sort of thing Peter Molyneux would tell you is going to be in his next game without any way of knowing how any of it could possibly work, rather than keep it on a secure design document to share just among his team. One huge problem I find with these kinds of features though, is considering to what extent they contribute anything to the player experience. Skyrim, for example, has a full day-night cycle, with shops that open and close at certain times, and NPCs who walk through various scripted daily actions, and have various interactions with each other. And while it's pretty exciting the first time you see it, and puts up a good illusion of a living world, in a 100 plus hours RPG, the cracks start to show quickly. It not only becomes clear that these are just robots cycling through a very limited number of pre-scripted interactions, but it ultimately degenerates into something I ignore at best and actively annoys me at worst. It's a pain to arrive back at Whiterun at night and find everywhere I want to go to closed, and then have to sleep or wait till morning to get on with the game. These features are things that might impress other developers and people who appreciate what's going on under the hood, but your average player isn't going to pick up on even a fraction of it. That's why this stuff really needs pushing to a secondary or tertiary position, compared to locking down those gameplay loops, figuring out your overall player experience, and then building your world and your story around that. Feature creep comes later, if at all. Now, I've mentioned publishers already, and Larian went through two with this game. They had no idea how to market a game, and I quote, We figured that if we would just make a good game, eventually some publisher would pick it up. Yes, we were that naive. Oh, how I wish things were better now. Well, actually, they kind of are. Small indie studios have access to Steam and other online marketplaces for sales, and early access and content creators, and social media, to help promote their products. But this was the late 90s, and digital distribution wasn't a thing yet. Games, even PC games, had to be in shops, on shelves, in those glorious big boxes that I miss so much. 
and they needed to promote the game through the regular channels such as gaming magazines and television. It was while they were partnered with Attic Entertainment that Unless became LMK, and grew into the story of the three titular protagonists washing up on a beach, something we'll be seeing a lot more of later, and each character having their own adventure that leads to them coming together and forming the party that would finish the story. Multiplayer was a big component here, with players being able to control different characters and go on the adventure together. Also, the high degree of interactivity that would become a staple of Larian games started here, along with all the other crazy systems and AI they wanted to try and jam into this game. Now, you can no doubt imagine, as a fledgling team taking on a ludicrously overly ambitious project, they encountered a lot of problems. As this was before the existence of engines like Unity or Unreal, that provide all kinds of out-of-the-box functionality, they were building their engine from the ground up, and their engine was 8-bit, or 256 colors. Not something that would have been a problem until E3 1998, when this happened. The Wanderer. Yes, it was... It was The Wanderer. We're talking about ARPGs here. This was always coming. Diablo 2 was developed with a 16-bit engine, and in the pre-retro revival world that still equated graphics with game quality, Attic were very scared that their new RPG wasn't going to stand up to this giant, and requested that Larian scrap their existing build and start redeveloping the game from the engine up with 16-bit graphics. To say this represented a significant delay, and something that was going to cost plenty of money, would be something of an understatement. Now, I get it. Developers, and indeed publishers for their own reasons, want to create a project that everyone can be proud of. Something that represents the best of all the hard work that has gone into it, and something that will reflect well on the publisher's brand. So, boosting the graphics was a smart move in that sense, but let's be real here. We've all heard the stories of many a game's development hell, and having to restart a game in a new engine from the ground up, well, that's the stuff that cautionary tales of horrific launches and review bombs are made of these days. In 1999, despite significant progress being made, the plug was ultimately pulled on LMK, and the rights to the game and the name became entangled to the point that with their current financial problems, it was better for Larian to cut their losses and move on. I am glad that years later, they were able to clear all that up and release this tech demo. With everything that's to come at the end of this story of theirs, it's a hell of a sense of closure on an incredibly shaky start. And so, with a lot of hard-learned lessons under their belt, Larian began working on their next RPG. Something that would be smaller and tighter in scope. A game that would prioritize the important things, but keep all those interesting interactions that Larian worked into LMK. So I think for now, it's time to step away from Sven and the gang. Don't worry, we will come back to them. But for now, a fantastical world of magic and fantasy awaits. It's finally time to enter the realm of Rivalon and talk about Divine Divinity. Divine Divinity is a top-down, isometric, somewhere in between that, ARPG that plays a lot like Diablo. Okay, psych, it's nothing like that at all. The combat may feel a lot like Diablo, and the opening hours of the game are quite deceptive in presenting a very Diablo 1 style experience, but this is much closer to a CRPG than an ARPG. Okay, that was a lot of acronyms and so forth there, so let's just quickly clear that up. ARPG, of course, stands for Action Role Playing Game, where the focus is primarily on the combat loop, and increasing the player's stats so that they can become an overpowered Giga Chad and smash the late game enemies. A CRPG, or computer role playing game, is basically something like Baldur's Gate or Fallout. While these games do have complex character development systems and a lot of combat, this is in service of a larger experience that concerns exploring and discovering a world, meeting lots of cool characters, and going on great adventures. Given the muddy definition of gaming genres, I tend to categorize them by their player experience rather than any specific set of mechanics that work in service of that. Resident Evil 7 is in first person, and you use a gun. 
but it is not a first person shooter. Welcome to the family, son. I said in my Final Fantasy IX review that the core of an RPG was its world and its characters. When I play Final Fantasy, I'm not playing the game to make the numbers go up like I would in something like Diablo or Torchlight. I'm making the numbers go up so that I can explore the world more and learn more about its story. That's the difference, at least in my mind, between an RPG and an ARPG, and why Divine Divinity, despite looking and feeling very Diablo at times, is to my mind much less one and much more the other. You'll probably notice that there's some startling differences in resolution between some of the footage here, and I do apologise for that. When playing older games, I tend to look for patches and guides while it's installing. I've had plenty of bad experiences exploring Abandonware games for this channel. As such, I found a HD patch for the game and ran that right up until a significant point where I had to use scrying stones and the game just crashed. For those who haven't played this yet, this is a very common bug, and I was only able to fix it by switching the rendering to software mode and stepping down the resolution significantly, which for a 2023 rig was no problem at all. As well as fixing the bugs though, I realised just how much detail I'd been missing out on with these absolutely gorgeous sprites for all the various characters and creatures in the game, and so I decided to continue playing with this much more zoomed in perspective, and I'd say overall I made the right move. So starting up the game brings up the main menu and just some absolutely divine music that I could quite happily sit and listen to all day if you'd let me. But since that's not what anyone is here to do, let's open things up and take a look at the intro and get a sense of our setup. The opening cutscene has two parts to it, and they are both rendered in this wonderful old-style CG that I absolutely love. Don't get me wrong, my jaw hit the floor the first time I saw the opening to Diablo 2, but there's just something so charming about this CG style that really tickles my nostalgia nerves. I got the same sensation when I was playing The Longest Journey last year too. So we begin with these three shadowy figures walking through a dark corridor on their way to commit evil or something. And this is intercut with the classic Conan-looking barbarian dude getting into a fight with some orcs out in the forest. Our evil cultist types basically seem to be summoning some kind of divine being into a small baby, and she is neither happy about being here, or the rather large sword that one of our evil cultist types is about to swing into her. At the point of impact there's a blinding light, and our angel has divided herself into three and proceeds to blast off out of this underground hellhole with a third of her at least meeting up with our barbarian guy, only moments before he becomes some orc's evening meal. When the dust settles and our guy is out cold, a mysterious white cat, who we are going to eventually discover is the bestest of bros ever, rolls up to take a look at the situation. And, well, that's when we wake up in the basement of a healer's house in the small village of Alaroth. Before that though, we've got to do character creation. Back in the late 90s and early 2000s, Concepts like elaborate face morphing and customization of every body part right down to the eyebrows was something no one had even dreamed of yet. And you know what? Thank God! It's not that I don't like making a cool avatar for my RPGs, but there's such a thing as too much choice. Just give me 10 cool presets that I can pick from, I'm sure one of them will be fine. So. Here we are basically choosing from a male or female of one of three basic fantasy archetypes, because this game has European fantasy and D&D written all over it. Our starting choices are warrior, mage and rogue, but another place where Divine Divinity and indeed every game in this saga distinguishes itself from its peers is that it's not actually class based, and you can invest in skills from any class anytime you level up. That's not important for now though. You can listen to them talk about themselves a little before you start. I went with a mage for this playthrough, because I'd been a warrior in a previous game some years ago and found myself getting very outclassed very early after the opening act. Actually, balancing may be one of the areas where these games do drop the ball, especially this one, but I digress. So with our super cool mage chosen, all that remains is to give him a super cool name. Hmm, let me see. What's a cool name for a mighty mage? Hmm, L-U-C-I-A-N. Okay, Lucian. That seems like a solid and completely random name that I pulled out of thin air for absolutely no reason. So we've got our character and setup. Let's talk game. 
To say that Divine Divinity starts small would be something of an understatement. You literally start in the cellar of a healer's house in a small village called Alaroth, and while there is a massive world to explore, all beautifully rendered in this gorgeous old-school CRPG pixel art style, you aren't going to be seeing any of it for quite a while. In fact, Divine Divinity is very, very deceptive in how it starts, because if you didn't know any better, you could almost accuse them of basically copying Diablo. Now, that's no problem at all for me. I love Diablo 1, and Torchlight does exactly the same thing, and that's also a banger. Either way, it was incredibly ballsy of Larian to hide the true nature of the game behind several hours of dungeon crawling under a village. It absolutely works, of course, but I think if I was looking at that on a design document, I'd be tempted to raise my hand and voice a few objections at the development meeting. So here we go. While this game does have plenty of story and dialogue, it doesn't exactly waste a lot of time getting to the point. Emerging from the Sala, Lucian is greeted by Joram, who lays out how a white cat caught his attention while he was out gathering herbs, and managed to lure him back to where Lucian was lying unconscious. Being a healer, he immediately dragged him back to his place to administer his craft. Now, this isn't a game where you have deep branching dialogue trees, like the type I complain about in a lot of games. You may get a few topics, but conversations are mostly, blissfully, quite linear. This isn't a game where you have a great deal of alignment options. You're an adventurer, and you help people by doing adventuring stuff because A, they will probably pay you, and B, you'll probably find treasure and loot along the way. Whether or not you feel any moral obligation to get involved is something entirely up to you. As such, Joram has no problem explaining that while Alaroth was once the most famous village of healers, they've stumbled upon a few problems. The first and most notable is that they've lost connection with their healing... Source. As the healer explains, Source is the fundamental energy of life, and can be manipulated by special people to perform miraculous healing arts. I can only imagine what horrors could be created were this energy to be used in malice. Alaroth is also famed for its Source Fountain that also produces healing crystals. Unfortunately, the healer's connection to the source has been severed, and the fountain has stopped producing crystals, rendering the healers of Alaroth no better than any alchemist or doctor. This disaster also coincides with the leader of the village, Mardanius. Well, to use Joram's words... He seems to have gone as crazy as a loon. So, we have a problem, and a mystery and a wandering hero who just so happens to owe his life to the healers of Elaroth. I guess it's time for Lucian to crack his knuckles, unlimber his bow and arrow, draw his sword, charge up his magic, and get to work doing what he does best. Well, first he has to explore the town and talk to everyone. If you're hungry for action, this part may seem like a slog, but trust me, it's important. The opening hours of any game, especially an RPG, is tasked with teaching you as much of the game's systems as you need to get started, introducing you to the world and the tone of the game, and generally get you ready to go adventuring. All, ideally, without dumping heaps and heaps of exposition on you, and I'd say Divine Divinity does an admirable job here. So let's walk around the village and talk about these systems while we're at it. Okay, so first, tone. Larian is a fun studio. Hey, look, uh, it stands to reason you can't eat because you don't have a stomach. Aha, so how can we speak? We don't have no vocal cords either. Answer that, Mr. Clever. Like a really fun studio. I mean, listen to this. The best approach I've learned is that you, you try to have fun as you make it, and then hopefully that fun is going to brush off on the player and he's gonna have fun too. There's nothing wrong with games, and fantasy especially, being all dark and edgy. That can absolutely work, but it doesn't have to be. After all, this is the land of make-believe. Why not have fun? We don't have to go full Terry Pratchett on this, but we don't have to go all Dark Souls about it either. Though, to be fair to the Souls games, they are not without their own sense of humour. But anyway, let's take a look at Mardanius' condition. Uh, taste 
my power. No, Mardanius, no. I am Lanilor. Classic Mardanius. That guy just cracks me up. But this particular side activity is really just teaching you about keeping your eyes peeled for ways to get around barriers that may not be so obvious at the start. To get into Mordanius' house and talk to him, you need to drop down this well into this underground passage. You've probably noticed this thick black fog of war that's covering the map too. I had a little squeal of joy when I saw it as it brought back memories of Baldur's Gate, and this is a great example of why nostalgia is bad and our memories can't be trusted. While I appreciated this at first, it very quickly wore out its welcome. While it definitely adds to the air of discovery you get as you explore the various maps, it becomes something of an obsessive compulsive fixation after a while, and you just find yourself doing zigzag laps of an area to push back as much of the fog as possible. What this means is that when you're playing, you're probably spending more time looking at your mini-map than you are at the actual screen and you obviously spend a lot more time combing over the map, making sure you haven't missed anything, than you would if you were just looking at the whole screen. It's not a big minus, but subtracts more than it adds by the end of the game. At the very least, I think the radius of the fog being pushed back should be filling the screen. Don't think this is the start of a big list of complaints though. I mean, there's a few more, but they are for later. Another major side quest in Alaroth concerns two dying patients that are being cared for by two different healers. One of the race of lizard people, and one of the dwarves. Basically, there's only one healing stone left, and neither of the healers can use it on their patient because doing so would effectively kill the other one, and that goes against the oaths that the healers have sworn. Lucian, however, not being bound by any sacred magical oath, is free to do as he pleases with it. You can save one of the patients and earn a reward from their healer while seriously pissing off the other one. Or, you can look for a third option. In this case, it's a magic mirror that can be used to duplicate the healing stones and save both patients. So, either you learn about NPC disposition and how it affects things like conversations and the prices of goods they'll sell you, or you learn that if you keep your eyes peeled, a third option may very well present itself. Also, this particular quest, it's going to come up again later. I have but one healing stone, you see, and two direly wounded men who need it. Much later, to be precise. Our last port of call is with the merchant in town. You can actually trade with almost anyone in the game, and all of the healers of Alaroth have potions that they can trade with you. As we approach the trader's house, though, we see a very unsavory fellow leave after exchanging some choice words with the owner. It's pretty easy to figure out what's going on here, and very unsurprising that our good merchant, George here, wants us to acquire a certain herb from the garden of the Alvin alchemist Lanilor on his behalf. This is the first of the morally questionable missions we're going to undertake. Divine Divinity doesn't have any kind of morality system per se, it just leaves it up to us to make those choices and deal with the consequences. Of course, some characters will like you more or less based on those choices, but the world at large isn't going to care if you help the junkie in Alaroth get his fix by raiding one of the healer's herb stocks. George will of course lower his prices, which can help you pick up some slightly better gear for what is to come. So since we're here, let's talk about the inventory. The UI in Divinity is… interesting, though it's not without its purpose. First of all, you've got your windows for your character, your skills, equipped weapons and armor, and the contents of your backpack, which includes weapons, armor, magical items, potions, and food and junk. It's a fucking mess. While it's more than possible to streamline some of this, what we're dealing with is a situation similar to Weird West, where inventory management is as much part of playing the game as anything else you do. Even something like balancing your trade when selling items, with coins from the shopkeeper's inventory, is something you have to do manually. Sure, the inventory could be much more efficient and easy to navigate, and you could have hard restrictions on what you can pick up and interact with, but that isn't what we're going for here. Remember, back when developing LMK, Larian envisioned a highly interactive world full of things that could be moved and broken, interacted with, and carried off. You can drag literally anything from the world into your inventory if you're so inclined. I mean, I just love carrying rotting food around in my backpack 
everywhere I go, and it makes me an absolute magnet for all the ladies. That being said, a lot of crap you find in the world is useful once you've got the alchemy skill. Dragging empty bottles onto various plants and mushrooms will produce different potions, and dragging potions over each other in the inventory window will combine them into other potions, providing a mixture is possible. Incidentally, as a late game hack for mage that bleeds mana, combining your mana and healing potions into rejuvenation potions is the way to go, as they give you a significantly bigger hit of mana than regular mana potions do. Little things like this may seem tedious, but they add a great sense of immersion to a process that could have been handled with menus and text and taken me out of the game. I will say I found it a little cumbersome at first and, to be honest, I don't recall getting any kind of tutorial about it and only figuring it out after reading through a guide online, but it's fun and a very useful skill, given that potions aren't nearly as plentiful as they are in some other RPGs like Diablo. Now you do have a little quick bar for potions in the corner, so you don't have to worry about pausing the game and jumping in here every time your health is low. That's going to happen a lot actually. A couple of other interesting points about your inventory is that not only can you carry basically any crap you feel inclined to, you can also throw away key items and effectively lock yourself out of completing certain quests. I received a barrel of explosives for a quest at one point in the game, and then ran off to do other things because I was somewhat underleveled for that particular quest. After a few sessions I had completely forgotten about this mission and dumped the barrel of explosives, or possibly sold it somewhere when I was clearing out my inventory because I was over encumbered. I basically had the choice of scrubbing through all my recorded footage to try and figure out what I'd done with the damn thing, or hacking my save file and editing the inventory to get the explosives back. Can you guess which I chose? Now, I think player agency is a great thing, and sure, if for some reason you decide you don't want to aid the general in blowing up the orc's supply train, I can see why ditching the explosives might be high on your priority list. But this particular mission is critical path adjacent, so I do believe that this is something the devs should have planned for. I don't know, maybe have it so the player can tell the general that he lost the explosives, and have him chew the player out before reluctantly giving him another barrel to get the job done. Again though, early 2000s and a studio's first game, so it's not a deal breaker. Okay, so we've met everyone in town, done a little busy work, got acquainted with some of the game's systems, so it's time to descend into the depths below Alaroth and battle the terrible forces awaiting therein. As I said, Divinity is very deceptive about what kind of game it is in the opening hours, since you're basically just playing Diablo and having an absolute ball doing so. The dungeon areas are very combat heavy, with only light puzzle solving thrown in to spice things up. It follows a very simple system of clicking on an enemy to run up to them and attack, and right clicking to use some kind of spell or power that consumes mana. You chug health and mana potions when you take enough damage, and have a quick pause option to choose your powers and use items in your inventory when things start to look bad. The major difference between Diablo and Divinity is that you don't have to keep clicking an enemy to attack. Lucian will just keep swinging his weapon until the enemy breaks. The animations, and especially the sound design, work very well to give those little dopamine kicks that make the combat very satisfying and make you want to engage with it more. Uh. Early game, I was playing around with being a mage who summoned a skeleton to tank for him while he hung back and blasted things with ranged spells but I eventually dropped the summoning side of this and focused mainly on ranged spells and smashing things that got too close with my mace. I even went so far as to redistribute the summon skeleton points when I hacked in a respec later in the game. Oh, yeah. There's no official way to respec your character in this game, so it's a good idea in 2000 and current year to look up a build online before you start, especially for the early game, when you'll be at your most vulnerable. Messing this up can make fighting some of these bigger, more dangerous skeletons a problem. Difficulty is always going to be something hard to deal with in games like this because what can you really do other than make your enemies spongier and give them more devastating attacks? Late game you can play around with things like elemental resistances to give the player a chance to use equipment to gain some kind of advantage, but without a guide, this is usually figured out on a fuck around and find out kind of basis. So. Yeah, 
early game, there are some elite level enemies that can prove very challenging the first time you meet them, and have you sprinting back to the dungeon exit or activating your teleport pyramids to escape before you get wrecked. Beyond the walls of Alaroth, when you finally start adventuring in Rivalon proper, you're going to come across these orc drummers who just run away from you and restore their health every time they hit their drums. You basically need to inflict massive damage on them in a very short space of time, which early game can be almost impossible and lead to these things chasing you all over the map until you get some sort of damage boost. And it's very frustrating. It might not make you rage quit, well, maybe once, but it will leave you wondering what the intended method of handling some of these difficult fights were, versus cheesing the enemies by zoning and spamming potions. The teleport pyramids appear in every Divinity game other than the Dragon Knight Saga, though they are mentioned there briefly. These are your town portal scrolls, but a lot more versatile. You place one down on the floor and keep the other in your inventory, and you can select it to get zapped back to its twin. It becomes much more useful in games like Original Sin, where it can turn the tide of battle and get you out of some really sticky situations, but it's a perfectly functional in-game fast travel system that can be used to help with that cycle of looting treasure and trading what you don't need for potions so that you can venture even further into the dungeons and repeat the loop ad infinitum. You can feel really fragile at the start of the game, but as with all RPGs, Combat and questing equals experience points, which equals leveling up. Getting stronger so that you can fight tougher enemies that drop better loot, that makes your character even stronger. Leveling up is pretty straightforward. You gain 5 attribute points that can be used to improve your character's base stats, and I hope I don't have to explain to anyone what each of these do. It should be pretty easy to intuit that you want a wizard who has high intelligence and a warrior with high strength while good constitution goes into health and is helpful for everyone. Where things get really interesting though is with skill points. You get one and on occasion two skill points a level to spend on… well, skills. Where things get really cool though is you're not restricted to your class skills at all. In fact, because skill ranks are capped by your character level, you're actually encouraged to branch out as much as possible and build an interesting character that way. I played a mage and so most of my offensive capabilities came from projectile spells like Meteor, Lightning, Elemental Strike, and Hell Spikes. By the end of the game, I'd just cycle these on any new enemy type until I found the one that did the most damage and stick with that until I came across a different enemy. There are some other standouts like Energy Cage and Freeze that can stop formidable enemies in their tracks so they can't just one-shot you. This is best combined with Withering Curse that lowers resistances as some enemies are so strong that they can resist Freeze and Energy Cage at level 5, and when your armor is basically a blanket, you don't want those guys getting close enough to swing a weapon at you. I also wound up specking into a few quality of life passives such as Lockpicking, Alchemy, and Magic Barrier. The range of skills and the builds you can make with them, if you know what you're doing, is quite mind-blowing really, but that is where the problem lies. Sure, this is an old game, and we have guides and let's plays aplenty to learn what's hot and what's not, but if you like to go into games relatively blind, well, let's just say there are skills that range from so OP you can merc the last boss in 10 seconds flat. No, really. Time this. Yeah, that actually happened. Take the Deadly Gift skill. To skills that are absolutely useless. I mean, there probably are Divinity Giga Chads out there who can make a good build with Poison Cloud, but I was so underwhelmed by it, which is why I really think this game needs an official way to respect skill points and not just via a save game hack. So by the final level of this dungeon, where the mystery of what's eating away at Mardanius' mind is revealed to us, we've actually powered ourselves up to the point where those very tough enemies are not such a big problem anymore. It turns out that a great and powerful necromancer named Thelrion resided down there and has been engaged in a scheme to both resurrect himself and in the process gain immortality, and if you've watched my video on Final Fantasy IX, 
you'll know what a dumb idea I think immortality is. It seems the connection between Thelrion and Mordanius' mind was something set up mutually at one point, and when his resurrection failed because of a boulder killing one of his four skeletons meant to work the resurrection machines, Thalrion lashed out in a bid to get some attention. So, we fix the problem and summon in the boss, only to discover that his new undead form isn't what he thought it was going to be. Honestly, why would you assume immunity to pain was part of the deal? With Mordanius saved and the Necromancer destroyed, it's time to head out into a bigger, wider world, and it's time for this game to get turned completely on its head. Alaroth's source problem hasn't been fixed, and this hints at some greater ominous threats looming on the horizon. But for now, our boy Lucian here has plenty of other things to take care of. Not the least of which is the discovery of our trusty addict trader George being murdered by parties unknown. It was Tutaman. Go get him, Lucian. So we should at this point be well acquainted with all the game's systems and we're ready to head out into a wider world, where we immediately discover that there's been a plague in nearby Rivertown and soldiers have been sent to get the aid of the healers of Alaroth, but have had their numbers thinned by invading orcs. So, we've got an orc army, a plague, and the healers have lost their greatest power. If I didn't know better, you'd be telling me that the Dark One is stirring beneath Shale Ghoul, or that the Nine Ringwraiths have been loosed from Barad-dûr. But these are all just signs of some classic good versus evil European fantasy. The development of a level editor, so that a large world space to fill with adventures could be made, was actually one of the first things that Larian did once they'd secured a publishing deal for Divinity. This time, they were partnered with CDV, and while this was a moment of triumph for Larian, it also showed the first signs of their publisher curse rising to the surface once again. Divinity was originally titled Divinity Sword of Lies, the Sword of Lies being a pivotal feature of the story that we'll cover later, but CDV had recently won big success with a game called Sudden Strike. And because publishers look at game design and marketing as some kind of obtuse numbers game, and not an experimental creative process, they felt that the title was a major selling point for the product, and wanted something equally snappy for Divinity. <sighs> okay, I probably am going to springboard into a longer rant about publishers later, maybe. I'll definitely write it, but it might get cut. But this kind of stupidity here is why so many games just come out unfinished, broken, and damn right unplayable. I mean, talk about focusing on the wrong thing. And it's something that almost killed this game too. Having learnt a lot from LMK, they put their energy into creating a world space, the character progression system, and made decisions to streamline the combat into the hack and slash genre. And multiplayer, something they've tried to implement in every one of their games, was scrapped very early on this time. The story came much later, and was actually cobbled together in the space of about three days, but was no doubt refined as the game went through iterations. Not long after leaving the village of Alaroth, Lucian encounters an assassin on a dragon, no less, who is intent on abruptly ending his life, which brings us to the first arrival of one of Divinity's most well-known and long-running faces, Xandalore. This guy is literally thousands of years old, and fulfills our Gandalf, Elminster, Moraine Sedai mentor role. Xandalore tells Lucian that he is a marked one, one of three people in Rivalon who has the potential to ascend to become the Divine One. It seems that Close Encounter with an Angel has… awoken something godly inside him. She lays her hand on your skull, and you see it clearly. The others, the gods, Amaria, and you. You are her chosen. You are her godwoken. The Divine One is a long prophesied hero who will come to prevent the rebirth of the Lord of Chaos, and the people hunting him are a cult aligned with this creature known as the Black Ring. Since Xandalore has at least one more marked one to hunt down, he heads off leaving Lucien with instructions to meet him at the Blue Boar Inn near Rivertown, and from there, our adventure continues, and I'd say from about the moment you cross this bridge right here, things really start to get wild. Rivalon is big. Well, relatively so anyway. It's a little world playing at being a big world. No doubt the scale of this place was pretty spectacular back in the early 2000s, but things have come a long way since then. 
Initially, there are three main maps to explore. The first here is called Feral and is easily the biggest, and comprises a whole bunch of different areas. There's the rundown river town that's been stricken by plague and has a very ominous looking quarantine zone. Just north of that though are wide open farmlands, the residents of which have plenty of their own troubles, specifically with trolls in this case, and even further north is the ominous cursed abbey that's loaded with metal undead. Exploring further, you'll come to a dwarf village, the local inhabitants of which are very unhappy with the elves. Hear ye, hear ye! To all brave and loyal dwarves, our good king calls you to arms! War is declared on the dastardly elves! A bustling market where you can buy lots of gear and equipment, and heading further south and east, will take you into the war zone created by the invading orc army, and you'll be clearing out that whole area before you're done. Central to Feral, though, is the mighty Stormfist Castle, home of the very young Duke Janus. Not only did this kid ascend to his current status after his father died under... suspicious circumstances. His ghost seems to think so. But he has been declaring himself to be... the Divine One. We'll jump briefly back here later, because while Feral has an incredible amount going on in it, there's more. Like, a lot more. Up north is the city of Verdistist, and down south are both the Dark Forest where the elves live, which also connects into the subterranean dwarf city, which I have to say has the best music of any location in this game, and maybe the entire series. And all that's before we even get to the final wasteland map and the fortress of the Black Ring. Not only are the maps of this world broad, but they are also multi-layered and deep. The city of Verdistist, for example, has almost no combat on the surface, with most of the interactions and quests here being of a conversational nature. Verdistist is an area that really didn't need the fog of war at all, if I'm being honest. In the other maps, its function is to hide a lot of enemy encounters, but since Verdistist isn't full of hostile creatures looking to destroy you, the Fog of War doesn't add anything here. But it has a massive subterranean sewer system filled with assassins, giant spiders, and lizard people. And it really is massive. The team went well above and beyond here. Given the size of the city and all of the interactions you can have therein, this dungeon didn't need to be half this size, but Divine Divinity is a very extra game, in just about every aspect, which, as we'll talk about, isn't always a good thing. By the time you reach the Blue Boar Inn, the world has really opened up, to such a degree in fact that it can seem a little overwhelming, especially if you've been exploring off the beaten path already and stumbling into all the different characters that need your help with something. If I'm being honest, it feels a little obtuse at this point. That's a word that I can apply to all of the Divinity Saga though, so if nothing else, it's clearly by design. As an early 2000s RPG, waypoint markers to keep you on track are rare to non-existent. This is actually another area where the Fog of War presents a much greater problem for exploration. It conceals not only enemies and treasures, but also important landmarks, and makes the distance between locations seem much larger than it actually is. Post leaving Alaroth, for example, it's actually really hard to find traders to resupply you or fix any broken weapons or armor you might have, and at this stage your equipment and skills really aren't going to be up to much. So getting professional help is pretty damn important. In a way, this will stop you rushing off to higher level areas and then using potions to try and brute force your way through the tougher encounters there. But then, on the other hand, you're not even all that sure where it is you're supposed to go anyway, since after the Blue Boar, your objective is help a bunch of people to build enough of a reputation that Duke Janus will invite you to come and see him in his castle. While the difficulty curve for Feral generally skews this way, you really have absolutely no way of knowing if you can handle a quest or the enemies in a given area until you roll in there and get wrecked. Likewise, the jump from trash mobs to mini bosses is so steep that even if you are able to just about hang in there through some parts of an area, things can very quickly turn against you. 
Since Divinity is a game primarily about exploration and discovery, this isn't entirely a bad thing. Venturing into dangerous areas and barely escaping with your life can actually be quite fun at times, but this is also what killed my progression on previous playthroughs. I went from feeling like I had a pretty good handle on the game after Alaroth, to constantly dying once I was in the bigger world, and wondering what it was I'd done wrong to wind up in this situation, and how exactly I could go about fixing it. Likewise, I'd managed to defeat an undead necromancer lord, but suddenly I was taking serious damage from annoying things like snakes and angry hornets. It was very disheartening. This time I found myself just moving from area to area, dipping my toes into the water, seeing how well I did, pushing back the fog of war as best I could in that area, before retreating back to safety when it got too dangerous, resupplying and trying another area. Eventually I'd level up to a point where I could handle all of the enemies in a certain area, and finally clear the fog of war and a lot of quests that had been building up in my journal as I explored. This part is at least very satisfying. It's great to finally figure out what's lurking in the heart of the Cursed Abbey, to finally uncover the location of the Assassin's Guild, beat back the orcs all the way to their main encampment, and finally kill the damn Troll King, who just drops a dozen or so trolls on you out of nowhere, while you're in a confined space and not able to do anything particularly clever about it. But god damn if it doesn't feel like a slog at times. So about Stormfist Castle and Duke Janus. After you've helped certain people in Rivalon and gained a reputation as a new hero who's been instrumental in turning the tide of the Orc invasion, the little Duke invites you for an audience, which starts one of the funnier and more interesting set pieces in the game. You see, the Duke is working very hard to convince the people he is the Divine One, and has some new staff stroking his ego to that very end. He has decided that he's basically going to keep you, so he can now show off Rivalon's newest hero as his very own personal bodyguard, performing such heroic duties as passing a love letter between him and his 12 year old girlfriend, and finding a very important teddy bear and he's gone to great pains to make sure you can't leave the castle in the process. This is all very fun and intercut with little interactions that leave us wondering if maybe something isn't more than a little amiss here. Upon our dishonorable discharge from the Duke's service, we soon discover that his new advisor is a member of the Black Ring. What a surprise. And she, among other mischief, is also hunting down and killing the Marked Ones. Fortunately, she decides to leave you locked in your cell for a while to ponder what extravagant tortures she has in store for you, while she deals with the other marked one she collared and, whoa, wouldn't you know it, a white cat comes to save us. So this little guy is Ahu, and yes, he talks. I love Ahu, he's like the Garrus of Divinity. However, he and indeed Zigzax, who we also meet briefly in this game, are much more important in Original Sin than here. Here he's just Xandalore's talking cat, and helps bust you out of this cell so you can go find the old wizard. Uncovering the mystery reveals that Duke Janus is now in possession of a long buried cursed artifact called the Sword of Lies, and the demon within has in fact devoured the soul of the young boy and is walking around in his skin. The Demon of Lies is a sliver of the Lord of Chaos trapped upon Rivalon within the sword and could be used as an anchor to summon the first and most terrible god back to destroy everything and remake it in his image. You know, typical evil overlord stuff. The only thing that can stop that is the Divine One. So since Lucian is the only marked one left, it's up to him. This rolls into our third act that sees Lucian hunting down the Council of the Seven, basically important figures from the races of humans, orcs, elves, dwarves, imps, lizards, and wizards. Yeah, I know wizards aren't a race, but I'll let Xandalore explain. As representative of all magical beings who stand against hell. And of course, because this is an RPG, everyone is too busy with their own problems, many of which were orchestrated by the Black Ring, to leave their people and serve the greater good. So Lucian has to play cleaner and caretaker, stopping a war between the elves and the dwarves, rescuing a polymorph lizard man, and actually breaking the orc chief out of a prison that his own kind threw him into. Politics. Am I right guys? A big part of this section takes place in the Dark Forest, which I've got to admit is a pretty awesome location 
with some of the most spectacular areas and interesting quests. But, man, I was starting to get really tired of the fog of war when I got here. Now, this may be a personal preference, or it may be because I was playing this game with the intention of finishing it for a video, and not specifically just to enjoy playing it, but this felt like one map too many in a way. I certainly am glad that I stuck it out. It's not as interesting as Vodistus, being a mostly combat focused area, but it does have some great areas and quests, and the Dwarven Undercity that I've already mentioned really does feel like stepping into another world altogether with its unique tile set and... Did I mention that music? We're closing in on the end of our jaunt through this game, so I guess I should bring up a few other technical points of interest. As you can see, Divine Divinity's content is wrapped up in this great late 90s CRPG visual style. In the early 2000s, 3D gaming and even 3D RPGs like Gothic and Final Fantasy X were a thing. But the pursuit of the best graphics is both expensive and wouldn't have aligned with what Larian were trying to create here. Instead, aesthetics and art style have combined to create something that is almost timeless in its presentation. Sure, I'd love to see something like a pixel remaster one day, possibly with the final map actually finished. But it's hard to accuse the game of aging badly, or even at all, when it clearly looks exactly how it was intended to. What Divine Divinity wasn't though, was unique in its presentation. The hyper-stylized look that characterizes the series now isn't something we'd see until the Dragon Knight Saga, and I do find those games to be far more charming in their presentation than this. But don't mistake Not As Good As X for bad. I still enjoy this kind of aesthetic. While Divine Divinity does cling to fairly tired fantasy ideas of orcs bad, humans good, and elves and dwarves will never get along, it does introduce both the race of imps and the fearsome death knights in the late game. The death knights in particular are a staple of this series, and we'll be seeing a lot more of them as we move forward. If it has one problem though, it's definitely readability. The overworld has a day-night cycle which, I can honestly say, doesn't really add anything to the game. In fact, it's more of an annoyance because it's so much harder to see anything at night. Likewise, many of the levers you need to use in dungeons blend in far too well with their environments, and don't get highlighted when you hold down the ALT key like doors and collectibles do. This can lead to you wandering around these areas for ages, trying to figure out where the hell to go. I mean, just look at this section in one of the final dungeons. It literally looks like I'm just clipping through the walls. How about these switches that don't give you any visual or audio feedback when you press them? More than a little annoying to say the least. The Dwarven City also has teleport pads that you can step on to move over the rivers of molten gold that run through the place. I can only imagine how hot it is down there. But these things are so indistinguishable from the rest of the environment that I only even discovered they were there at all by checking a guide. These are small issues, but they are little things that add up over the course of a 60 hour playthrough to become more than mildly aggravating by the end. Despite everything they learnt from their failure with LMK, Larian was still wet behind the ears when it came to project planning, and it became obvious that the project was going to need more time in order to be completed. They had a big world and a great story, but the game was pretty boring to play at the time. They actually wound up hiring someone from their own forums to implement a lot of side quests and events that would enrich the moment to moment gameplay. Their goal was to have something interesting to stumble into every few screens, which when you consider the scale of the map was a hell of a challenge, but is one of the things that makes the final game so great. Lucian goes on this big adventure, getting into all kinds of dangers and absurd situations in the process until he has finally assembled the Council of the Seven for the ritual, which goes something like this. What the actual fuck, dude? Ah, understood. In religion, blessing and killing the same thing. All these years Croxy think he is warrior, turns out he is priest! The short version is that Lucian sheds his mortal shell, 
so that he can be joined with the seven divines and empowered by them to be reborn as the Divine One. There's a few final twists of the knife, but he returns to a very different world sometime later, with the Black Ring now very powerful and on the cusp of summoning the Lord of Chaos back to the realm of Rivalon. Lucian crosses the wasteland after gaining the power of a spirit form from a dragon called the Patriarch, yes that's his actual name, and finally descends into the fortress of the Black Ring to fight and finally slay their five leaders and confront the Demon of Lies, and as I've already shown you, that fight doesn't go so well for the demon. The big twist here is that Lucian, for all intents and purposes, fails. The ritual is at least to some degree completed, and a not insignificant portion of the Lord of Chaos is summoned into the body of an innocent baby. After the final cutscene that sees Lucian initially tempted by the Sword of Lies, but ultimately resisting and banishing it, <laughs> take that Diablo warrior, Lucian is left with the prospect of killing an innocent who might one day commit horrific acts of evil and damn the entire world, or not doing that because in the end, it's still just a baby. I think we can all let him off the hook for taking the more compassionate road on this one. While this is the game's climax, it's ultimately where the game takes a final dip. You see, despite all their efforts to delay the release, the publishers had had enough and didn't want any more delays. Divine Divinity's initial release in Germany, considered one of the best places to sell RPGs at the time, happened before the game was really finished. The Wasteland, and to some degree the Final Fortress, is basically unfinished, with only primary and secondary work done on the level design, and almost no moment-to-moment -moment gameplay beyond clubbing your way through a lot more enemies. All those great little interactions that happen in Feral and Verdistus are just replaced with a massive slog to the end. There's one small interaction with the Patriarch who we'll meet again in the Dragon Knight Saga, and an abandoned orc village that really just exists to resupply you with potions, so I had absolutely no qualms at this point about making a beeline to the endgame in my spirit form and not stopping to fight anything I didn't have to. The early release of Divine Divinity in many ways sealed its fate, at least for the time. On top of everything else they were doing to push to the finish line, Bug reports were arriving by the post on little pink sheets by the hundreds, and organised in such a way that were virtually useless for the team, resulting in plenty of time loss. So not only was the final act of the game a huge drop off from what came before, but at launch, the game was a mess. Here's a picture of Sven, blacked out in the office because he'd stayed at work all night, manually editing save game files for customers whose games had bugged and become unplayable. Larian still had some time between the German release and the international English release. They used this time to secretly patch as many of the problems as they could for this version, which resulted in a lot less problems and the game getting an overall higher review score than in Germany. However, no patch was forthcoming to the German version because CDV said that their games don't have bugs. So you force a premature release on a studio but your games don't have bugs. F**k these people. Oh my god, how stupid are they? CDV ultimately said that they believed Divine Divinity was a terrible game, and that they had no interest in working on a sequel. No more money would be coming Larian's way, and the team of 25 people was reduced to three. Larian was in dire straits, and it could have all been over there and then. Since we know how Larian's story ends, we can see this was a blessing in disguise, and CDV and any other publisher like them can frankly suck it. Despite everything, Divine Divinity reviewed pretty well, and would go on long term to place in PC Gamer's top 100 RPGs. It received a modern upgrade to appear on Steam and GOG, and is considered one of the classics of the CRPG genre. You could call it something of a cult classic. Something that maybe didn't change the world at launch, but found its recognition and status later in life. Unfortunately for Sven and Larian though, that wasn't going to help them back in 2002. B. 
Beyond Divinity was the game that surprised me the most. But that may in part be due to having, well, not low, but lower expectations for this than the others. While there's nothing wrong with a sequel offering the same experience as the first game, just with a few twists and turns here and there, my first impression of this game put me in mind of playing a standalone expansion pack or large-scale DLC rather than a true sequel. Indeed, Beyond Divinity didn't even get to take a number, and given the Dragon Knight saga is officially Divinity 2, this was very clearly a 1.5 Fallout New Vegas side story that was made more for a payday than because anyone had anything exceptional to say that warranted an entire game to say it. This is confirmed somewhat by looking through the history of its development as well. While Divine Divinity had not been a flop by any means, the delayed and troubled development cycle that led to the release of an unfinished product had left Larian without a publisher and with no more money coming into the studio. The staff of around 25 people had been reduced to just three, and things were looking bleak for the fledgling RPG game maker. Beyond Divinity was the product of two goals set by Sven. First, to make a Divinity RPG in about a year that could save the company, and second, he was determined to never again tell an entire team that they were being let go. Games are made by passionate people who put up with a lot of shit to ship their final product. Now, I'm not here to stand in defense in any way of sleepless nights and endless hours crunching to get a product shipped. No one should suffer so that we can play games no matter how good those games are, or how much they have to say. But it does happen, and people who go through that kind of thing together either come out the other side ready to kill each other, or grow a lot closer for the experience. No one should have sleepless nights and workplace stress rewarded by losing their job. Well, maybe Magister Raymond. That guy's a dick. Tell me, have you ever been strung up by the hands? Your body swinging like a bell's clapper as your bones are being broken with cast iron rods. At the end of 2002, in a lonely office, Sven sat down and wrote out a list of things he'd like to change and update in the Divinity engine, and planned out the concept for the next Divinity RPG. Using what little money was left to fund several months of development with a small team, he hoped to create enough of a game to demonstrate to distributors, who could in turn guarantee them sales, and enable him to get a bank loan. His long-term goal was to use everything he'd learned in the development of Divine Divinity to streamline their whole process. By removing a publisher and going directly to distributors himself, Sven learned something very important about Divine Divinity. He learned that it had sold really well. Since sales data was kept by publishers, he only had review scores to go off to gauge the game's success, and those scores hadn't been the best. So, imagine how he must have felt when he approached distributors about a potential sequel, and they were lining up to hear about it. To put it simply, Beyond Divinity was made for a payday, and I think that was the vibe I was getting when I fired up the game and got real 1.5 vibes from it. The good news is though, just like Fallout New Vegas, it's punching way above its weight class, and all the passion, fun, and joy of developing games that characterizes every one of Larian's projects can be found here too. So I guess it's time for us to go to hell. If you didn't know any better, you could be forgiven for thinking that Beyond Divinity has basically nothing to do with the characters or events of the first game. It's not even set on Rivalon, but on a completely different plane of existence called Nemesis. While both Divine Divinity and Beyond Divinity shipped with novellas to help fill in some of the lore gaps and bring people up to speed on events, these aren't exactly necessary reading. At least not now that we have the internet, and things have been explained further in other games. They are perfectly fine stories and well written though, and are a must read for the Divinity lore enthusiast. Were you to just start up the game without having read these, like I did, you'd be somewhat in the dark as to how much time has passed between the end of Divine Divinity and the beginning of Beyond. The opening cutscene, now displayed in a much more simplified slideshow style, not unlike Remedy's Max Payne comics, is narrated by one of our two protagonists, known only as the Death Knight. As I mentioned before, Death Knights are one of the staple enemies of Divinity games, appearing in late game dungeons and presenting a big problem for anyone who crosses them. And don't they just look awesome? I sure hope we get to learn about their origins at some point. Wink. 
So the Death Knight narrates a story of how a paladin of the Divine Order is dragged into the hellish realm of Nemesis by the Archdemon Samuel. This lets us know that the Divine One has had enough time to establish his credentials to the world and develop a following and even an army around him. The Paladins and the Divine One are still hunting the Black Ring, who it seems weren't wiped out in the first game after all, and a raid on the lair of a dangerous necromancer ended badly when the wizard called upon Samuel to come to his aid. After dispatching the Paladins, Samuel took one of them alive back to Nemesis to be his eternal plaything. It seems the Paladin contrived to escape from his cell and cause a riot, bringing down the wrath of Samuel, not only on himself, but also the Death Knight who was guarding him, and as punishment, Samuel soulforges the two together, effectively meaning that one's well-being and continued existence is completely dependent on the other. Should one of them die, or should they become separated by too great a distance, then they both die, which, considering their contrasting allegiances, is going to be something of a problem. When the game starts, the two most striking differences are the now fully 3D character models, rocking an awesome low-poly, low-resolution PlayStation 1 aesthetic that fits in so well with the surroundings, and of course, the fact that we have 100% more party members this time around. The 3D character models were a carefully planned move to both increase the smoothness of animations, but also decrease the workload on this front. So, a quick aside here for those who aren't as well clued up on game design as others. Game sprites are all hand-drawn, with every frame of their animation collected onto a sprite sheet, like this one. Now, in classic 16-bit games like Streets of Rage, it was easy enough to reuse older sprites on newer enemies by simply swapping out their color palettes. But there are definitely limitations to this. I mean, stop to think about all the different interchangeable armor pieces in Divine Divinity. In truth, these only equate to a few unique looks, but it's a lot of work, really. A 3D character is powered by an animation rig or armature, just like this one here. Since 3D characters, especially today's ultra-detailed GPU melting monstrosities, are built from thousands of connecting vertices, it's a little difficult to animate all those by hand, though things like shape keys used for mouths and lip-syncing are basically made that way. The armature fixes this problem basically working exactly the same way as a skeleton. A process called weight painting tells the game engine which vertices respond to which bones, and voila. The advantage here is that a single armature with its animations can very easily be applied to any other creature or character of the same basic build. And should you want changes such as a sexier walk for female characters, you can create this by editing an existing walk rather than doing it all from scratch. The work on 3D animation is much more front-loaded. Modeling, texturing, weight painting and animating is a considerably longer process than drawing a sprite. But, once it's all done, it's a lot easier to edit and switch things out, allowing for rapid creation of armor sets, and entirely new enemy types that share the animation sets of another group. So our fully 3D Death Knight begins his day by murdering his own guards, breaking the paladin out of his cell, and laying down the new harsh reality that the two of them now share. Since he isn't exactly happy about the situation either, he suggests that they try to fight their way out of here, get to Rivalon, and contact his old master, a witch named Isolde, who may have significant enough magical skill to break the forging and spare them both. It's a long shot, but I don't exactly see what either of these two has to lose. I mean, they're already eternally damned. What's Samuel going to do? Torture them some more? From the sounds of it, he was going to do that anyway, so really, there's absolutely nothing for either of them to be afraid of. I don't know, it seems like a massive flaw in the whole concept of eternal damnation now that I'm thinking about it. Okay, maybe I shouldn't underestimate the imagination of fictional creatures, but I rather like overthinking these kinds of ideas. So it's time to raise hell in hell. Well, the current realm we found ourselves in is actually called Nemesis, and isn't actually the home of the Lord of Chaos. That's Tartarus. But given what's happened here, it's close enough at this point. I'm jumping ahead, but Nemesis was once the home of a race called the Raynar, and the Imps were something of a servant or slave race here. The Raynar could wield a special magic called Rift Running. This is the ability to make portals to other universes, and is our Deus Ex Machina magic ring that's going to fix all our problems here. Nemesis fell to the demons though, when a crystal that protected their world, a kind of world crystal, you might say, shattered, 
and the demons were able to merge their realm with Nemesis and drink from its life force. I guess they lost that 10th Mortal Kombat tournament in the end. This makes archdemons such as Samuel completely invincible as they can regenerate from any wound by drinking from the world's life. The Raynar's rift running abilities are actually the source of Beyond Divinity's original name, Divinity Rift Runner. So did Larian wind up with another publisher with utterly absurd ideas about what makes people interested in buying an RPG? No, they were threatened with legal action by a tabletop RPG who were not at all interested in working something out. Given that Larian was betting a lot on Beyond Divinity, and the company was working hard on work for hire jobs to help keep the studio afloat and finance the development of Rift Runner, they decided the best thing to do was just change the title and get the new name out there as quickly as possible to avoid any confusion before launch. Damn, what a run of bad luck, right? Beyond Divinity doesn't have a large tutorial town full of NPCs and mini quests to help get you acquainted with the game's mechanics, but if you've already played the original, and I suspect this one was very much for the fans, you aren't going to need your hand holding much in this area. We start in a high stakes prison break from a prison in hell no less. That's a hell of a hook, and it incentivizes moving fast and getting bloody. It also removes any burden of guilt from the enemies. These are after all creatures that serve literal demons. Things that don't just want to torture and kill you, but are quite happy to resurrect you to do it all again, and then go to work on your immortal soul once your body has been destroyed even beyond their powers to reform. Looking around this place, we see the signs of their handiwork everywhere, and I'm glad I'm not sticking around to get a first hand sample. There is some nuance. The imps we meet early in the game, while just as likely to attack us as anyone else, are clearly not willingly cooperating with their masters here, and seem to be just as much victims as anyone else. Imps are actually a big part of Beyond Divinity. In Divine Divinity, with the exception of Zigzags and Ankhts, Imps were just late game enemies. They worked for the Black Ring and appeared in the mostly unfinished Wasteland part of the game. I've always liked the looks of them though. They're funny and a good demonstration of a game not taking itself too seriously. In Beyond Divinity, we actually get to see an entire society of them and have a lot of quests connected to helping these adorable little guys. We'll talk a little more about that later, as it's part of what makes this game so surprisingly good. So we are thrust into combat without much preamble and without anything resembling a safety net either. Without an opening town like Alaroth or Tristram to explore, where do we buy potions? Where do we trade armor and weapons, or take care of things like identifying and repairs if we don't have the skills? Well, all that's coming, but we are actually quite alone for the start. The two-man party upgrade means you'll be spamming that pause button a lot to issue commands, and dive into your much, much cleaner inventory to grab items to make use of. Actually, can we just take a moment to appreciate this? Gaze at its majesty. Look how clean and accessible it is. Everything you need to know is right there where you can see it, not like this mess. Oh god, get it away from me. There is a real art form to user interfaces, and I can certainly forgive Larian for stumbling on this one a bit for what was essentially their first game. I understand what they were looking to achieve with all the separate windows, but this is much better. It's easier to find everything, and the whole thing is just a damn sight more readable. Skills are the only thing that are not immediately accessible from this window, occupying their own space, and there's a good reason for that. The skill-based progression that made the previous games so compelling is of course back, but this has been augmented and changed around in quite a few ways. When characters level up, they gain attributes and skill points just like they did before, but the skills have become a lot more complex than before, using something similar to a branching skill tree than a simple checkbox system. Early on, our heroes can only go down the limited paths on these trees. Skills for Warrior and Wizard are available at the start, and you can see that clicking on one opens up several options for your specializations. You click down the tree until you reach a place where you want to put your points. I kept things fairly simple. My Death Knight was going to be a tanky warrior, and my Paladin was going to be a glass cannon wizard who casts spells from behind his meat shield. Fighter skills are pretty basic, and mostly passive, meaning the Death Knight didn't use all that much in the way of mana, while the wizard hemorrhaged the stuff, and just like Lucian, needed a constant supply of mana potions to keep him in the fight. Some wizard skills, such as elemental strikes, could be customized by mixing up the elements. You can put points into fire and earth on the same spell, and create a second elemental strike spell that uses water and ice, or any combination you see fit. It's a very fun and versatile system overall, if a little confusing at the start. 
skill trees are capped pretty low at the start. And if you want to increase both the cap on the skills and gain access to new skill paths to explore, you're going to need to find skill books and trainers. In Divine Divinity, skill books were a way to get a free point in a skill and help with diversifying your hero's skill selection. In Beyond though, skill books raise the cap on any skills you already know and also give you access to new branches to explore. Trainers offer the same service. These guys can be found everywhere, but especially in the battlefields that we'll talk about later. Again, it's a simple gold for training service. At the start of the game, when gold is low, choosing between raising skill caps, potions, and better equipment is quite the balancing act. But as the game draws to its final battles, you'll have a most suitable wealth to have your cake and very much eat it, with enough left over for seconds. By the end of the game, I was reunited with Divinity Classics like Hellspikes and Paralysis, as well as a handy hammer that falls from the sky to do massive damage and stunlock enemies in the process. I recommend that one. So back to our prison break. As before, the characters are very fragile early game, and one of the first mini-bosses felt almost like complete RNG, especially because he can heal himself and you don't have enough potions to slug it out with him. To offset this, our heroes do actually regenerate their health and their mana very slowly, and there is at least a bed that the characters can sleep in in their cells to recover their health between fights. Though why two escapees would rush back to their cells for a feed up and a night's sleep so that they can keep escaping is beyond me. Divinity. Quick, let's keep escaping. I actually had quite a lot of trouble in this opening section, mainly because I was stumbling around in the dark, not sure what door can be opened now and what I have to come back for later, and I wound up missing out on a small side quest that gave me access to an early game merchant imp. While this game is more generous with potion drops, I can't deny having a couple of rage quits up until I reached the first battlefield. After fighting through a few levels of Samuel's Lair, punctuated with all those little gameplay improvement quests that Larian put so much effort into, we encounter our first battlefield key, and get the option to whisk ourselves off to another plane of existence where we can meet a bunch of merchants. So we now have infinite town portal, as well as a new set of teleport pyramids to help us move around the dungeon. The battlefield is a little more than that though. Every merchant has their own quest that they want the player to complete, as well as a large collection of skills to train and items to trade. Once you've accessed the battlefield, you'll never be short of somewhere to liquidate all your junk and stock up on supplies. I think this is probably one of the biggest differences that I noticed between Divine and Beyond. In Divine, potions were kind of a progress currency. As long as I had them, I could keep exploring more dangerous areas, but once I was out, I had to run back and teleport between several different merchants, in the market, in Verdistus, and at the Cathedral, in order to get fully stocked up. I also used alchemy to keep my supplies topped up, because returning to merchants too quickly meant they wouldn't have time to restock. In Beyond though, I rarely felt the pinch on potions, and it was never too difficult to find more to keep the numbers up, so much so that they actually became a serious problem for my encumbrance. The battlefields are large combat arenas, and unlike the main game, they are just combat. You aren't going to be encountering any comedic characters while exploring this area. You basically smash your way through to a dungeon, fight your way to the bottom, where you'll, maybe, find one of the creatures or items the merchants want for their quests. The dungeon part is all randomised and procedurally generated, so you may not find anything at the bottom. To enter the more difficult dungeons, you'll need to find further keys in the main game, and that's really all there is to it. The completionist in me wanted to play through all of these, and to be honest, there was something cathartic about it at the start. You can quickly overlevel yourself against the enemies here, and it becomes a fairly easy battle that will supply you with many potions and even let you grind up a few extra levels, so that the main game is a little easier to handle. I went through all the first chapter's battlefield, but didn't really bother with the others after that. I think it was my first dungeon in the second chapter that granted me absolutely nothing for getting to the bottom. After that, I lost interest. The quests are all too similar, and none of them have anything interesting going on for them. It sort of breaks the illusion of immersion. It's very clear that I'm just cycling through one of several pre-made quests, and that the net impact of anything I do will be precisely zero. This really is just a glorified shop with an XP farm attached to it for anyone worried about the final boss. Trust me, you don't need to be. He ain't easy, but he ain't all that tough either. Okay, so our Paladin and our Death Knight fight their way through to the heart of Samuel's Lair, only to discover that he has been aware of their escape all along, 
and is quite eager to get them back into their cells so he can begin disciplining them for their actions. He is summoned away at the last minute, apparently this is an occupational hazard of being a demon, especially a very powerful one, and our boys break free, flooding the place with molten lava in the process. So why don't we explore Nemesis a little, meet a few of the local inhabitants, and find out how things got so dire here. I can be a bit down on the whole orcs bad, elves good, and dwarves always drunk stereotypes of European or Western fantasy. I find it odd that copying Tolkien's work in regards to world building became its own genre and not the basis for plagiarism lawsuits. No doubt this is because Tolkien himself took a lot of inspiration from various European myths and folk tales and distilled a large collection of them into his own original work. But just because it's been done a lot doesn't mean it can't be done well. In the end, worlds and the races that inhabit them have the potential to be as diverse as there are people in the world. We may laugh a little at gnome barbarians or bookish dwarven intellectuals, but why shouldn't they exist? Why should a whole race or even a religion or culture dictate personality traits? We're all unique after all, and there are outliers in every culture. The beauty of role-playing games versus other fantasy media is their ability to let us explore their worlds, meet a huge variety of characters within them, and then form our own judgments about them. In a book or movie, the character may just walk past the fishmonger in the market, but in a game we get to stop and have a conversation with him, maybe even help him with a quest and get an idea of the life that he leads. To jump ahead a little, but the orcs in Original Sin are a great example. The tribe we meet in Hunter's Edge and all the various members we bump into along the road are exactly as we'd expect orcs to be, hostile and even monstrous. But now, take a look at this. I don't want to fight. I ain't after no fancy stone. I just want to bury these bodies the traditional way. It's the least I could do for my dear brother Oggy. A moment of genuine humanity, or orcmanity, or whatever. So Nemesis is interesting, not just because of its exotic world design, that shows more imagination than the classic medieval towns and forests of the first game, but also for the chance to meet its two unique races, the Imps and the Raynar. Imps have had it rough in Divinity and never really catch a break. They are only enemies in the first game, servants of the Black Ring who turn up to attack Lucian as he assaults the Black Ring Fortress. On Nemesis, they were originally subjugated by the Raynar, and now that the demons are running the show, life hasn't exactly got much better for a lot of them. From early in the second chapter, we enter the hidden imp village and discover their thriving community full of funny and interesting characters, all wrapped up in their own little political games and dealing with other problems. One area where Beyond Divinity does have a noticeable drop in quality is the voice acting. It's much more the audio quality than the performances that take a dip, but it does kind of work with these funny little guys. A human in our village. Not prisoner and fully armed. Strange times indeed. Our adventures with the Imps also kicks off one of the game's most interesting subplots. Upon finding a powerful corrupting artifact, a pretty standard event in fantasy to be fair, the Paladin and the Death Knight actually get summoned back to Rivalon by the very same necromancer who defeated the Paladin and condemned him to Nemesis. The story establishes very quickly that summoning is always only temporary though, and that while they are there, they are bound to carry out any task the summoner demands of them. This leads us to having several small adventures across Rivalon, which of course meant a lot of existing art assets could be used to build these sections, and even entire locations return. Specifically, the Abbey. I couldn't help but squeal a little bit when I realised where I was too. True, this place had given me quite a lot of trouble and headaches at one point, especially the liches, but it was one of the more interesting areas, and I couldn't help but try to want to break the boundaries and see if the rest of Feral was hiding just beyond. While these sections are basically fetch quests, I love how each one has its own little story attached to it, such as a village of people who've all been turned into children, or looking into a murder that took place in an inn. The MacGuffins that we are hunting turn out to be pieces of Nemesis's world crystal, and reforming it is essential to cutting off the demons from the world's life source and finally defeating Samuel. Of course, that isn't what our necromancer wants the pieces for, and thus drama ensues. In Divine Divinity and Beyond Divinity, there's overall very little separation between the critical path and the side quests. Things just feed into each other really well. Taking an extra wheel to a broken down cart to help fix it might not have much to do with the Black Ring, but that doesn't for a second mean that the events are disconnected 
and there isn't going to be more than meets the eye down the road. I think Original Sin 2 is the best version of this though, so I'll talk more about this when we get there. While there are some really stellar quests in Beyond Divinity, there's a lot more bring item to NPC questy type things and a few absolute misses. The biggest offender is without a doubt the Teleport Forest, which plays out like this. <laughs> No, it's not fun. I've often wondered if developers actually ask their playtesters if the game is fun as well as getting bug reports, because moments like this really make me feel like no one did. We encounter the Renar for the first time in Act 3. Our first port of call here is actually a large black ring training compound that's full of fun and interesting characters of its own. Everything from competing assassins, to people who are really beginning to understand just how big of a mistake they've made signing up with the bad guys. They are opposed to the surviving Raynar, who are conducting a guerrilla war from their own hidden base, operating in some faint hope that one day they may be able to banish the Black Ring and maybe even the demons from their home. From here, and especially in Act 4, we start to see little slices of their lives and culture. They even have their own goddess, Ran, who is not one of the Seven Divines. Hmm. I wonder what else those jerks aren't telling people. What's cool is that this conflict isn't entirely centred on us. Sure, we repair the World Crystal and slay Samuel, but we do so for our own ends and we have no clue how the conflict gets resolved after that, especially given that the far more cunning and dangerous Asmodeus is still at large. Where the Raynor really come into their own though is in the final act, when we enter the Rift Runner Academy and deal with the spirits of everyone trapped there. Divine Divinity was developed in a somewhat linear way. Larian started by making Alaroth and Feral, and built their game around that, adding more as needed. Being a rookie studio who made many mistakes, they ultimately lost out on time to develop their final act, and the game degenerates into a combat slog at the end. It would be nice to lay all the blame of this at the feet of the publishers, but that's just passing the buck. If we don't take responsibility for our mistakes, we deny ourselves the chance to learn anything but distrust for others. So, shouldering some of that responsibility, Larian planned to divide their team up and work on each act of the game at the same time. This method let them spot early that their original plan for five acts in five locations was far too ambitious and needed cutting down, but it also meant that the final act was an absolute triumph. Far from battling hordes of imps and slogging through five identical fortresses to fight five bosses you've already beaten once, the Raynar Academy is a bustling school full of spirits that are unaware of their passing and stuck in a cycle of living out their final days over and over. We are able to talk to them, gain information about life at the Academy and about the art of rift running, all so that we can progress through the trials, go up through the Academy levels and finally earn the power to free ourselves from Nemesis and return to Rivalon. The final battle with Samuel is kind of incidental too. He actually has no idea where you are until a Raynar summons him in during one of your trials. There are some wonderful quests too, like when a Raynar asks you to travel back in time to retrieve an artifact for him, and when you return, claims he never sent anyone looking for that artifact because it's well known that it was stolen years ago. There's also this... thing? Seriously, what the hell am I looking at here? And one trial that presents you with many moral dilemmas to tackle and make you deal with the consequences of. There isn't even a right way to do these, you just have to deal with them and move on. The chapter is basically one massive puzzle that is divided into smaller puzzles that you have to figure out in order to progress. To do this, you have to talk to all these ghosts and get little slices of their lives and the politics of Raynar society. To be clear, the Raynar are not the good guys. Yes, this is their home. No, they are not as reprehensible as demons but they do have strict hierarchies and display traits like racism. The imps had it a little better under the Raynar, but they were still basically slaves. I won't spoil everything though, because hopefully those of you who haven't will run off to explore this place for yourselves. This is overall a much more interesting and satisfying way to close out the game than a slugfest though. And then there's the fact everyone keeps calling you Damien. Are you ready, Damien? Don't look at me! I'm as puzzled as you are. I believe he thinks you're Damien. The child of chaos studied at the academy after he arrived here. 
and before he decided to conquer this place. Now I'm quite sure that even those among us who've only played Original Sin 2 have some idea of who the damned one is. Is everything ready? Oh yes, we are prepared. Come, my love. It is time for our conquest to begin. Yep, he's a big deal. He's Lucian's adopted son. The baby boy he took from the Black Ring Fortress at the end of the first game. It would seem this decision did not prove wise. The details of Damien's fall are best left for later. The only thing you have to understand is that once Lucian defeated Damien, he banished him to Nemesis, where the Raynar taught him how to open rifts. Unfortunately, when Damien tried to return to Rivalon after years of studying at the Academy, he was blocked by a magical barrier set up by Lucian. He could basically go anywhere, to any other world he wanted, and live any life he wanted. Just not Rivalon. Maybe this is why Lucian chose Nemesis. Maybe it was a way to give Damien a chance to let go and start over anywhere he wanted. Unfortunately, being the damned one and all, Damien shuffled off to Tartarus and struck up bargains with a bunch of powerful archdemons before shattering the protecting crystal around Nemesis and letting the demons have it for themselves. He later discovers that the only way for him to truly return to Rivalon would be if his father were to call him back, or if someone with his father's authority were to open a rift and invite him through. Someone with authority like, say, a paladin of the Divine Order. I think we can see where this is going now. So once they are back on Rivalon, Damien unmasks himself and says, Haha, it was me all along. Hang on, let me unfasten this Soulforge for you. Oh yeah, I could have done that any time I wanted. And now I'm back, I'm going to do some really bad stuff. The Paladin and Damien have a final fight that the Paladin almost wins before Damien books it, claiming he's letting the Paladin off lightly because he developed an attachment to the guy after all their fights. It's certainly an interesting ending. The battle is over, but the war is far from won. And just like Divine Divinity, it's hard to say if it was a good or bad ending. If you put a gun to my head and ask me which I preferred of these two games, I'd probably have to say Divine Divinity. It's not an easy choice to be honest. I'd say Beyond Divinity has a much more interesting world, and the final act especially is much better. But I liked the bigger world and all the interesting races, all embroiled in their own little conflicts that the first game had more. Beyond Divinity is great, and also has this awesome Wheel of Time easter egg that I've really wanted to bring up but couldn't think of a good place in the script to put it. But Sven, if you're watching, yeah man, Matt is the goat. With Beyond Divinity, Larian achieved exactly what they set out to do. They produced a Divinity RPG more or less off their own backs in about 15 months. While Beyond Divinity didn't sell as well as Divine Divinity, it did turn a profit, all of which went to the studio, which meant that Larian was back. The final lead up to actually releasing the game was fraught with problems from office flooding to power outages to a huge issue with the anti-piracy software that still existed even after launch, and led to Larian just patching the damn thing out of the game with an update and not telling anyone. They had a pretty low opinion of DRM after that. Something shared by the entire PC gaming community if I'm being honest. Another thing that Larian had a low opinion of was publishers. Another sentiment shared by the entire gaming community. At this point though, publishers weren't telling developers to strip out everything fun from their games so that they can sell it back to players piecemeal in microtransactions, battle passes, or divine forbid, loot boxes. It was clear though that depending on someone else's money meant restrictions on time that could impact the overall quality of a game. And while Larian weren't quite ready to go fully independent just yet, they decided to spend some time grinding out work for hire projects to pull together enough money to get a start on what would be their next game. It took about two years for Larian to hold up all the various troll tolls to begin production on the next Divinity game. It was 2007, and the world had changed a lot. November 2006 saw the launch of the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3, and the dawn of the seventh generation of gaming. March of that same year had seen the launch of The Elder Scrolls Oblivion, a game that lives on both as a great RPG and as a true product of its era that has seen no end of being memed. 
graphical power had been boosted, and now we were starting to hear the first whispers of ideas like, games are getting too expensive to develop, and we need to come up with more ways of creating sustained revenue for games. Honestly though, even back then it sounded like, we want what World of Warcraft has but we can't break into that market. Certainly, development cycles were getting longer, and art was getting more expensive, and the bar kept getting raised. In 2007 alone we saw the release of Bioshock, a game that was not only an incredible light immersive sim that tackled all kinds of political themes while being a completely bonkers action game, but it was also an awesome tech demo for the Unreal 3 engine. Then there was Mass Effect, a game that spliced RPG mechanics with real-time, cover-based shooting, and was the reason I wound up buying an Xbox 360. Bioware made a powerful statement with this game, and would go on to release Dragon Age in 2009, the same year that Larian produced Divinity 2 Ego Draconis. If Beyond Divinity is the game that exceeded my expectations the most, then the Dragon Knight Saga, formed of Ego Draconis and its DLC expansion Flames of Vengeance, is the game that disappointed them the most. A big part of this is that the game makes an incredible first impression, with its awesome landscapes, magical flying barges and fortresses, and very charming aesthetic design that went on to inform what all Divinity games would look like from here on out. I've been looking for the name of this art style for a while, and it seems to be known only as Stylized Fantasy. It's that Josh Kirby World of Warcraft look with knights in overly bulky armour and bushy beards, buildings that are all a bit too big and crooked, and everything painted in the most vibrant colours and feeling just a little larger than life. It implies a sense of humour, but can still look serious, dark or even epic if you want it to. This is absolutely my bag. I love Fable. I like Kingdoms of Amalur. I… don't actually care for WoW. I never really did see what people enjoyed about it, and I think it went a long way towards corrupting Blizzard long before Activision dug their disgusting little claws into them. But the artwork's nice. Another idea I love is Magitech. I get the concept of wizards hiding alone in their towers, hoarding all their knowledge, stems from stories where people are still very superstitious about magic, or where maybe wizards and sorcerers did really horrible things in the past. In these settings, flaunting magic is more likely to get you burned at the stake than hired into the royal court, but honestly, if you had real magical power, wouldn't you be setting yourself up as a small business owner? Imagine how much money you could make in the medieval world with voice-activated cold-burning torches that provided plenty of light at night time, but didn't burn the place down. Or what about bottling rain clouds for hot dry summers, so farmers can keep their fields watered and grow a great harvest. Why not enchant the soil while you're at it? Can you create portals like the Renar? Awesome, start a travel company. Take people all over the world and even to other planes of existence and have them back home safe and sound in time for dinner. Or simply take them to hell and threaten to leave them there if they don't hand over all their worldly possessions. And let's not forget those big government military contracts. From magic swords to flying castles, you could be an invaluable asset that is just too big to fail in any economy. In the end, who would be a necromancer living in a crypt full of walking rotting corpses when you could be something infinitely worse? A billionaire entrepreneur. So yeah, this was a big win in the impressions department, and for a while, it just keeps getting better. Just like Divine Divinity though, Ego Draconis had a very troubled development cycle, and huge problems with publishers that led to a product that is far less than was first envisioned, and had an ending that incited everything from dissatisfaction at best to actual death threats. Good thing they patched that out in the DLC. To call the Dragon Knight Saga an ambitious project would be something of an understatement. Larian have routinely had to check their ambitions up until this point, but that never stopped them thinking big and dreaming bigger. At their core, they are world builders and storytellers. They want to create incredible places for you to explore, full of exotic races with their own unique cultures and stories to share. They want to give you adventures that take you running, or in this case, flying across their worlds, and give you incentive to explore every little nook and cranny, and they want to hide things in those nooks and crannies for you to discover. 
The seventh generation of consoles seemed like the perfect vehicle for a larger, grander vision of Rivalon. After all, Oblivion had come to consoles and seemed to be running just fine. Now was the time to create cities full of people all living their own lives, and to create dense forests and deep caverns full of dangerous creatures, all rendered in glorious 3D. The world Larian originally envisioned, though, looks and sounds more like something on a scale with the Elder Scrolls Online, in its current state, with all the expansions, and I don't think that would have run on an Xbox 360. As you can see, the original world map was built as a greatly expanded version of the Divine Divinity map that would see returning players not only visiting all those locations from the top-down sprite games in full 3D, but also let them see how things have changed since Lucian's ascension and introduce them to the world beyond those borders. Most importantly though, the feature that would put the new divinity on the map, you were going to play a Dragon Knight, a powerful warrior blessed by the Ancients who can transform into a dragon at will, take to the skies, and rain down fire and destruction from above. So they were going to need some big open spaces for you to fly around as well. While two years of work for hire had expanded their team and given them enough savings to begin putting this beast of a game together, there was no way a project of this scale could be completed without the aid of a publisher. They worked hard to create their slice, an extended tech demo that would show off the very best of what the game could be, and once they were ready, they took it to various large publishers. And no one was interested. I know the temptation is to feel bad for them, but as Steve Jobs said, you can't connect the dots looking forward, you can only connect them looking back. While he's actually describing pareidolia, our evolutionary bias towards seeing patterns where none exist, it could be said that Larian's troubles with publishers was something of a blessing in disguise. It's entirely possible that in another version of reality, Larian sealed a massive publishing deal and the Dragon Knight saga somehow became everything they wanted and more. But who knows if that would have paid off in the long run. Look at what happened to Bioware. Though, I'm really hoping they bounce back with Dreadwolf. So Larian moved to smaller publishers to help them and eventually struck a deal with DTP. They knew that belts would have to be tightened and much of this vision would have to be pared down, but they still moved forward with the intention of making the best damn game they could. Things got even tougher though when the reality of working with the new consoles presented itself, and it turned out that the Xbox 360 didn't have nearly enough power to manage bustling cities full of people, all living their own lives. We had to remove like half the characters from the dragons. Yeah, it was disgusting. All the, like, the animals in Broken Valley as well, like all the animals, they had to be removed because that was too many characters in the same area. And multiplayer once again had to get cut, despite being a branch of the game that they had been working on for a very long time. God damn it, console peasants. Why you gotta ruin everything? So why don't we take a look at what they actually produced and talk about the good and the bad. The opening cutscene is a work of art. I would love to know who was responsible for this and how they created that sky. But we are not here to admire the view, we are here to look in terror upon the Black Ring's mighty flying fortress and see the face of our Death Knight now fully restored. Damien stalks from his base of operations to look upon his next conquest. Yet we see that even the Child of Chaos, the Damned One himself, seems to have lost something close to his cold, black heart. As the camera fades away, we look upon a white-eyed hunter as he stalks his prey somewhere deep in the forests of Rivalon. And when we see what he hunts, well, we might wonder about his sanity. But this is one of the mighty dragon slayers, and the dragon, it seems, is well aware that it's in danger from this man. Before we can progress, though, as before, it's time to create a character. While we have moved into the realms of 3D, the creation process is altogether quite simple and I am once again very grateful that I can simply cycle through a few presets, switch the hair around and call it a day. Oddly, you don't choose any kind of class here, though why that is will soon become very apparent. The next cutscene is handled in-engine, but don't worry, the game is no slouch here either. We see this massive floating barge sail into a dock within a vast valley and really start to get a sense of the scale that Larian were going for with this one. With the impressive war machine parked and safe, our hero steps onto solid ground and is greeted by his mentor. The young Dragon Slayer is almost ready to graduate out of his training and ascend to the ranks of the most elite fighters in the world. 
Warriors who live for the sole purpose of hunting and killing the most powerful creatures on Rivalon. The final part of his training requires him to visit the village of Farglow, some kind of sacred Dragon Slayer ground, and gain the wisdom of the Archmage, before speaking with the few masters allowed to remain there after their retirement. Dragon Slayers, for reasons never explained, may only visit this place once in their life, and as such, our hero must go on alone. Looking around, you can see what I mean about this game making a powerful first impression. The characters are presented in some of the best looking armour in the game, and the texture work is absolutely spot on, especially given the resolution of the texture maps they were working with at the time. The landscape is beautiful. The approach to the village is quite breathtaking, and even small details like fish trying to swim upstream can be found for anyone willing to stop and just enjoy the scenery. Farglow itself feels like a living place. We can see farmers walking around taking care of livestock, and trainers at work on their craft. Okay, it isn't some bustling city, it's small and quaint, but it feels alive. Approaching the Archmage, we see her arguing with… no one. So clearly, centuries of studying the arcane arts have taken its toll on her. Well, not exactly. We get a dose of history as we discover the Order of the Dragon Slayers was formed in the response to the Dragon Knights betraying and murdering Lucian the Divine One. That's right, our boy is dead. Again. Yeah, we'll get to that. When Damien first appeared leading his flying armada, Lucian sought the aid of the Dragon Knights to help beat back the Black Ring, and together they ground the war to a stalemate. Damien, however, was also able to secure a deal with several Dragon Knights, and they assassinated Lucian in full view of his armies. The great hero of Rivalon fell, and the world responded with rage. Damien's forces were beaten back, and then everyone rallied against the Dragon Knights. The Slayers purged the land, and now only a single Dragon Knight remains. That they know of, anyway. The secret of the Slayer's success lies in the final part of their training. They absorb the memories of dragons and gain great powers from them, as well as protection from dragon psionic attacks. Specifically, they can read minds, something that becomes a major game feature, though needed explaining much better, and they can see spirits. With the ritual complete, our hero quickly realises that the Archmage wasn't talking to herself at all. Incidentally, I love this ghost design. It really shows that they were having fun making this. Taking in the dragon's memories also causes a kind of overload, meaning the Slayer will conveniently forget everything he's studied since he was 10 and restart as a level 1 character. But don't worry, those memories will resurface quickly enough with a little… experience. So yeah, it's pretty dumb and they really didn't need to point it out, but it does become something of a relevant plot hook later, so I guess we can just roll with it. Once we've got our new powers though, it's time to start learning how to play the game. Mind reading costs experience, and the amount of experience it costs is reduced by taking points in the mind reading skill. What the game doesn't tell you is this isn't a negative experience cost, but a debt that gets attached to the end of your current level. This means you're never going to de-level from reading minds, and also means that while you're low level, you should be reading the mind of everyone you can. It may look like a lot of XP at the start, but believe me, you'll clear it quickly enough once you get out there and get to killing things, so there's no reason not to use this on everyone you can. That was however a lesson I learned too late. Mind reading can be a very useful tool, as the insights you gleam can immediately change the disposition of a merchant towards you and get you a hefty discount on their wares, provide you with useful quest information, or even give you insights into combat and magic that translate to extra skill points to spend on your character upgrades. It can also give you absolutely nothing of value. This is usually signalled by the XP cost of invading someone's personal thoughts, but you can't always be sure. Let's take a look at a simple example of it in action here. In the early location of the Broken Valley Village, you can encounter a pompous ass called Richard, who represents the Champions of Alaroth. Yeah, remember Alaroth? This place? Well, it has champions now, and a lot more besides. Richard has quite a simple quest. 
If you kill goblins and bring him their hearts, he'll pay you for them. Yep, it's the ultimate in busy work quests, and the first sign of the extent to which this game was cut down from its original vision. If you read his mind though, you can discover that he's selling these hearts back in Alaroth for three times the price he's paying here. Which makes sense when you consider the cost of living there versus here, and the labour costs of facing dangerous monsters and harvesting their organs after, and let's not forget the incurred travel costs, so it's quite a fair enterprise when you really think about it. But you're welcome to call him out on it once you know the deal and get a larger cut of the profits. So it's a useful little toy to play with, and certainly more than a gimmick where you spend XP for extra dialogue lines. The next thing you need to look into is how to fight. There are three trainers in Farglow, matching the three great fantasy archetypes of warrior, ranger, or wizard. You can speak to each of them, and they'll let you practice with a starter weapon and skill from each class, or you can head out to the mountains behind Farglow, where a mage will summon in a few goblins for you to test yourself against. My biggest problem with the combat is feedback, or the lack thereof in the game's animation and sound effects. There are a few potent explosive sound effects that produce a strong reaction for sure, but for the most part it feels… floaty. With melee attacks for example there isn't enough of an impact and unless it's a knockdown or killing blow, there's no reaction from enemies when I strike. Seriously, look at these guys just standing there. This can leave me wondering if I'm actually hitting them. And archery… archery sucks. It's just really bad. I tried it once in Farglow and decided to never bother again. The bow has no sense of weight at all. It would be easy to compare this to a game like Dark Souls. I mean, the character can dodge roll. But let's use Fable instead. It's a game made in a very similar style and actually older than Divinity, so it's not like we have all those extra years of experience and processing power to draw upon. I can probably do this without commentary, but you can see how much more impact these attacks have. Even the magic in Fable just feels powerful. For justice. Divinity 2's combat feels like MMORPG combat, or at least MMORPGs of that era. This is further demonstrated by the little MMORPG style hotbar we have at the bottom of the screen that we can select our skills from. Just like the previous two games, the Dragon Knight Saga has a skill based progression system, meaning you can mix and match skills to your heart's content to create any kind of Dragon Slayer that you want. When you level up you get 4 attribute points to put into your primary stats, and 1 skill point to either increase the power of an existing skill or purchase a new one. You can even respec from about the halfway point onwards. Well, you can respec skills, but you can't respec attributes. So while you can abandon your mage playthrough for a warrior halfway through, you're going to be a warrior with high intelligence and low strength, and you're going to be at one hell of a disadvantage. But Arkham, I hear you say. Surely no one would be that stupid. Yeah, only a stupid mage would want to be a warrior. I guess a robot would have to be crazy to want to be a folk singer. Skills can use MP and have a cooldown of up to 15 seconds. Yes, let me repeat that. Skills use MP and have a cooldown of up to 15 seconds. I'm not sure why they couldn't just pick one of these limitations, because this is something that made me feel really underpowered for a lot of the game. Now you can use a special developer mode that has various cheats to help with debugging the game, and yes, absolutely, if you don't have cooldowns on your skills, you are way OP. But 15 seconds is just absurd, especially if you're going for a glass cannon wizard and your objective is destruction from afar. I'm not sure why I've been trying to make this happen in every game up to this point. I usually play warriors or rogues, but I really wanted to try something different. There's also the fact that later in the game, many enemies can cast heal on themselves, meaning that you can blow through your powers reducing their health bar, only to have them start regenerating faster than you can damage them and effectively reset the fight back to the start, but with all your main attacks still on cooldown. And this happens a lot. So after going through the opening tutorial, I opted to take wizard powers and try to build a kind of battle mage who summoned an abomination to act as his meat shield, whittled down enemy health bars while they were far away, and then finished them with a mace once they were close. Basically what I wanted to do in Divine Divinity 2. And it did not work out again. 
but we'll get to that later. The game starts in earnest after this, when our mentor gets the news that the last Dragon Knight has been spotted in the Broken Valley, and they are going to hunt it. The problem? Well, those Dragon Memories you've just been given aren't all that stable right now, and it takes a second ritual to… actually, I'll let her explain it. You were supposed to do a ritual that would channel the Dragon Memories, which is extremely important for your health and that of your surroundings. If we postpone it for too long, you will go Dragon Wild, and the ones that survive that terrible affliction spend the rest of their lives in deep dungeons, eating their own tongues and clawing out their eyes. So, yeah, not good news. Let's go ahead and see how all this plays out. I'm sure nothing could go wrong. While the combat is definitely lacking, so much of the opening hours of the Dragon Knight Saga are as interesting and fun as any other Larian game. Broken Valley Village feels like one of the most complete areas. That is to say, it seems a lot closer to the game envisioned in the design documents than any other area. Your first task here is basically walk around, talk to everyone, and gather information on dragon sightings. This is a lot like the opening trip around Alaroth in Divine Divinity. It's a chance for the player to learn about all the different game systems in a fairly organic way, as well as meet lots of people, dig into their small town stories, and gain a lot of side quests in the process. You'll also probably be able to accrue enough experience in gold to clear a level or two and buy slightly better equipment than your starting gear. This way, you won't get murked the moment you step out of the village and encounter a dangerous rabbit. <laughs> Just kidding. That thing only shows up after killing about 30 of the things. The side quests in this game demonstrate some of the very best and very worst work that Larian have ever put into their games. I've already cited the Goblin Heart quest as one of the worst, although it does have a little extra going for it with the mind reading gimmick, but another really weak area is the bounty boards. Now, there's nothing especially wrong with starting a quest from a bounty board. The Witcher 3 has plenty of these, and many of them progress into deep branching stories full of difficult choices and morally ambiguous endings that leave you wondering if you actually did the right thing. These bounties, though, aren't anything like that at all. They're just named creatures that are located in the areas that we're going to visit anyway. Honestly, when you find them in among the massive enemies you sometimes find yourself up against, it's hard to even pick them out or notice if you defeated them or not, and then you just loot an item off their corpse and give it back to an NPC the next time you're in town. You'll get some XP and extra gold, and that's about all there is to it. In the latter third of the game, in the Fjords, I actually wound up encountering and killing every creature on the bounty boards before I even found the board and just collected everything all at once. Admittedly, I did take a scenic route there and completely ignored the door that gets you into the right location until a guide I was reading told me to go there. These are non-jobs, non-quests, less than busy work really, and they're very far beneath the level of quality that Larian presented in both Divine and Beyond Divinity. But okay, that's the worst of the quests, so it's only fair we talk about the best. This could take a while. To best demonstrate the quality and attention to detail in Divinity 2's quests, I think we should take a look at a specific example. A simple early game quest called Private Delivery became a sort of standard that Larian tried to hold all their other quests to when developing them. Not just for this game either, as we'll see when we get into Original Sin 1 and 2. On the surface, this quest is a fairly simple delivery quest. A young lady gives you a letter, you deliver it, the end. Right? I mean, yeah. It could be that simple. Sure. My personal experience when playing the game was actually pretty straightforward. I went to a farm just outside the village and met a young lady named Dana. Dana is married to this guy, Carl, but she asks me to take a sealed letter to the blacksmith in the village and insists that I don't open it on the way. Okay, I think. I can see what's really going on here. This may explain why the smith is so damn grumpy all the time. But hey, love is love, says I, and as a divorcee myself, I don't think anyone should stay in a marriage that isn't making them happy. So I run back to the village, hand off the letter, the blacksmith is overjoyed, and runs off to the farm to whisk Dana away so that they can live together and have Baldur's Gate 3 not suitable for streaming scenes every night. The smith is so happy, in fact, that he lowers his prices for me. Simple, right? But how about this? Instead of giving the letter to the blacksmith, 
I give it to Carl to take a look at. Carl discovers about his wife's betrayal, and they argue with each other before she runs off to live with the blacksmith. Dana and the smith don't like me, and the smith raises his prices, but Carl thinks I'm awesome and gives me a unique amulet. Or, I open the letter, read its contents, and then try to blackmail Dana about it. She gets upset, runs away, and now the blacksmith doesn't even want to trade with me. Or, I open the letter, read it, but give it to the smith. He's angry that I read it, so even though he gets his girl, he still doesn't like me. But wait, there's more. Because Carl here is actually the jealous type, and it seems the blacksmith isn't the first guy to capture his longing wife's attention and try to steal her away. What happened to this would-be homewrecker? Well, breaking into his house and reading his journal reveals that Carl actually killed this man, and you can confront him with the evidence of his crime, even reporting him and having him sent to jail, at which point this problem just kinda solves itself. Whew. That was a lot, and you wouldn't even notice from a single playthrough. I imagine the forums were rife with a lot of those what did you do in X quest threads for quite a while. This multiple outcome route is at the very heart of Divinity 2's best quests. I'll cite a few more good quests later, but for now, let's continue our adventure. Since we're talking about quests, I guess now is a good time to bring up the dialogue, which is another area that saw a huge upgrade from the first game. The script for the Dragon Knight Saga is many, many times the size of the previous ones, and the voice acting is now on par with what was expected in games of that era. No more getting your friends to record low quality audio on cheap microphones and just running it through the imp filter. Larian were going for immersion, and that meant longer, more detailed conversations and high quality professional voice acting. I don't have any complaints about this part. The voices are great and both the dramatic beats and the comedy all hits. I am, however, not a big fan of dialogue trees filled with lore and exposition. I think backstory especially is something better discovered organically, so conversations with characters like Lovis got a bit tedious at times. So we run around town taking care of rowdy soldiers, stumbling into a secret alchemist garden complete with a talking tree, all quite normal really, and even enter the crypt beneath the church to face off with an angry spirit. This is actually part of our initiation. Since the memory ritual couldn't be finished in Rivertown, this is apparently a temporary band-aid to help stop our minds from blowing up. The ghost in question happens to be a famous dragon slayer, and even gives us his famous sword of dragon slaying as a thank you for helping him rest. Soon enough though, our adventures take us beyond the walls of the village and out into the wilderness full of goblins, bandits, one very useful necromancer, and somewhere out there, the last Dragon Knight. Being the rookie and a potential liability in a battle with a dragon, our hero is left behind to be the town odd jobs man. However, this leads to him stumbling into a face-to-face -face encounter with the last Dragon Knight Talana, after she flees from battle with the other Slayers and lands not far from him by chance. She is mortally wounded thanks to that Sword of Dragon Slaying we found earlier, and dying, and needs to pass on her powers to anyone she can find. So while someone sworn to eradicate her entire species and groomed to do just that since the age of 10 wouldn't be her first choice, beggars can't be choosers. Connecting their minds, Talana shows the Slayer the true threat that is approaching Rivalon. Damien has rebuilt his strength, and his flying fortresses are closing in, and this time there aren't any Dragon Knights or a Divine to help fight back. This is our introduction to the Dragon gameplay, which looks like it could be really fun. It's very brief but hints at something very exciting to come. As Talana fades away to become nothing more than a persistent voice in our head, who guides us through the rest of the game, the Slayer realizes he now has a much grander purpose. He needs to unlock his full potential as a Dragon Knight and take the fight to the Black Ring. To do that though, he's going to need access to Maxos's battle tower on Sentinel Island and a Dragon Morphing Stone. The Broken Valley skyline is dominated by a ruined battle tower that once belonged to Lord Lovis, the Dragon Knight who, long ago, ruled over this region. He's still there, actually, bound there and unable to leave or die for the crime of neglecting his duties, and we need to talk to him. Lovis was gifted this tower by the wizard Maxos, a legendary wizard of unimaginable power who lived thousands of years ago, and is a key player in the game Dragon Commander. 
When we do meet Lovis, he has a lot of lore to exposit to us, which as I've mentioned already is a bit tedious, but it gets the point across. It also makes sense that a new Dragon Knight might want to bug an older one with a ton of questions about the who's, what's and where's of Dragon history and society, but this is a very inelegant way of teaching the history and lore of your world to your players. Lovis explains a few important game points. So we know about the relationship between Lucian and Damien from the previous two games. We know that Lucian tried to raise Damien to be, if not good, then at least free to choose his own fate. But that the Black Ring sent an agent called Isolde, or Yagurner in this game, to corrupt him. When Lucian discovered this, he had her executed, which is what led to Damien running away, becoming the leader of the Black Ring, and incited the war that ended with his defeat and banishment to Nemesis. What we discover here is that Damien was actually in love with Yagurna and, having become a powerful wizard, tried to soulforge himself with her. I'm not sure why. Maybe because he knew his father didn't have it in him to kill him, soulforging with Yagurna would stay his hand at the execution. He was, however, too late, and Yagurna died at the moment the spell was cast. This, apparently, created a strange inverse soulforge that means should Yagurna be resurrected, Damien will die. Since the damn one is almost invincible in combat, this seems like the only way to deal with him. To this end, Lovis gives us the key to the Temple of Maxos that has information on both how to get to the Hall of Echoes, Divinity's Afterlife, and will offer a portal to Sentinel Island where the character can fight to gain both Maxos' Battle Tower and the Dragon Morphing Stone from the vile necromancer Lycan. Quickly calling back to Larian's wonderful open-ended quest structure here too. Lovis has a personal favour to ask the Dragon Knight. He freely admits that Maxos imprisoned him eternally in his tower for failing in his duties to protect the Broken Valley from the demon Baal. He admits this was a failure of his own making, as a long life of power and privilege had made him complacent. However, he feels that eternal imprisonment is unjust, something I'm inclined to agree with. Seriously, sit down and really try to contemplate the idea of eternity and you'd be sympathetic too. To end Lovis' confinement, we need only enter the Temple of Maxos and retrieve his soul that is bound in a stone and guarded by his mortal enemy. However, while we're there, the ghosts in the temple offer up a very different story about who Lord Lovis was, and explains that they too were punished for his crimes with an eternity of unrest. Were the Dragon Knight to shatter Lovis' soul stone, however, they would be freed, while he would remain confined. An interesting conundrum. Two quests that exist in direct opposition to each other. Save one, and damn the other. As before, Divinity 2 doesn't have any official morality system, so it's all up to you who you help and why. Maybe Lovis can offer better rewards than these ghosts. But if the ghosts are telling the truth, then not only is Lovis a terrible person, but he also withheld information and tried to manipulate you. Is that really someone you want to help? So that's our setup for the first half of the game. Our critical path only actually uses about this much of the map, with the rest being left available for side content, though this is much thinner on the ground than in previous games. So much of the exploration in this game is just a senseless hack and slash -a -thon, and as I've already mentioned, I wasn't all that taken with the combat. Beyond the borders of Broken Valley Village, there isn't anything resembling another civilization. There are some game moments, including our first encounter with the Mad Wizard Belagar, who is absolutely awesome, and may also have Deadpool powers of knowing he's actually a character in a game. A jetpack he gave the Dragon Commander. Aye, I can tell you with absolute candor that he gave him a mighty empire too. Boy, you've got a lot of catching up to do. So hie thee to a store and take a good gander at the amazing spectacle that is Dragon Commander. Should Larian continue the Divinity Saga in the future, I really hope they expand on this guy more. Or at least just have more random encounters with him. I mean, damn, he soulforged some poor sod with a chicken. There's a story behind that later. Don't worry. The Bandit Camp is also an area worth exploring, as it does have some connection with the Critical Path. Remember that necromancer I was talking about, Lycan? Well, he's actually backing these guys. They murder people, take their stuff, 
and then deliver the bodies to him for his... hobby? Is necromancy a hobby? Fane, is it a hobby? Fane? Fane. Heading there, you can get involved in a large-scale battle between soldiers and bandits, and finish the Temple of Doom quest that, as well as showing off some great world design, leads to a very early encounter with Lycan. I really like how Larian make many of their side quests critical path adjacent, and not just a job or faction that has nothing to do with the main story. As before, there really isn't much to tell you where it's safe to go when you're exploring. You kind of just have to walk around, check enemies, the ones you can see anyway, the skeletons are almost impossible to notice at times, see what level they are, and make an informed decision about if you can handle it or not. I spent a lot of the early game feeling pretty weak, and rather than exploring the variety of skills that could make an interesting build, I felt I had to focus just on my primary combat skills in order to keep up with the enemies. I gained some respite upon encountering this necromancer and gaining the aid of a new, undead companion. This creature is a very cool and interesting little addition to the game, and one that suited my early game summoner build. It's something you can Frankenstein together from body parts that you find all over the map. Different parts will affect its base stats, class, and available attacks, and he's a very useful little fella to have around. I named mine Jeremy. I just wish there'd been an option to give him a top hat and a monocle, but hey, that's what mods are for. And so we soldier on to the Temple of Maxos, which is... Wow. Tell me you're an evil wizard without telling me you're an evil wizard. It was about this time, however, that I started having a lot less fun with the game. Much of the role-playing had been left behind in Broken Valley Village, and I was left slogging through the combat that I felt was mid at best. And as the enemies were getting stronger, I was starting to feel underpowered. By the time I actually got to Sentinel Island, I was desperate for some kind of respite from the grind. And while we do get that to some degree, there's still a lot of fighting here that really didn't need to be if I'm being honest. The original design documents for Divinity 2 tell a very different story of the Dragon Knight's origins, and place heavy emphasis on the Battle Tower being a focal point of the game. The tower was going to be a central hub from which the Dragon Knight would make his plans, stock up on supplies, and adventure out into the world. A story concerning gathering the various races together to form a super army to fight Damien would see the knight travelling all over Rivalon, doing work to help the different factions and recruiting them in. As they did, ambassadors and soldiers of these races would gather at the tower, and new facilities would become available. The tower would be upgradable, and raising its power would reflect on the knight. The final battle was almost envisioned as something akin to an RTS, with the Dragon Knight commanding his forces to battle the Black Ring, while taking to the skies to rain down fire from above. This posed a huge problem of teaching the player these mechanics throughout the game. You simply can't switch the genre of your game for the final battle and expect everyone to be okay with that. This idea ultimately became its own game, and that's how Dragon Commander happened. We've since seen upgradable bases like these used in Mass Effect, Dragon Age, and even Original Sin 1 has something similar going on. It was a very ambitious idea, one that got stripped down a lot for the final game. That being said, a lot of Sentinel Isle is very fun, and when we do finally get our battle tower, there are quite a few cool things to do with it. We have several floors containing an enchanter, a necromancer, an alchemist, a combat trainer, and a war room of sorts. We can also be entertained by a bard and a dancer if we so desire. It's a good addition, and I was very excited when I realised where this was going. But first, I had to get the damn thing. Arriving on Sentinel Isle, we are greeted by the spirit of the Isle herself, who explains that, as the new lord here, we have to choose our servants. She has seen fit to pull two candidates for trainer, necromancer, enchanter and alchemist out of their lives and drop them at random places on the Isle. I would have to visit each in turn, and make a choice over who would join me. The other would be killed. Why would they be killed? I have no idea. You can't refuse either, as she'll just choose for you. With the exception of the Dragon Elf enemies on this island, I actually really enjoyed this part though. The Dragon Elves are actually the remnant of another feature that got cut. A half-dragon form was envisioned for the player, 
for when they were exploring in underground areas or inside. It got cut because it proved mostly pointless. Earlier this year, I played Wolf Eye Studios Weird West and had the same feelings about the werewolf character in that game. It was a nice gimmick to become a big hulking mass of claws and fur, but overall far less fun than the shooting mechanics, so I hardly used it at all. Still, the creature design lives on as the Dragon Elves. I really needed a break from the combat at this point though. I was feeling underpowered anyway, but I just wanted to walk around and enjoy the story elements, and I don't think these fights really added anything to the area. Again, there are multiple routes to the ending of this quest. Of course you get a binary choice of who lives or who dies at the end, but you can for example, read the minds of some and get an idea of their personalities, and even let them directly compete against each other in contests to see who is more suitable for the position. Ultimately, there is no right answer. Each candidate has something unique to bring to the table, and there are pros and cons to either. The final leg of this phase of the game is where the cracks started to show, and I just started to get fed up. There is a massive battle to approach the base of the tower with more, even stronger bandits than before, that come in great numbers, and yes, they can heal, and no, it's not fun when they do that. My ally in this charge just waits at the bottom of the tower, leading me to kite enemies back to her to avoid getting overwhelmed. Then inside the tower, we learn that Lycan is in fact Soulforged to the demon Razekal, and it's suggested that it might be easier to summon and defeat him rather than face Lycan. Cool, let's do that, I foolishly think assuming this is some kind of choice that I had. The fight with Razakal is no cakewalk either, but by expending all my potions and retrying multiple times, I finally got his health low enough to initiate a cutscene where he runs away to report to Lycan. So now I have to fight both of them, and there's no way I can return to the outside world to refresh my supplies. So guess who used god mode and doesn't feel a scrap of regret about it? I'm sorry but this is bad encounter design, and I already had a fairly low opinion of the combat. It was just getting to be too much. Even if I had a save before the Razakal fight, I just didn't want to do it again. But I got my tower, and I got my Dragon Morph Stone, and I got to play the second half of the game, and for a while it picks back up because, baby, you can be a dragon. The dragon form was the heart and soul of the Dragon Knight saga. It was the thing that was going to set this game apart from other games and really put it on the map. So why did it take half the game to access the damn thing? Well, as with all things in gaming, what seems like a great idea on paper may not be so fun when you actually get it into the game. While this was one of the most exciting features to bring, it was also one of the hardest to balance, and the fix that was decided on in the end for many of the problems well, I'm sorry, but I call bullshit here. That doesn't for a second mean that being a dragon isn't fun, because it's actually really awesome. But there are some problems. Dragons are mighty and powerful, on a par with a force of nature for the damage they can do. Broken Valley is called that simply for the sheer amount of damage that was done by the Dragon Knights when they fought with Damien. So giving that kind of limitless power to a player would probably feel a lot like playing with the cheats on, and unless you're 8 years old, that's actually kind of boring. Early builds and tech demos of the game showed the player transforming at will any time he wanted. Need to deal with a couple of low level imps in the trees? No problem, dragon shape and burn. This could be offset by the size of the dragon making it an easy target for spells and ranged weapons, but come on! Would a dragon really be bothered by regular arrows or the average mage's magic missile? The Black Ring's flying fortresses are protected by numerous ballista, lightning eyes and mutated drakes that are spewed out of nests that need to be destroyed. The drakes themselves provide cool air-to-air -air combat. Launching an assault on a flying fortress is tremendous fun the first time you do it. It's only when you realise just how many of the damn things you're expected to take down that it starts to get tedious. Claiming the battle tower and your dragon shape permanently changes the broken valley. 
Damien brings his army in and gasses the entire area, effectively making everything you did in the first half of the game pointless, and confining you to the skies and the highest areas of the valley for combat. This isn't the end of the RPG elements though, as the Ouroboros Fjords have a couple of settled areas where you can still talk to people, pick up quests, and do RPG stuff. I was more than happy to provide a powerful summoner with a rune of summoning chickens so that he could simply conjure food anytime he wanted and live out his dream of living in a cave underground and never meeting another human again. Mood. Some of the boss fights in these quests too also become dragon battles, and that's pretty awesome. But overall, there is a lot less content and a lot more fighting in this part of the game, and that led to a massive drop off in interest for me. I was feeling like I was just going through the motions and not having a great deal of fun. I decided to switch out to a melee build at this point and invested in some strength and constitution to that effect. It was going well for a while, but that didn't really last. I had thought that traveling to Alaroth would provide more roleplaying and questing opportunities, but as it turns out, the majority of Alaroth was cut from the game. It had originally been planned as something on a scale of the Imperial City, and hours of work had been done on building it, but as the project progressed and deadlines loomed, things had to get cut. Even with the city finished, there was no way Larian could fill it with content, and it was axed, save as the location, for another big fight. This time, we are protecting Xandalore, as he tries to close rifts to the demonic realm of Tartarus. If he gets hit, his concentration is interrupted, and he has to start again. Oh god do I hate this mission. Did anyone playtest this at all? The final section requires you to hold off the ghost for a whole minute, and they're coming from three different portals. I basically save scum my way through the waves because there is really no incentive to do it right. It's just too damn cheap and frustrating. Maybe you can tell, but I wasn't really having fun by this point in the playthrough. Let's go back to talking about being a dragon so we can sort of wrap this up on a high note. The fjords are great fun for being a dragon. It's awesome to fly and soar through this whole area. I really love the side quest about the flying goblin too. It was a lot of fun. The air to air combat is pretty cool, and while the dragon upgrades are very limited, much more limited than originally intended, they are all useful and pretty cool. There's even some good tactics for switching between dragon and human mid fight to get free heals and MP recovery in a pinch. I have no issues with the parts of the game where I was a dragon, and as I said, those quests that started with me in cramped tunnels as a human and finished with me battling in massive caverns as a dragon, that's great integration of mechanics right there. Unfortunately though, there's one big problem. Because of the issues with the dragon being OP, Larian basically made it impossible to damage human targets as a dragon. In fact, when you transform, they just vanish so you can't attack them. Apparently, they all just run for cover. So why are they exactly where I left them when I changed back to human? I understand that this was a quick fix. One of many, many quick fixes in the game. But this one is bad. Why not let us destroy Black Ring soldiers from the sky? They, of all people, might be prepared for a Dragon Knight and have special arrows to fight back. No, instead we have to change back to a human and fight them the regular way. Then we have to break into the heart of their fortress to find a boss inside and fight them. And it just gets so tedious. I cut my losses with this and basically skipped most of the fortresses. Now I wasn't having fun. There just isn't enough content in the late game to keep me interested. The flying parts of the fortresses are all pretty fun, but they get very samey after a while. And once all the anti-air enemies are taken care of, it's time to land and slog through another lengthy bunch of fights to find chests with leveled randomized loot in them and a boss fight somewhere at the end of it all. Rinse, repeat, and repeat. I sped ran to the end using the developer console to cheat my way through tough fights, especially the Hall of Echoes. I don't know whose idea it was to lock you in a room and make you fight every boss in the game one after the other, but that is not fun at all. So we break into the Hall of Echoes, extract Yagurna's soul, return her to life, only to discover we were played the whole time. The voice in our head wasn't Talana, but Yagurna. 
and her coming back to life doesn't kill Damien, it makes him invincible. So, we fail. Rivalon is doomed. We have a small epilogue where we discover we are not dead, but actually trapped in the Hall of Echoes, and that Lucian is alive and well and trapped here with us. And so with that glint of hope left, we see the Damned One's armies wash over Rivalon and cut to credits. See you next game. Anyone else just a little pissed off here? Look, I know real life is complicated, but adventures are supposed to be symbolic and meaningful. What meaning do I extract from that? Okay. I learned not to trust dragon voices in my head. What am I supposed to do with that? The game is over. It's too late. Well, not entirely. So, I'm actually writing this section a few days after writing the previous part. I've had a little time to cool off and think more about my playthrough, and I think I need to shoulder some of the responsibility for my experience with Ego Draconis here. Specifically, the late game combat. I stand by much of what I said about the combat being frustrating, and the animations being floaty and unsatisfying to watch, but... Number one, I wasn't just playing the game to enjoy it. I was playing the game to make this video. This made me more goal-oriented. I probably wanted to finish the game more than I wanted to enjoy playing it. Second, my respec. Yeah, I switched from Wizard to Warrior halfway through, and clearly didn't have the stats for it. I partly blame Larian for not letting me respec stats, but I should have probably tried to make a different wizard build first. Had I just been playing for fun, I may have considered a full restart and possibly following a build guide to get the most out of a playstyle, but again, I wasn't playing the game just for fun. These two factors no doubt impacted my experience, and I just want people who are on the fence about playing this to be aware of that when making their decisions. Based on the amount of times I've talked about how much Divinity 2 was cut down from its vision, you can no doubt guess that money was an issue. As mentioned before, larger publishers weren't interested in the game, with one person citing there are no creative people in Belgium as their reasons. Again, these are not people who should be responsible for creative projects in any way. They are completely oblivious to anything other than numbers on a spreadsheet, and as we'll soon discover, aren't very good at that either. Incidentally, that dickhead actually wound up in the game. Remember that guy I mentioned who was soul forged to a chicken? Yeah, that's him. You can kill the chicken if you find it, by the way. It's here. Now, Larian do have some responsibility for not checking their ambitions as early as possible when the reality of making the game became clear. But I empathize. When you have a vision and it's your baby, it's so difficult to want to compromise on that. You think that somehow you'll find a way, that you'll make it happen, that love will conquer all. And for Larian, that is true, just not for this game. DTP ran into financial woes of their own during the game's development and ultimately cut development time short and told Larian to finish what they had and release it. Yep. The guys who are only good at money, couldn't even do money. These people are so unimaginably dumb, and no studio anywhere ever should trust one or get involved in one. The sheer simplicity of, let creative passionate people do creative passionate things, and people will come to see it, completely eludes them in this and most other industries. This is why despite over a decade of trying, Hollywood still can't make a good 90 minute action movie about four SWAT team members in a death trap zombie mansion. Utter stupidity and arrogance. Sorry, but this kind of matters to me. Anyway, on a completely unrelated note, there's this one scene in the Ouroboros Fjords where you have to battle the... Dragon... Terror... Patrol. A bunch of Slayer rejects who have very high opinions of themselves and are generally annoying as hell to deal with. Fun fact, if you kill this guy, you can actually turn into a dragon and roast them. For some reason, they're the only enemies in the game you can do that to. Isn't that cool?
Well, hey there. Future Arkham here. Not that you'd know, but I'm sitting here writing this section long after my Ego Draconis playthrough was wrapped up and I'd also finished Original Sin 2. I had originally planned on making this a very short aside, but for reasons I'll soon explain, I found myself with a lot more to say on the topic. Since the previous instalment had worn me down, I wanted to get into Original Sin 2, which in many ways was the real golden goody at the end of this already sweet laden road, and so finished that before playing this. This gave me enough of a break to let me reset a lot of my ideas about the game and come at it with an open mind. And I'm glad I did, because oh my god, this was so much fun! Okay, so first, yes, my character build was shit, and that seriously impacted my enjoyment of the game. So much so that Ego Draconis has definitely earned a do-over at some point down the line from me, just not for this video. At the start of Flames of Vengeance, you get to pick a pre-made character, and I chose a warrior. The stats on this guy are clearly all strength and constitution with nothing else. You start in the high 60s, and I capped those out at 100 very quickly. His skill selection was similar to mine, but one major difference was the use of the Life Leech skill. I had poo pooed this on my original build, thinking the chances of it working and the potential benefit of it wasn't worth the skill investment over casting heal on myself. However, when leveled up to 10, you get what is basically a 30% chance to gain about 30% of your health back per hit. And when you consider the sheer amount of enemies you come up against in a melee, this really is the fighter's choice for gaining health back. I almost never used a potion in this playthrough. It happened a few times on some tougher enemies, but this thing did an incredible job of keeping me alive otherwise. And because it's passive, well, I should be flaying myself for forgetting my mantra that passives are always better than active. So, having a well-made character makes a huge difference to the combat. However, most of my other criticisms of it still remain true. I mean, here is what fighting a high-level boss looks like. I think that speaks for itself, really. Remember that Devil May Cry has happened by this point. So it's better, but still not something you can really bet a lot of your game on. Fortunately though, most of this game is about exploring a city and doing a lot of role-playing. The game takes place in the city of Alaroth. As mentioned, this had all been made for the original game and then cut when the Deadline Hammer came down. Flames of Vengeance is about, more or less, finishing what Ego Draconis started. It was about rebalancing and fixing the game, really nailing the dragon combat and polishing it into its best form, and bringing back some of the cut content as well as finishing the story. It begins where Ego Draconis ends, with Lucian and our Dragon Knight still imprisoned within the Hall of Echoes. Damien and Yagurna have taken the Ouroboros Fjords and have now finally set their sights on the healer's city of Alaroth. Xandalore has created a magical barrier that protects the city from the Damned One's bombardments, but given he is more or less the battery powering this, it's definitely on a timer. Into this arena, a mysterious spectre arrives, a malevolent looking thing that wants to strike a bargain with the Dragon Knight. He can free him, return him to Rivalon, and even free the Divine One and stop Damien. All he wants in return is freedom. A Faustian bargain with an unknown devil may not be the offer of a lifetime, but at the moment, I'm all out of other ideas. Returning to Rivalon, we are immediately met by a helpful guard who isn't at all surprised that we're back and not only knows everything that's been going on since our confinement, but also has time to stand around explaining it all to us while the city hangs in mortal danger. It's not a very elegant way to get the player started along the critical path, but it's efficient, I'll say that much. Most importantly though, it sets us up to be turned loose on Alaroth and have a wild time doing so. Alaroth is divided into a populated area where you can talk to people 
go shopping and get quests, and a combat zone that's overflowing with undead that needs clearing out. Most of what Flames of Vengeance has to offer between these two areas is stuff I've already talked about in covering the base game. So rather than go over that same ground again, let's go over some of the quest highlights because while there are a couple of duds like this... The ring. A precious ring. I knew you'd have a kind heart. The hits are some of the absolute best. The critical path involves gathering a series of clues that will help you solve a combination lock that will free our captured benefactor, or rather, unleash him upon the world to exact vengeance for millennia of imprisonment. He's basically an evil necromancer called Berlin. I am not saying that right. Who was imprisoned by Maxos in a time either before or around the Dragon Commander Wars. You don't actually have to find every clue, as you can attempt to crack the lock with some trial and error. But we're not here to speedrun, and even if you found 4 out of 5, it's going to take a while to figure out where that fifth one goes. This alone leads us into all kinds of shenanigans. One such example is that we need help from the scholars at the Prancing Pony. This is also where we'll get access to a book of an ancient elven alphabet that will allow us to talk to a tree that's blasting people with lightning. That is a sentence that I just said. I wish that was as weird as things get, but it really isn't. You see, the men at the Prancing Pony are somewhat old-fashioned. And by old-fashioned, I mean they're misogynists, who have more than put both their feet in their mouths with a young sorceress, who's gone and turned them all into talking vegetables. You need to interact with them to gain access to some passwords in their gentlemen's club, but you're quite welcome to eat them if you're so inclined. Mind reading them reveals that you can get some great bonuses if you do so. I'm not big on capital punishment though, no matter how hilarious. Then there's the murder investigation in Madame Eve's <coughs> very reputable establishment. An investigation that leads to a confrontation with a very powerful zombie named Jake. If you've played Original Sin, you may be wondering if there's someone at Larian's office named Jake, who either looks like or maybe has the odour of a zombie or something. I was wondering the same until I remembered that this was Alaroth. You know, this place. And... <coughs> and he's not the only one. As Alaroth expanded from a small village into a massive city, it swallowed up the old, cursed abbey, and we find ourselves traversing through part of it once again to wind up in an encounter with the Engineer, whom we work so hard to release in Divine Divinity. I also love the stories concerning the Goblin and the Adventurer who stole from the graves of old Troll Kings and, well... Actually, that asylum where you find the Goblin is straight up creepy. Listen to this music. like I'm not getting in. But they basically wound up transforming into trolls and need you to return what they stole in hope it'll break the curse. I laughed, I cried, I had a rollicking good time all the way through this, and here's why. Flames of Vengeance is dense. It's a really dense game, maybe too dense. At the start it seems like literally everyone needs your help with one thing or another. And since I was starting at a high level anyway, I wasn't shy about mind reading basically everyone and extracting every little secret and every scrap of information that I could. While Alaroth is certainly the largest populated area in the entire game, it is still relatively small, much more of an adventuring hub than any kind of open world, and I honestly think this is where Larian do their best work. Many of my complaints about Ego Draconis are targeted at the end or in the areas where there's nothing but lengthy stretches of combat and not much else. The fighting just isn't good enough to carry hours of game by itself in my opinion. But running around town, meeting all these people and getting mixed up in all their crazy little stories is just a blast and it is easily the highlight of this and every game Larian makes. It's why I rate the endgame of Beyond Divinity way above that of Divine, 
and I think we can all agree that the entire section in arcs in Original Sin 2 is just awesome and a really great way to end that whole game. All the way along our critical path we are hounded by Balagar, the eternally rhyming mage, who is determined to stop us from freeing Berlin. This comes in the form of him summoning us into battle arenas at the completion of each critical path mission, which isn't too difficult but does get a little tedious after a while. Still, this is the most characterization the Mad Wizard gets, even going so far as to plead with you when you've managed to beat him all the way back to the gates of Berylin's prison. Which is convenient really, because I never planned on freeing an evil necromancer onto the world, and Balagar just so happens to have a second option for me to explore. I really like this House of Secrets too. It really feels like this whole thing was put together with fun in mind. I can imagine Sven and his team having meetings about the game, and guys throwing out the most outrageous ideas they can think of, while Sven just sits there straight faced and nodding along before asking how long it'll take to make. In an ideal world, this whole area would have been in the base game and accessible from the halfway point onwards. Some version of this story would have been the missing content from the late game that brought it up to the level of the start of the game. The only weak point really is the dragon form section at the end. Yeah, they managed to screw up one of my favourite things about the base game. You're basically guarding an airship that's loaded with Belagar's explosives as it flies into the heart of Damien's flying fortresses. So it's an escort mission, and we all know they suck. It's entirely possible to save yourself into a corner here too if you're not careful. So this part is pretty weak, and I cheese through it with console commands in the end, but we get our sweet revenge on Yagurna. Alaroth is saved and the Divine One returns from the dead to the adoration of the world. The Dragon Knights are vindicated and Damien is sent away to lick his wounds. Which is a good job really because little does everyone know, but Lucian has been nothing but a powerless figurehead for a long time. And the Seven Divinities are no longer watching over Rivalon. But something is watching. Something very hungry. One way or another, the Dragon Knight saga wasn't the RPG powerhouse that Sven and Larian had hoped it would be. The studio had once again been hamstrung by time and budget constraints, and the horrible realities of depending on publishers. But Larian was still a recognised name, and Divinity was something of a cult classic. There was plenty of brand recognition, and Larian had used work for hire to survive and build the games of their dreams before. Despite rushed development that led to disappointing reviews, both Divine Divinity and Ego Draconis had actually sold really well. Unfortunately, publishing contracts meant that Larian didn't see a penny of those sales, and they were reliant on the publisher's further interest in their games in order to keep getting money. As well as being a colossal deadweight around their necks, these parasites had no interest in Larian's creative ambition either. When Larian explained their intricate quest design that had both games media and gamers frothing at the mouths, the publishers said it wasn't needed, and just wanted Larian to kick out another action RPG that looked kinda like the other popular action RPGs so they could make bank off it. They had no interest in furthering the art of game design, because they somehow couldn't connect creativity, innovation, and of course polish with sales and profits. Now, I'm going to assume that most people watching this especially those of you who've made it this far, love playing games. And I bet you love playing well-polished, complete games full of interesting ideas and exciting new mechanics. You have only to look at the breakout indie successes like Signalis or 2023's Dredge to see that creativity and originality sells. But publishers can't see that because they're not creative people. They're numbers people. And as we've seen, they ain't even all that good at that either. What Sven did next was bold and quite smart. He approached venture capitalist investors with the development costs and sales of Larian Games and said, Our games sell so well, but the money is always funneled into publisher pockets. Imagine what our small company could become if that money was coming directly back to us. The gambit paid off, and Larian Studios got a massive injection of cash to begin working on their next two projects. The first was Dragon Commander. A game I've seen described as a fever dream of RTS, Civ, and a political simulator. Thank this guy for that quote. Or Dragons with Jetpacks. 
It was born out of some of the more exotic ideas of how the team imagined the Dragon Knight saga ending. Even at conceptualization though, it was quite clear that they weren't really sure what they were actually trying to make, but that they were having a hell of a lot of fun playing with a wide variety of ideas and mechanics. The second game was a small, 3D, isometric RPG called The Eyes of a Child. It was going to be a quirky Xbox Live Arcade game that would take around 10 to 15 hours to finish and cost around $20. Production began in earnest with the majority of Larian working hard on figuring out what the hell a Dragon Commander was and how you go about fitting it onto people's PCs. The smaller group though, well, little did they know at the time, but they started work on the RPG that Sven and all of Larian had dreamed of making. The one they'd end up betting the whole company on. The one that would have all the things, all the polish, and none of the compromise that had plagued the previous two games, and finally show the world what a somewhat niche group of RPG fans had known since 2001. That Larian were here, and they were the undisputed masters of the RPG. It was going to be one hell of a gamble, but the stars were finally aligning in Larian's favour, because just on the horizon, two forces that would change the face of indie game development were emerging, that being Kickstarter and Early Access. I know at least one person at Larian likes the Wheel of Time, so please indulge me a quote from one of my favourite characters from Robert Jordan's masterpiece. It was time to roll the dice. So, I'm not an RTS player. Aside from the story mode in the first Dawn of War, I've never really gotten into them. Something about the way I'm wired just can't handle all the different elements going off at the same time, and the stress of it all, for whatever reason, just makes me shut down. I'm down to play a tactics RPG or a good turn-based strategy sometimes, but RTS, no matter how original or exciting, just isn't for me. As such, I left Dragon Commander for the end of this playthrough, and decided to see how I felt at that time. I've been playing and recording these games from early May through to early September, so when the dust finally settled on my original Sin 2 playthrough, I figured enough was enough. Fortunately, my brother in YouTube arms, the Cult of the Cyberskull, is something of an RTS maestro, and captured a few hours of game for me so we can enjoy looking at the updated graphics engine, and get a first-hand look at some of the improved Dragon gameplay and RTS action, even if I don't have that much to say about it. If you run over to his channel or his Twitter though, linked down in the description, wink wink, and ask him really nicely, he might be willing to do a full take on it for you. I know he certainly recommends it as a gateway drug for anyone looking to get into RTS or Civilization games. The game is set long before even Original Sin, with legendary characters like the Wizard Maxos showing up and we also see where those flying fortresses that Damien uses came from. Larian went all in on Dragon Commander at the outset, but as development on both projects progressed, it started to become very clear that the Eyes of the Child was going to be the more important game. While Dragon Commander was a very exciting and highly experimental project, Larian knows RPGs much better than they know RTS. They are, if you haven't noticed, very passionate about RPGs, and love to experiment with the genre. As the scale of their 3D isometric RPG ballooned, it became clear that this wasn't some cute little Xbox Live Arcade game, and that more, a lot more resources were going to be needed for it to reach its full potential. As such, Dragon Commander was sacrificed on the altar of the game that was becoming Divinity Original Sin. Larian are no stranger to early releases, but this one was at least one of their own making. It was hoped that Dragon Commander could help fund the new RPG, and once the game had shipped, there was no time for a vacation. It was all hands on deck to make this happen. The Eyes of a Child was supposed to be small, tight, and polished. It was meant to show that Larian could learn from the mistakes of being overly ambitious and trying to do too much at once. That didn't work out in the end. The problem is, as with all game design, ideas flow with the process. You start out with one image of your final product, but as you build your engine and your systems, you start to see new opportunities to create fun and interesting mechanics and game moments. Then you test those, look for ways to expand and integrate them, and as you do, even more ideas arise. Then maybe one day your CEO is in the shower thinking about RPGs, that's not what I think about in the shower, but, you know, you do you, bro. 
and comes into work and tells everyone that the game is going to have turn-based combat instead of real-time, and somehow, that's the magic piece of the puzzle that makes everything just fall into place. Of course, even with their venture capital investments and who knows what else in personal loans and mortgages to finance the game's development, things were still difficult, and it took a lot of time and a lot of iteration to bring out the very best of their ideas. And so it was that Larian took to the emerging Kickstarter platform to let the world know about their new Divinity game, in a hope that series fans and RPG lovers of all kinds would roll up to back the game to the price of $400,000. They raised nearly a million. It's not like Sven didn't know that Divinity was popular, or that people loved their games. Between sales and acclaim in magazines, the series had shown that it more than stands out from the pack. Still, that's gotta be a tear-jerking moment right there. To know that so many people love your work and trust the quality of your product that they would part with their money on little more than a promise. The next tool in their arsenal was Early Access. Not only did backers get to be playtesters and help with everything from gameplay feedback to bug reports, but Early Access sales kept the lights on at the studio while the final polish could be applied to the game. And even then, they almost didn't make it. They had banks and debtors banging at their door, demanding their money back, leaving Larian in a position where they'd have to release early and once again give the world an unpolished product. They stuck to their guns. They fought with every ounce they had, and yes, they crunched hard. Not a good thing, and something they worked to solve for Original Sin 2, but there it is. And they finally crossed the finish line with the game they'd always dreamed of making to share with everyone. Well, almost. So, seeing as we've travelled this far together, why don't we take a little trip to a time more than a thousand years before Damien, Lucian, the Black Ring, or even the Death Knights. Let's head to a little town called Sicil, meet a cool cat named Ahu, maybe we can solve a murder, uncover a conspiracy, and while we're at it, prevent all of time and space from being devoured by the Void Dragon. One of the biggest criticisms that Larian got for Original Sin was its story. Something they took to heart and used to rework their entire creative process for their next two games. Until now, the world and systems had taken the highest priority, with the story coming later. Divine Divinity's story was the result of a three-day brainstorming session that took place once much of the world space was already made, and Original Sin was written in a similar fashion, though it's clear from early interviews that there was some iteration in this process. It's about two characters, and they are special because they can wield a power called the Source, which almost nobody else in the world can use, and the catch is that it's actually forbidden to do so. This led to a story that many thought cliched. A MacGuffin hunt, if you will. Find the magical shiny things and save the world with a chosen one, dragon reborn trope thrown in for good measure. As someone who is quite critical of stereotypical orcs bad humans good fantasy, you might think I'd share in this critique. Actually, I'm here to defend Original Sin's story. Okay, yes, it's cliché, and there are better stories to write than the ones we've heard a million times before, but just because we've heard it before, doesn't mean it can't be told well. So, let's dive in. Science fiction writer N.K. Jemisin has won awards for her incredible world building, crafting environments and societies that are at once fantastical and believable. In her masterclass on the subject, she talks about a world's X Factor. It's a unique feature, big or small, that is going to, in some way, impact everything about the world, its people, and their societies. It could be something like the planet being hot and dry, or maybe having very high tectonic activity leading to frequent earthquakes. It could be argued that a fantasy setting, where magic exists and gods intervene in mortal affairs on a regular basis, is enough of an X Factor. But given these elements are so common in fantasy writing and RPGs, it isn't really enough. In Original Sin, we have Source. Source is the lifeblood of the universe, and flows from the true goddess, Astarte. She exists in the first garden, and the pure source that flows from her is the bringer of life. Source is mentioned first in Alaroth in the first game, though it's not like back then Larian knew this is where it was going or anything. Source, and the special people who can use it, 
sorcerers impact everything from the primary motivations of the heroes, who are source hunters by trade, and the villains, who are a source cult themselves. But at least for this game, we can actually go a little further. We can pick out a very powerful factor that, despite being dead for centuries, is still wreaking havoc all over Sycial, and whose garbage we wind up picking up from start to finish in both Original Sin 1 and 2. I am of course talking about the Source King himself, Luthen Kinslayer. Sorry, I meant Bracus Rex. Here now, one who comes to watch the spectacle, to see the sovereign of the Source ascend again. As the game's intro explains, Source was once a great, uh, source of healing power. However, in an undocumented time before Dragon Commander, this power became tainted, and those who used it succumbed to madness and became twisted, monstrous creatures capable of the most inhumane actions. This is because an existential monstrosity named the Void Dragon was released from its prison, and Astarte had to cast it into the Void along with herself to battle with it for all time. As long as she is in the Void, the source remains tainted, but no one could possibly know about that. Of all these mad sorcerers, the greatest was a tyrant known as Bracchus Rex. This thing ruled Rivalon first as a great and wise ruler, before descending into madness. He devised all manner of horrific and everlasting torments to inflict on others, and literally drank the souls of other sorcerers to strengthen his own powers. He created ones that could purge the source of others and leave them as empty husks, and collars that prevented other sorcerers from using their powers. It took an alliance of all races and all powers to bring him down, and at the vanguard of this force were the Source Hunters. This new group of elite warriors were trained to hunt, fight, and kill sorcerers, and with the combined might of all the peoples of Rivalon, they overpowered and broke Bracchus Rex. He was defeated at his seat of power in Fort Joy, and finally executed. Unfortunately, much of what the Source King made and did is still very much at large in the world, as is the forbidden knowledge he extracted from his demented and perverse experiments. Such things are coveted by those with malevolent intentions of their own, and while there are no sorcerers with Bracchus Rex's power anymore, there are still those who can wield Source, and as they do, so does the taint worm into them and corrupt them from within. Luckily for the world though, the Order of the Source Hunters has continued on for centuries after the time of its formation, and while their numbers are fewer in this age, they are still highly trained and capable of bringing down any sorcerer that has succumbed to madness. And it's as two such Source Hunters that we start the game. Arriving on the coast near the fishing village of Sycile, they have been called to look into a murder, and they cannot imagine the rabbit hole they are about to tumble down. We have a slightly more detailed character creation process than before, but no face morphing or worrying about getting the perfect eyebrows for a character, so that's still just fine. Seeing our character close up like this does show some of the limitations of the graphics engine. Once again, Larian chose a very stylized look, and given this was going to be an isometric RPG, even one where you could rotate and zoom the camera, most of the action would be taking place at some considerable distance from the characters so expensive ultra-realistic graphics weren't needed, which is great because they were well out of the game's budget, and are far less charming than this kind of look. So you've probably noticed this time we have two heroes to play with. Well, yes, this game is similar to Beyond Divinity in that respect, and even expands on some of its features, specifically the way the characters interact with each other, which I'll dive into a little more later. While all of Original Sin's promotional art shows a male and female Source Hunter pair, there are no limitations on how you construct them. The classes that you choose from are nothing but combinations of starting stats and skills, and you are more than welcome to make your own completely custom build, even from the start. Once again, Larian are demonstrating their commitment to player agency and freedom, even at the very beginning of the game. For my playthrough, I went with a Shadow Blade that's basically a combination of witchcraft and thief skills and called him Durso. It's a book reference. I suppose a Kalos would have been cooler, but eh. As this wasn't my first playthrough, I decided I wanted some serious explosive power on the team too, and so turned my female source hunter, Sanguine, 
into an Earth Fire Mage, which would complement the Air and Water NPC Mage we'd meet later. And from there, it's time to land on the beach near Cyseal. The ship's captain won't sail into port because of constant orc ship attacks. And begin our adventure. A lot happens even at this early stage in the game though. We encounter a dead body of a man who threw himself off the cliffs because some talking statues promised him he could fly. Sounds very normal. And we even get to see the beginnings of our heroes' interactions with each other. The two Source Hunters weren't just a story mechanic. They were also the means by which the game could have multiplayer. That's right, the one feature that Larian have wanted to have in all of their games and have never been able to crack is finally here. Locally hosted, multiplayer. So you and a friend can team up and enjoy a story-rich world full of adventures together. This is incidentally how I got my start with the game years ago. Unfortunately, my friend at the time had beaten the game several times already and wanted to play on tactician mode with a mod called Epic Encounters. He insisted he'd help me to put together a good build and that everything would be fine and that we'd have a lot more fun in the late game. It was not fine. There was also the issue that he was making in-game decisions based on what would net him the best XP, which may be important for a tactician run where every stat point matters, but that's not how I like to roleplay in games. So yeah, bad start for me, but not one I held against the game. The two characters can talk to each other and even disagree on different actions. This is mainly for the multiplayer, but you're welcome to roleplay characters who disagree with each other in a single player game if you want. Disagreements are settled with a persuasion game that's basically rock, scissors, paper with your stats in persuasion affecting the amount of victories you need in order to win. It's a nice touch. It's a way of combining the stats of the character with elements of random chance. Kind of like showing people the dice rolls on their skill checks. It's also used when persuading NPCs later on too, but I don't think it adds that much to a single player game. I guess it's pretty fun for multiplayer especially if you're playing on a Switch in the same room as each other and you can see the other player's reaction to the results. For my game though, I tended to just skip a lot of it. You can autoplay the game and go straight to the results, which saves time and stops it from getting tedious. As our Source Hunters approach their target, terror strikes and a group emerges from an ancient crypt possessing some kind of powerful artifact and judging by the level of their leader, this isn't a battle I want to get involved in. Fortunately for us, Little Miss Endgame content here decides that two random level 3 source hunters are far beneath her notice, and summons in three low level undead to deal with them instead. In hindsight, she'll regret that. You didn't even see me. You. This brings us to our tutorial dungeon, which I'm thankful to say is optional, but being the massive XP whore that I am, I opted to dive in there for a recap anyway. There isn't a great deal of challenge here, and it's the closest the game will come at any point to holding your hand. It's a good introduction to how objects can be manipulated in the world space. Just like in Divine Divinity, objects can be moved around and where you place them can have some kind of effect. For example, if a poison gas cloud is rising from a vent, you can cover it with an object and clear the area. Objects can also be placed on pressure plates to open doors, and later in the game, there's even a set of pressure plates that requires you to place specific weights onto them too. Things can be broken or interacted with. Even doors. Yep, you can smash or burn open doors if they're locked and it's above your skill level to pick. Though this level of agency was clearly a little too much, as you'll encounter more and more invincible doors as you progress. You'll also dull your weapons trying to smash them and make them less effective in combat, but that's why we have fireballs and arrows. Many things, useful or not, can be added to your inventory, which is… well, it's tidier than Divine Divinities, that's for sure, but I guess at this stage we'd be calling this old school design. Like before, it can get pretty cluttered in here as you stock up on things that you're certain you're going to need later and then never use, but the tabs and auto sort options help to make it readable. As before though, inventory management is your responsibility and not something that just happens in the background that you don't pay attention to. What was especially interesting for me here was this was actually the first game in the series that I played because I initially wanted to follow the story chronologically. 
So I was pleasantly surprised and very impressed to see just how much of this resembles Divine Divinity and how much of it was found there first. It's nice to see that this game was made with long term fans in mind as well as new players. Beyond the tutorial dungeon, our road to Psy Seal is fraught with yet more danger. From drunk city watch guards to invading orc marauders, seemingly led by a human wizard of all things, this is probably the game's first real combat. You're backed up by guards here, but unlike in the tutorial dungeon, you're going to have a head on collision with just how fragile you are at this early stage in the game, and you'll be thankful for those starter potions you were graced with. Victory, however, sees us finally arriving in Psy Seal and our first encounter with Ahu. What's all this ruckus? Sounded worse than a dozen tomcats fighting over the world's last mackerel. Now, you might be inclined to think that Ahu is a wizard who enjoys turning himself into a cat. And you'd be wrong. Yep, it's the other way around. But we've met Ahu before, remember? Back then though, he was just Zandalore's talking cat. Now we discover that he was around over a thousand years before the time of Lucian, and if we stick around, we might even get some idea of how a cat found himself with the ability to transform themselves into a human wizard. Small hint, it's about our settings X Factor. The main takeaway from this initial meeting though is that Ahu is the one who called the Source Hunters after the discovery of the murder of Councilman Jake. Our coolest of cats smelled Source at the scene and decided the best thing to do was bring in the professionals. Though there are some that aren't altogether happy about this decision. Gods above! Some politician snuffs it and everyone's in an uproar! Ridiculous! I told that wizard brat of an Ahu not to bother, but he just had to send for source hunters, didn't he? Bloody magicians! They see a pigeon poop and think sorcery is afoot! It's kinda amazing that I've come this far in a full Divinity retrospective and only mentioned Ultima 7 once, maybe twice? But it's damn hard to talk about Psyseal and not bring up cities in Ultima 7. It's a massive influence on both Larian Sven and Wolfeye Studios' Raphael Colantonio. The town of Grackle in Weird West serves as a smaller counterpoint to Psy Seal in this game. Both these spaces are critical for quest and story information at the start, as well as meeting people you can recruit into your team. But they are also slice of life locations. Psy Seal is designed to give us an idea of how life goes on in this little world, and apparently, Psy Seal is a land of fish and cheese. I mean, you could do much worse. How am I enjoying it? Are you spoiling for a fight, Hunter? Are you? Sisiel stinks of fish, reeks of orcs, and on a good day, the wind disperses the stench of decomposing corpses. I can't remember the last time I had a proper piece of steak, and by now, I wretch at the mere sight of sardines. Our hunters have a lot to take care of here. The opening hours of this game can feel a lot more like Disco Elysium for all the dialogue there is, but not to worry because the voice acting here is once again spot on. It's not too surprising given the era that it was developed for, but it's still worth commenting on when you consider how things were all the way back at the start. We've got arrogant wizards. What? What is this? Who are you to interrupt my musings? By Naga the Protector, they have the manners of boors, these boatmen of Sysiel. Thrifty salespeople. Please partake of the plumpest produce ever produced. Evil undead. What insult is this? A heartbeat do I detect? And this guy. And that is exactly why I am here. Why fate has put me right by the door to the King Crab, so that I could meet you and tell you about the marvel that is the fabulous five. The invitation to join is yours. Grab it. With all this walking and talking though, you may find yourself eager to get out into the world and go pick a few fights, but trust me, it's in your best interest to grind out every last bit of XP you can from the town before you head out there because Damn if it isn't dangerous out there. Just as important though, you may have noticed that our source hunters don't look too well equipped, 
to do battle with enemies that, once upon a time, brought all of Rivalon to its knees. And what's with only having two starting skills? It seems we need to tool up and skill up, and to do that, we're going to need some serious financial backing. As such, it's now your sworn duty, in the name of the greater good no less, to steal literally anything and everything that isn't nailed down and flog it to some unknowing merchant in the market square in exchange for upgraded gear and a couple of skill books to make you more formidable. You'll thank me later when you get outside, and to be honest, this is hella fun. Cyseal, we soon discover, seems to be under siege with all the problems it has. Outside the city walls, a horde of undead patrols, and while Ahu's weapons are good for keeping them away from the city walls, any attempt to push the damn things further back, or locate the necromancers raising them, have ended with dead guards and more zombies to deal with. Also, one of Ahu's contraptions, a large automaton designed to go out and hunt the undead, gained sentience and ran off. Apparently that's an occupational hazard. Then there's the sea assaults by the orcs, blockaded trade routes, and just about everyone in town having some small issue of their own on top of the murder you're supposed to be looking into. Seems like these two have a lot on their plates. Fortunately, they don't have to rely only on their wits and <coughs> hard-earned gold to take care of things. They don't have to fight alone. So it's time to do some recruiting. If you've played D&D, you probably know how it is. One day, you're a lone adventurer exploring the world on your own personal revenge vendetta. The next, you talk to three heavily armed travelers who haven't bathed for about three weeks or cleaned the blood off their weapons or armor. And after about two minutes of chatting, you decide to throw in with them for life. A lot of older CRPGs like Baldur's Gate make companions a little too easy to recruit into life-threatening situations, but this may be one of those areas where the pacing of the game needs to take precedence over realism. While lengthy recruitment quests are very interesting, and form the backbone of RPGs like Mass Effect 2 and the Persona series, these games show that those missions can be an entire game's worth of content unto themselves. As such, it's better to have characters who happen to be going the same way as the protagonist, who are prepared to throw in on a quid pro quo basis. Oh, you're going to the evil forest? Well, there's a wizard who'll probably help you to deal with that, providing you take care of a little demon problem of his while you're there. Strike up a quick verbal contract, and you've got yourself a powerful ally without derailing the entire plot to drag him on board. So, scattered around Cyseal in locations you'll visit very early, are several highly skilled adventurers who are more than capable of filling the holes in any party with their own unique abilities. While Beyond Divinity with its two-man team and summoning dolls was the first game to have something resembling party dynamics, Original Sin is the first game where it's a huge deal, where each character has their own unique personality, backstory, motivations and quests, and can contribute something special to the group that none of the others can. They even take time to weigh in on events and actions that the Source Hunters have dealt with or performed recently too. My first encounter was with Baridotor, a feral woman who was caged by guards for violent behavior. She explains that she rarely interacts with other humans and does not entirely understand human law or social etiquette. That being said, she's clearly a capable fighter who's looking for a lost friend and mentor, and definitely one of the more charming of the companions you can join up with. Speaking of likable and charming, Wolgraf is a mute rogue with an epic stash mutton chop combo who speaks by quickly writing letters to you. I liked this guy right away and really wanted to learn more about his story. Unfortunately, neither of these two were a good match for my starting setup. Certainly, Original Sin uses skill-based progression like all the games in the series, so I could have transformed them into suitably useful companions, but the early game is where you are most fragile and have the least options for controlling the battlefield. So I had to leave my charming pair in exchange for the arrogant wizard and the overly zealous Source Hunter tank, neither of which I liked when I met them. But boy howdy, am I glad I stuck it out with them, because these two have great character development. The companion stories are not well integrated into the main story, or rather the game doesn't do anything new with them. The companions join up giving you the bare bones of their situation, and after various points in the game when some invisible trigger is hit, they can be convinced to dole out a little more of their story to you that will lead to you fighting some dangerous boss enemy with them not long before the final fight. 
Defeating said fiend will transform them into family, and maybe grant some kind of late game boon between the two of you. It's quite simple, especially when these boss enemies are things you were probably going to deal with anyway. But again, basic or something we've seen before isn't the same as being bad. It depends on the strength of the story and the characters. I really did not like Jayhan when I first met him. He comes off as very full of himself, and I wasn't entirely sure I'd be able to keep the promise not to deal with demons he demanded I make before joining. After all, who can say what a demon can offer you? For quite some time he continues to be somewhat annoying. He has a very black and white view of the world and can be completely ruthless and almost uncaring at times. I found myself telling him and Medora to shut up more than once. I was actually worried they'd finally decide we were incompatible and leave for greener pastures, but I don't think that's possible in this game anyway. Still, Jayhan, when he finally opened up, presented a tragic story of a man lost in desperation. A thousand years ago, he was a young king who became afflicted with a wasting disease that could not be cured. He sought aid in the healing arts, and when that failed, turned to necromancy, and finally, demonology. In a final desperate attempt to save himself, he conjured the demon Balbareth and bargained his soul for a thousand years of life. And to sweeten the deal, the demon told Jehan that his wife was one of his kind, and that she had been devouring his essence and killing him. The trap had been baited, and the jaws were now clamped shut. Jehan has since spent a thousand years searching to free himself from his impending eternal torment and he is fast running out of hope. Given all we'd been through together by the time he opened up about this, I found myself seeing him in an entirely new light. What right had I to judge a man who has lived a thousand years, knowing he is damned and seeing every avenue of hope dry up around him? But after all the battles we'd fought together, I knew damn well I'd do everything I could to give him a chance. Medora is likewise equally insufferable especially because she assumes that because my characters are Source Hunters too, we share her fanaticism. Though it pleased me to repeatedly disappoint her on this. But the times are changing, aren't they, comrade? Old Medora's gotta expand her worldview to include every manner of ridiculous talk and ice cream sundae and such like. While we know she is seeking aid for the town of Hunter's Edge that was raided by orcs, we again see her struggle in a whole new light when we get there and see the absolute slaughter that took place. Hunter's Edge was invaded by an alliance of orcs and wild mountain men, and clearing it out is part of our critical path. There is evidence of all kinds of inhuman cruelty everywhere we look. Here we get some perspective on who this woman is, and what she's been dealing with all this time. In her eyes, she is a failure. She fled from this battle with the vision of a giant beast clad in black iron ripping members of the town apart one at a time. She considers herself a coward, and has been carrying the guilt around like a dead weight, even when it's very clear that there was nothing she could have done alone and coming to get back up was exactly what she needed to do. Again, I had no hesitation in helping her out at this point. She may have been annoying, but we'd been through too much together. And when we confront her nemesis, we discover something quite interesting about it. Oh, no toys, no toys. <sighs> Where's mom? And here we also get to see just how much this woman has changed for all the beratings we gave her. Comrades, my mind's racing and my heart's gone like a snare drum to be here face to face with my greatest enemy and to find that he's. He's not at all like the villain I'd worked up in my mind. It's... it's unimaginable. So these are great character arcs and very satisfying. These two went from people I didn't like, to people I'd stand at the end of time and fight the enemy of enemies with. And I guess we should talk about that. The open-ended quest structure from the Dragon Knight Saga was both kept and refined into what Larian calls their N plus one system. While Original Sin isn't an immersive sim in the traditional sense, it does have an incredibly high level of player agency and freedom, and has a focus on emergent narrative through this freedom. This isn't the same kind of emergent story that you find in a Bethesda Fallout game, where you can ignore the urgent call to find and rescue your son, 
in favour of rushing across the map and getting involved in some kind of completely random side story. The world simply isn't big enough to accommodate that. But it's more like Disco Elysium, where it feels like there's an infinite number of ways of dealing with the smaller number of problems you are presented with. There are no essential NPCs in the game. Pretty much anyone can be robbed or killed. Anything can be stolen from a character's house, and all but a few plot essential locks can be picked or bypassed in some other way. This means that quests, at least critical path quests, have to be bulletproof. To be honest, it's unlikely that a low level character is going to be able to murder the mayor of Sysiel and get away with their life, but that doesn't mean that Larian didn't account for the slight possibility that you might. I can only imagine how difficult the game would be with one of the biggest major hubs cut off from the player though, but you're welcome to have a go if you think you're hard enough. So there are many routes through the Critical Path events, and indeed, all of the side quests are open to being dealt with in a variety of ways too. After arriving in Sysiel, getting the lay of the land and talking to some of the important figures in the area, you are basically left to your own devices to chase up various leads that are connected to the murder. Of course, you can run off to the tavern and investigate the scene of the crime, no doubt signing up with the Fabulous Five along the way. After all, they are rather fabulous. Or maybe have a word with Jake's wife, Esmeralda. Wait a minute. Here lies Esmeralda, wife to Jake. May she rest in peace. Hmm. Somebody's added a line on this gravestone. Good riddance. Signed, Jake. Or talk to any number of people who were involved in the cleanup after, such as the Doctor or Undertaker. Or even, if you can, Jake's dog. Whatever you do though, you are on a collision course with your first star stone, and a trip all the way to the end of time. I guess this is technically our first meeting with Zigzax. What with all this happening a thousand or so years before the time of Lucian, but we finally get to meet the little guy on his home plane and get some sense of who he is and why he keeps popping up in our stories. Zigzax is the chronicler of time. He exists at the very end of time and writes down all that he sees and all that there is to know, though he has no idea what power set him to this task. It certainly wasn't one of the seven jerks who claims to be a god in this setting, that's for sure. This whole scene with the big telescope gives me mad, never-ending story vibes. And goddamn, if seeing Zigzags get absurdly excited about everything isn't charming. Unfortunately though, the imp is borderline terrified about something, and a glance through his telescope reveals the source of his woes, as we for the first time look upon the void and the great dragon at its heart. While Divine Divinity had a fairly simple good versus evil setup, Original Sin escalates that to the much more fundamental clash of something versus nothing. Were the Lord of Chaos to conquer Rivalon, it would become his wasteland, and the souls of the innocent his eternal playthings. Or at least they'd remain that way until things eventually pivoted back towards the light. Were the Void Dragon to win, Rivalon would not only cease to be, but it never would have been. From a European religious and metaphysical view, that sounds terrible. Since Judeo-Christian ideology preaches the concept of a soul that contains your ego, and is something that continues on after your body for all time. In ideologies like Taoism and Zen, Oblivion is simply the release from the ego, which is the source of all suffering, and the Void is simply the space in which everything exists, and is as such completely harmonious and continuous with reality. You might say, But Arkham, surely existing is better than not existing? And to that I say, Douglas Adams disagrees. But this is fantasy, and souls, gods, and the afterlife are facts, and the Void is a great and terrible dragon that will one day devour everything, and since the game is worth playing, both the game of life and divinity, we're going to fight like hell to stop that from happening, which means we need to unravel the story of how and why this thing is getting closer, and it's one hell of a story at that. But to uncover it, we're going to need to talk to the Weaver. The Weaver is another of Rivalon's true fundamental forces, along with Astarte, the Source Goddess. Where Zigzag sits at the end of time and chronicles the universe and all he sees, so she sits at the dawn and weaves the pattern of it all. Unfortunately, the pattern is full of holes where threads have gone missing. In particular, the threads concerning our two Source Hunters, of whom she has absolutely no knowledge. 
The Homestead Plane operates very similar to the Battle Tower in the Dragon Knight Saga. This is your base of operations and is accessible via any of the waypoint portals that we can touch around the map, or by using the teleport pyramids that we receive later. Yep, they're back. It is soon explained that the reason you were transported here was because you came into contact with a Star Stone. These odd magic stones are usually inert, but seem to have a hell of a reaction to our heroes, and encountering them can not only heal the tapestry, but also unlock more areas in the homestead. Initially, we gain access to a feasting hall, where we can store any companions we don't need at the moment, or even just go ahead and hire henchmen with custom skill sets to play with instead. As we unlock more areas, such as a Hall of Secrets, a Great Smithy, and elemental domains of air, water, fire, and earth, we encounter more and more characters who seem to have been waiting around here for a long time, and all seem to recognize our heroes, or rather, the souls of our heroes, and they all have very high expectations of them. The elemental halls are where you can buy all the best skill books and a lot of high quality weapons and armor, while one portal takes you to a demonic realm where an archdemon is more than willing to barter skill points for attribute points and back again, and even let you respect your whole character. The homestead will get a little crowded eventually, as your adventures bring you into contact with several important characters and an entire imp fan club, who are… mostly quite charming. So we get put on a fetch quest more or less. Go and continue your investigation and find the magic stones while you're at it, because somehow, it all just so happens to be connected. Returning to Psyseal, we discover that our best cat Ahu is actually a friend of Zigzag's, and very much in for the main plot. So, now we have quite a few other leads to follow. The Doctor, for example, whose name is Thelrion. Wait, what? Oh. My. God. His apprentice Evelyn has a powerful magic healing stone no less, and she has two dying patients, and needs help deciding which one will live. I've been here before. But with all the gold and XP we can mine in Psyseal found, and all our leads dried up, it's time to head out beyond the gates into the wild, and it's time to fight for our lives. While it wasn't exactly mandated that Divine Divinity have ARPG-style combat to match that of Diablo, it certainly got publishers more excited than turn-based combat, and as such, real-time action with an active pause button just kinda became the way things worked in Divinity games after that. As mentioned earlier though, it was after a particularly inspiring shower that Sven rolled into work with a big decision to make Original Sin turn-based, and so much of the game just fell into place after that. Combat is a huge part of most RPGs, and it definitely takes up a lot of time in Original Sin. This is in part because the combat is quite slow-paced and deeply tactical, bordering on something like a light tactics RPG, where a single, well-executed turn can change the tide of battle and take you from being desperately overwhelmed and fighting for your life, to a near-unstoppable force that will crush everything in its tracks. Make no mistake though, that door swings both ways. So, to begin with, there are no trash mobs or throwaway combats in Original Sin. More or less, anyway. There is a set number of enemies and a hard cap on the total amount of XP you can accrue while playing the game. The idea here being that Larian wants you to both think about and really feel the effect of every single level you gain, and every point you put into your stats and abilities. While I was playing only on Classic mode, I can assure you that it matters here, so it can only matter more in Tactician. It's not entirely impossible to grind up and overlevel in order to take out a powerful foe, I can think of one walking tree in particular who I had to do just this to, but don't imagine you'll be coming back to areas that gave you a hard time earlier in the game to battle enemies now 5-10 to 10 levels beneath you and get a very big revenge kick. The Psyseal Gate Guards are more than happy to give you an appraisal and tell you if they think you can handle what's beyond their gates. They don't block you though, and I'd love to hear in the comments from any min-max players or master strategists who can handle ignoring these warnings. No sooner are you beyond the gates though, and you'll stumble into that greatest of British problems... 
the fucking rain. This is the first mechanic we'll talk about. Environments, statuses and surfaces all go together, but let's take them one at a time so that everyone can keep up. Many major combat arenas have some kind of environmental effect that may translate into some kind of debuff. This isn't always the case though, and more often than not will affect the enemies as well as the players. Rain, for example, makes you, and everything else for that matter, wet. Wet characters and enemies are not only more susceptible to the shock status, but it also means that lightning attacks can chain into those nearby as well. The good news though, is that you're unlikely to get affected by a burning status, and even if you are, it'll end quickly. A later area, Hyberheim, the land of the King of Winter, is incredibly cold, which makes characters susceptible to being chilled or frozen. And because so many of the surfaces are also frozen, it also means it's easy to slip and fall over, and in this case, the cold doesn't bother the natives who actually draw power from it. Though their weakness is quite obvious, all things considered. This is generally pretty cool, and keeps you on your toes and thinking. Though, I have to call bullshit on the Windy Mountains from later in the game. The wind permanently slows characters, decreasing their general movement speed and their action point pool when in combat. There's nothing fun about this. I'm sorry to say it's just frustrating, especially when paired with the spider enemies you face here, who have this tunneling teleport attack that allows them to just pop up next to you, hit you, and then vanish again before you can do anything back to them. I've talked in previous videos about the fine line between challenging your players with an interesting puzzle and just pissing them off and making them dread returning to a certain area on a replay. This is a huge normal mode no-no in my opinion, and something that should never get past playtesting. Players who opt to play on hard modes make their own graves to lie in, so you can hit them with whatever, but this was one of the few areas I didn't fully clear out because it wasn't fun, and that's just not how I like to spend the limited free time I get each day. Fortunately, we are not entirely at the mercy of the elements, as Original Sin has quite an intuitive and robust crafting system that can help take the sting out of some environments. You don't really have to engage with this system at all if you don't want to, but it's kind of fun to make dough from flour and water, turn that into bread, and then turn the bread into pizza. Yes, you really can do that. A simple and well-known trick is to combine boots with 9-inch nails to basically create improvised crampons that prevent you from slipping and falling over on the ice. There are also enchantments on some items that prevent slowed or chilled statuses, and it may be worth entering certain areas with weaker gear that blocks these effects than something more suited to your level. It's something you'll appreciate more on a replay when you know this is coming, but a lot of games are like that I suppose. So back to the fighting anyway. Combat feels much like a game of Dungeons & Dragons in many ways. At the beginning of a battle, everyone leaps into their coolest battle pose and an initiative order is decided under the table based on your perception score and any enchanted items you have that increase your derived initiative score. At the top of the screen you can see the whole turn sequence, and at the bottom you have your action points and your skills hotbar. As mentioned before, skills are learnt from skill books, and when learned they go straight into your hotbar. The two limitations here are your skill level and, of course, the availability of books. What this means is, even if there were a Meteor Strike book available in Psyseal and you could somehow afford it or steal it, you aren't going to have the five levels of pyromancy required to learn it. For this reason, it's worth splitting the skill points you get when you level up between multiple skills to give yourself more options in battle, especially early game. You don't want to spread yourself too thin, of course. Two skill sets is probably the best, and you want to look for synergistic combinations like Warfare and Earth Magic. This gives you a lot of options for slowing and knocking over enemies, and extra armor from the Fortify skill. At its most basic, you move around the battlefield, spending action points as you do so, then dump a lot of points into one of your big actions or attacks. It's neat and easy to understand. Keep your physical characters in front of your magic characters, use area of effect magic on groups of weaker enemies, and powerful single target damage moves on leaders. But if you think that's all there is to it, you are in for one hell of a shock. Even from the early stages outside Psyseal, we find ourselves outnumbered or fighting enemies who have a defensive position 
or who are covering us from an elevated position. You'll run into early game bosses quickly, and have nasty surprises sprung on you too. I won't exactly say that this is a learn by dying game, though there are times it feels like that, but it's a game that wants you to think about every step you take, and where and how you engage an enemy, up to and including exploiting the fuck out of the systems and cheesing the fight. Status debuffs and crowd control are probably the most important thing in Original Sin. Since you are almost always outnumbered or outgunned, you need to control the battlefield. This can be something as simple as choosing where to start the fight. Take this early battle in Seal, for example. Approaching the house from this very open position is going to create a lot of problems for you. But coming around to this smaller broken wall here is a good way to split up and funnel the enemy pack and let you pick off the more dangerous foes first. Then there's your abilities. Remember, outside Seal is constantly raining, and Jehan is an Aerotherge with lightning spells. Of course, this does come with the danger of friendly fire as well, so position is very important here. Other powers, such as Earthquake, can knock down entire groups and waste their turns getting up, and then there are Surfaces. Surfaces are one of the standout features of Divinity's combat. They can also take the form of clouds, but usually they are an area on the ground covered in a substance that negatively affects a player or creature. I've already mentioned ice and how you can slip on it, but other common ones are oil, that slows your movement and can be lit on fire. Fire inflicts continuous damage to anyone walking through it, but also creates smoke that obscures vision and prevents characters from being targeted. This is a very effective way to cut off ranged enemy attackers and make them come closer where you can get your hands on them. I could go on, but the takeaway here is, look around the battlefield. Chances are there are barrels containing some substance or another. There's a lot of poison barrels in the early areas that you might think are useless given poison damages you but heals undead. That is until you realise that the stuff is highly volatile and explosive. There's even a player made class called the Barrelmancer. This is a high strength, high carry capacity character that just lugs a bunch of barrels around and sneaks around the battlefield before the fight starts, placing them where they can do the most damage. So hopefully you're starting to see how deep all this is, and how one well-made move or a little forward planning can transform a fight from a tremendous slog into an absolute breeze. The lesson to exploit the environment and case a location before getting into a fight is further reinforced in the Black Cove region. Still early game, this is where you have your showdown with the undead pirate Pontius Pirate. With a name like that, was he ever going to be anything else? A battle fought among other things at the request of the very charming immortal undead, Headless Nick. Source is pretty messed up. Pontius can haste, enrage himself and do massive damage to your party, also striking fear into them and causing them to flee for a couple of turns so you can't fight back or heal. On top of that, he also spawns with several other pirates who may prove a formidable challenge even without him. Your salvation in this case though, is on the pirate's very own ship, where his trusty death cannon just happens to be pointing out over the battlefield. Have your rogue use the most hilarious sneaking system in gaming to approach the thing and, well, see for yourself. Sorry about that, Medora. You're okay, right? Medora? Medora. This is just highlighting how there is a unique and almost puzzle-like element to each battle. No two encounters are really the same. The Battle of Borealis, the King of Winter, is another great example. He has a wand containing the power of his three brothers, and is more or less immune to elemental damage of any kind. That is, until these statues are destroyed. Now you could use your battle turns to try and destroy the statues while other members hold the big guy back but why not keep a couple of sneaky characters out of the fight, and have them move around the area while the king is frozen, waiting for your other characters to have their turn? You could argue that this is an exploit or a cheese, but I'm not so sure. I think it's more like Dark Souls how, any way you can do it, is the right way. The game does a good job of keeping things fresh too. 
While Hyberheim could be considered just a more challenging version of Psyseal, the Tenebrium Mines have a required stealth component to them that brings your rogue into the spotlight as they stealth their way around these invincible Death Knights. Being seen is more or less a guaranteed game over here, as these things are as strong as you'd expect Death Knights to be, and did I mention invincible? Unkillable? So you have to stealth your way through them, which is fun and would be much more fun if the devs hadn't decided that your teleport pyramids just don't work here. Yep. Rather than let the rest of the team who will have little to nothing in stealth warp over to where the rogue is, you basically have to run through patrols and hope you get the timing right to not be seen. There is one waypoint that cushions this blow a little, but there were several quick loads and do-overs on this one. The boss fight here in the collapsing source temple is also changed up, from being a regular slug match to a daring escape as the mine erupts around you and death knights move in to take you out. You have to destroy and move obstacles and rush for portals and this makes a nice change of pace all over. Meanwhile, at Hunter's Edge, you can work on getting many of the Orcs and Marauders there very drunk, while slowly sowing discord among their numbers and inciting a massive civil war between them. You are welcome to get involved in this or just stand back and let it all play out too. My only big grievance is with the late game enemies. It really feels like once all the powers are available, Larian had a huge problem trying to balance the game and basically just defaulted to giving all the late area enemies absurdly high initiative scores so they could get a whole free turn on you, often outright killing a member before you can do anything to defend yourself. Prior to this, my rogue was often the only character who got to move before enemies, but that's kind of expected as speed and perception are his main thing but when even he is getting bumped down to the end of every initiative, I started to call bullshit on what I was seeing. This led to tactics like sneaking into battles and starting them by dropping a devastating spell like Meteor on the enemies and hoping it was enough to thin their numbers by a couple of people. Battles and completing quests leads to leveling up. As with all the games, you are going to be increasing your base stats and skills. I may have skipped a tutorial on leveling skills at the start, because I had no idea I needed 2 points to buy level 2, 3 for 3, 4 for 4, all the way up to a maximum of 5. So you don't need to, and indeed you shouldn't, spend everything in a single level up. As your skills expand, so do your options for tactics. I used a lot of summons in my party build. Durzo for quite a while went from being a sneaky stabby rogue to an undead summoning necromancer who could also charm enemies including bosses, into fighting for them. And because enemy AI prioritizes charmed enemies first, this was a great opening move in battle that led to bosses being dogpiled by their own henchmen and seriously weakening them. Eventually, I settled into a medium of juggling skills based on the situation. I also absolutely love teleporting enemies either into environmental hazards or into the midst of my party to get dogpiled by them. I'm just not such a fan of someone pulling that same stunt on me. I refer to the map of Divine Divinity as a little world playing at being big, and I feel that Original Sin is exactly the same. The world is small, tight, and dense. It's not an open world that you go riding across for hours on end while waiting for something to happen. It harkens back to the design philosophy of Divine Divinity where something interesting would present itself every couple of screens. While many quests are listed as side quests, they are usually quite elegantly weaved into the critical path and honestly, you aren't going to keep up with the difficulty curve if you aren't chasing these things down. So we will be running around Sysiel and its surrounding areas, searching for stolen staffs, finding sailors to work for a ship's captain, dealing with that contraption Ahu made, be sure to talk to him about the remote control, and even finding those statues that convinced this guy to throw himself off a cliff. Honestly though, Believing anything these things have to say and then taking your life in your hands is just Darwinism in action. Look at these things. How could they not be evil? Destroying the demons entombed within these things and finally revealing the cave they guard brings with it the prospect of great treasures. Unfortunately, we just find Balagar and his... You know, the man has been locked in here for thousands of years, so... I guess if we could conjure anything we wanted, we would have done the same. 
This is a fun side plot and even leads to the Mad Bastard showing up for more shenanigans late game. So rather than an open world, what we have is more like a series of adventuring hubs. Knights of the Old Republic may be a good comparison here. Every planet you land on has a place to trade, pick up quests and then a wilderness or dungeon area to get into trouble. And I greatly prefer this tighter way of creating world spaces to open worlds in general. I'm a quality over quantity guy. Not that this game isn't in the region of 60 to 100 hours to play, to say nothing of the replay potential. The first chapter really could have been an entire game unto itself, as we soon discover that the Source Cult is far bigger than we imagined and seems to infect every element of Psyseal. Discovering Jake's murderer and even chatting with his reanimated corpse reveals that they work for a powerful sorceress known only as the Conduit, and she is particularly interested in learning to break a Soul Forge. The only person who has ever succeeded at that was the Source King himself, Bracchus Rex. And yes, these people, this moron in particular, thought it would be a great idea to resurrect him and just ask him how he did it. The chapter ends in a climactic battle with the Reborn Source King and thank the Divines he's nowhere near his full power, because you'll be level 9 at best. Either way, the start of the fight goes... We may need to rethink our positioning here. Beyond the opening chapter, we explore the Lakula forests and discover the Cult of the Immaculates. Head to Hyberheim to face off against the Lord of Winter and travel to all manner of interesting and cool locations and I have to take a moment to just enjoy the world design here. While Divinity Original Sin 2 has the updated graphics engine, I have to say I much prefer the fantastical and almost fairy tale world design here versus there. The somewhat darker tone of that game lends to a more grounded in reality fantasy look, but everything from the Troll King's lair to the collapsed temple deep in the Tenebrium Mines is just bigger and larger than life here, and it's much more to my tastes overall. I love all these big, bold colours and just how breathtaking so much of it is. The creature design is by far more exciting here too. While the Void Woken in 2 are very imaginative, again I just love these exaggerated, almost caricatured monster designs. The demons especially stand out, with their big stocky bodies and magma-like skin, and I have to give props to Balboreth's voice actor for crafting a creature that is both a sleazy car salesman and a terrifying Lord of the Damned all at once. I really enjoyed taking him down. It's also great to get an actual look at Goblin Society and see how enwrapped and indeed controlled they are by their magical totems. Look at these little guys dancing for their god's amusement. And we have to take a minute to appreciate the Bridge Trolls. The Troll King's Lair is piled high with gold, but where, you ask, does it come from? Why, the troll tolls that his people collect at all the various bridges we come across as we walk around. The personalities of these formidable creatures range from sad and lonely... Troll toll, if you please. It may be pointless, life may be pointless, but the toll needs to be paid. To brutish thugs... Troll toll! Pay the toll, human! Or I'll squeeze you like a, a, a funny yellow fruit. And get a load of this father teaching his son the trade so he can one day follow in his footsteps. Look, one of the alien aspect approaches. Go on, my boy. State the ancient demand. Ah, uh, um, a toll troll. Adorable. Of course I'll pay. Here, kid, have 10 gold for yourself. Go buy some nice meat. A later game location, the Phantom Forest is protected by a strange green fog that kills people. You could say it's a kind of... death... fog. I wonder if that'll come back later. This is the domain of Cassandra Rex, Bracchus's sister. I did say we'd be picking up his garbage the entire time we were playing this. Cassandra was soulforged to Bracchus, and as the Source King descended into madness, he locked her up for fear of someone would try to kill her to get to him. She existed in solitude with only her beloved pet cat, Ahu, for company. Being a powerful sorcerer herself, she granted Ahu self-awareness and the ability to speak, and they were best friends for a long time. In her loneliness though, 
she went a step further and transformed her cat into a man in hope he would become her lover. Bracchus was not happy. In a final act to circumvent the Soulforge, he took Cassandra down to his dungeons and when they re-emerged, she was an undead lich. Quite the tragic story. So much so that our best cat even tries to reason with her and winds up trapped by her. We are welcome to barter with Cassandra for aid in our quest, but now fully lost to the darkness, she plans to turn Ahu into her subservient lover and make him remain a man forever. Our boy isn't happy about that. And while frankly, that's my cat. You don't fuck with my cat. So you can see that the world is just overflowing with great stories and great writing. So where did this flat come from? Well, I can point my finger at one person in particular. Ikana. Zandalor. How long it's been. It does my heart good to stand before you both one last time. Leandra is the leader of the Immaculates. They are the new cult here, and while on the surface they are just a religion offering hope, help, and healing, they are in fact a murdering source cult, hell-bent on summoning the Void Dragon and bringing about the end of everything. But why the hell would anyone do that? Well... Because Zandalor fell for her twin sister rather than her. Yes, this guy was apparently quite the stud once upon a time. In her grief, a creature known as the Trife, that we discover is the literal serpent from the Garden of Eden, who convinced Astarte the Source Goddess to open the God Box and free the dragon in the first place, whispered to her of the bliss of oblivion found in the void. But rather than find somewhere to just throw herself into it, she decided to bring the void dragon here, so it becomes everyone else's problem as well. You can argue that as a sorcerer, she's clearly losing her mind, but as villain motivations go, this is major weak source. Leandra is hateful in that she does some really horrible things. She massacres imps, raises undead to force them to work as slaves in the Tenebrium mines, and is generally full of herself and spiteful. But she's just a silly, immature girl who needs a good slap across the face and a lay from literally any other guy. I mean, come on. This guy. Really? Have you met Ifan? Seriously, just stick around until he's born and tell me that that voice doesn't literally cause panties to spontaneously drop. You're right. I can trust you. Every step of the way, you've been there for me. For the heroes, well, you've probably guessed that they are reborn legendary warriors who fought the Void Dragon at the dawn of time and once the Weaver's restored, so they can be restored to their full power for the final fight. We are almost at the end of our exploration of Original Sin, and what better way to end than at the end? In fantasy, dragons can be many things, from savage instinctual beasts to the ultimate enemy that must be defeated to save the princess. The concept stretches back through the mythology of all manner of countries, and great flying beasts or serpents that breathe fire are as common as corpses that live by drinking the life force of others. Dragons are a big part of Divinity 2. After all, there were two whole games built around being one. The Void Dragon is one hell of an enemy. I suspect it's not really a dragon, but that's just how mortal minds envision such a formidable foe. The final battle is a real endurance test. Not only is it preceded by several other boss fights, with only one shot to restock your characters after, but it really is going to take all your skill to bring this down. The fight does have a gimmick, I'm sorry to say, and that's Astarte. The Source Goddess appears during the fight and can help with heals and buffs, but it's an instant game over if she dies, and given the amount of damage the Void Dragon can do in a single turn, it only takes one badly played round for him to line her up in his sights and unleash Hal. So, you are tasked with managing minions, damaging the beast, and keeping her safe. A lot of people have complained about this fight, and I see where they're coming from, though a couple of smoke grenades took care of the problem for me, and since I was free to unload all my scrolls onto this thing, I always had a summon to draw its attention. Even so, it takes a long time, but damn does it feel good when it's over. 
With the Void Dragon defeated, Astarte can take her place back in the First Garden, and the Source is purified once more. Our heroes are released from their eternal duty to become mortal again, and live and die as all things must. We have come a long way with our heroes. Jahan, now free of Balbarath, finds himself gifted with true immortality, and will go on to hunt the vile spawn of Tartarus and Nemesis alike forever. He mallows out a lot. Madora returns to the Source Hunter Academy to train the new recruits, a little wiser and humbled by her experience. Of course, no one has any idea of what happened at the homestead or in the First Garden. The world went on completely oblivious to how close it came to utter destruction, but maybe that's for the better. It wouldn't do to panic people like that. Our heroes finally decide to leave the Source Hunters, and venture out to have great adventures of their own. And Zigzax spends his time entertaining the less intellectual imps with stories of their exploits. Apparently, their romance didn't work out. Well, if you really want to know, if you've ever tried to romance a brick wall, you'll know just how Saviour the First felt while wooing Saviour the Second. And as for Zandalor, well, I think we all know what he has coming for him down the line. Anyone got a deck of cards? Divinity Original Sin shipped 160,000 units in its first month. It received the highest review scores of any Larian game, and was described in Eurogamer as hands down the best classic style RPG in years. And an article published by GameIndustry.biz in September 2014 listed sales around half a million units, while at the GDC in 2019, Sven announced sales figures of around 2.2 million units. It released on PC and all the consoles, and is even available for phones and tablets now. Of course there were investors and loans to repay, but there was plenty left over for Larian to move onwards and upwards with. The bottom line? They had finally won. The studio had enough money to continue and grow, and they were now in a position to continue making the games that they wanted to make. Games that were born out of passion and innovation, where originality and creative thinking would be the selling points, and not chasing trends to make people who don't even play games feel safe about it. But most of all, they could all finally take a hard-earned vacation. It wasn't exactly a hard decision to move forward with Original Sin 2 after the success of the first game. Not only was the brand recognition and excitement around the title really strong, but Original Sin still wasn't quite the game that it could have been. However, now with a lot more money and a much clearer idea of what this game was, and what it could become, Larian were in a position to make the best version of this, and give the world something truly special. In their 2019 GDC talk on the making of Original Sin 2, Sven talks about how Larian expanded into several small studios located around the world. This would, among other things, reduce or flat out remove crunch as anything being worked on at closing time in one part of the world, could be picked up by someone at opening time in another. Ever the perfectionists, they took all the feedback from the release of Original Sin, and began working on the Enhanced Edition, while the Quebec and Dublin offices quietly began work on the tech demo that would showcase Original Sin 2. Like before, Larian wanted to use Kickstarter to help finance the game, this time raising just over two million dollars. This wasn't going to be like Beyond Divinity though. This wasn't just the next chapter of Original Sin, where you got some nicer graphics and a new story, but basically the same gameplay. There were a lot of things that Larian wanted to fix and improve for this game, and in the process, they might just revolutionize the entire RPG genre. We've come a long way from a tech demo of a game that never got finished back in the late 90s, but stay with me for just a little longer, because baby, oh baby, this is the one. Lawson shook his head in amazement. You truly are disgusting. I would be the last to disagree, but you fail to see that you are worse. No man capable of greater evil than one who thinks himself in the right, 
No purpose more evil than the higher purpose. I freely admit I am a villain. That's why you hired me. But I am no hypocrite. Nikomo Koska, Red Country, Joe Abercrombie. And they all lived happily ever after is a lie. It might be a nice way to end a story of noble knights and beautiful princesses, but it trivializes the reality of a couple building a life together, of what it could be like to rule a kingdom, of playing the political game, dealing with lords and ladies whose every sentence has as many meanings as the Hydra has heads, and who fight their wars with poison and invisible blades that strike while you sleep. Whatever perfect vision of the future might exist in the minds of naive heroes, who fought objective evils with sword and mace, will eventually be smashed against the hard reality of small, petty creatures, desperate to steal a step ahead from those next to them in the same race. And so our hero must be content with serving only the greater good, of letting others suffer and die now, even compromising their own principles in the hope or belief that many, many more will benefit from actions that harmed far less. With each compromise, the purity of the happy ever after fades. The savior must harden themselves against the pleas of the very people they set out to save in the first place. How long then is it until they become just another tyrant, wrapped in lethal intrigues, where the weak and innocent shed their blood for the gains of the wealthy and the powerful? Maybe Geralt of Rivia won't choose between two evils, but what about Lucien the Divine? We already know that Lucien's Ever After is anything but happy. We know that his best efforts to raise Damien were subverted by Yagurna and the Black Ring, and yet, despite all the death Damien has wrought, I believe Lucien did the right thing. As long as Damien lived, there was always a chance that he'd find his own path rather than be bound to invisible shackles of fate that had been forged long before he was ever born. Perhaps if Lucien hadn't executed Yagurna, Perhaps if he'd been honest with Damien first, let him choose for himself, had faith in him. Who knows? But in the end, war raged and people died. The Black Ring came on, united by their living god. And while we know Lucian won, while we know that Damien was defeated and banished to Nemesis, we are now about to discover the terrible toll paid for that victory. Because, among other things, Lucian the Divine is dead. Without jumping to the end right away, there is at least one version of events where Original Sin 2 and the Dragon Knight Saga can happen in the same continuity. But, depending on certain choices you make, especially at the end, these could be divergent timelines. We'll drill down into that later though, as we have much bigger fish to fry. For over a thousand years since the fall of the Void Dragon, Source has been pure, and sorcerers no longer tainted and destined for madness and self-destruction. However, sometime after Lucian's death, something went horrifically wrong, as using Source began tearing the veil, and through these rents, the Voidwoken poured in to devour and ravage the land of Rivalon. While the Divine is now dead, the Divine Order is still very powerful, and in a bid to protect the world from Source, have embarked on a zealous crusade to round up all sorcerers, collar them with twisty contraptions forged by the Mad King Bracchus Rex, so that they cannot use their power and send everyone, man, woman, child, human, elf, dwarf or lizard, all of them, to Fort Joy to be quarantined like plague victims and saved from their own source. And it's onto one such ship that our new heroes find themselves bound and being shipped off to meet whatever fate the Divine Order has planned for them. And to be honest, the Magisters leading the charge don't seem to be all that nice about it. It seems Rivalon is heading into somewhere very dark. If only there was a new divine to guide them. Since in their own words, Larian received a lot of flack for the story of Original Sin, this was one area they really wanted to improve upon for the sequel. Creating a game, especially an RPG, is the conversion of many different elements that smash and roil together, changing and overwriting each other, until they settle into some kind of harmony. While you could start a game with a story, you are on a fast track to creating hard limitations in your world design and mechanics that, depending on your situation, could be a blessing or a curse. Let's consider Final Fantasy VII for a moment. 
It's entirely possible that this game started as a cool dystopian sci-fi story, and from there a world was developed and mechanics that would make sense in that world were created. However, it's just as likely, if not more so, that the developers were experimenting with a classless leveling system as a way to innovate on their existing game formula. They were looking into ways that characters could equip a variety of spells and skills and swap them out at any time to create a fluid and versatile custom class system. They then started to think about the kind of society where these things could be bought and sold in shops, and a story and a world blossomed from there. So everything informs everything else, and there's no correct way to really start. As all these elements collide, with even things like music changing the pacing of a game, a lot of iteration takes place, with changes to one element being influenced by the introduction of another, and things that were good in one build being dropped for the next. This is actually one of the more dangerous aspects of game design, as indecision and feature creep shuffles you ever closer to the precipice hanging over the void of development hell. But it's also the way a team finds the very best version of a game that they can make. By leaving the story to later in development, Larian set up limitations as certain ideas would require massive sections of the game to be remade, and that would take up a lot of time, and so settled on a fairly basic good versus evil RPG story, with the evil being represented as a dragon so it could be fought with swords and spells. They likewise had lots of good side stories for their world and side characters, they just didn't do anything original in how they presented these to the player. I hope I've made it clear that I really like Original Sin's story, but that doesn't for a second mean that I don't think it could have been better. From the word go, writers in the Dublin office were exchanging ideas with developers in the Quebec office, and Larian actually opened up the story and writing ideas to everyone who was working on the project. While some of those ideas stuck, they eventually found themselves in a too many cooks kind of situation, where they had too many ideas and not enough focus and clear direction. As such, they eventually had to cut off anyone not on the writing team from having input, and even wound up reducing said team to about two members, who still somehow managed to disagree about things. In the end, everyone has ideas, but they may not be the right ideas for this project. So we have a much deeper and far more compelling narrative this time, painted in various shades of grey. We have an entire rogues gallery of villains who are complex and hateful, with interesting motivations of their own, while some are even sympathetic and arguably right in their actions. There are many, many twists and turns along the critical path, with all manner of difficult and morally ambiguous decisions to make, and perhaps, most importantly of all, we have well-developed heroes from a variety of backgrounds, all with an equal stake in the story. While Original Sin 1's main story was focused on the two Source Hunters, with the other guys just along for the ride, Original Sin 2 follows a Highlander, there can be only one premise, and every character, with the exception of course of Hirelings, has as much right to be that one as any other. The one in this case is the next Divine. From fairly early in the story, our characters have visitations from one divinity or another, depending on your chosen race who informs them that they are not only sorcerers, but in fact, Godwoken. A very special kind of sorcerer with the potential to ascend to be the next divine. For unknown reasons though, there can be only one divine, and your character's god is adamant that it be them and not their companions. This creates compelling drama as our heroes come together, deepen their bonds while ultimately knowing that for any one of them to truly succeed in their task, the others must fail. Character creation this time then has a new feature. While you can create your own completely custom avatar, now choosing from several races, including undead versions of them, you have the option of picking one of six Origins characters to be your main player character. Origins characters are predefined and have their own backstories and motivations. These stories are going to catch up with them all through their adventures across Rivalon and add something quite personal to the experience. Given that at least three more of these characters will make up your party, you'll get to peek into their stories too, and play a part in the outcomes of them. Likewise, the stories of the characters you don't involve yourself with will still play out after a fashion. For example, I didn't join up with the Dwarven Outcast Beast for my adventures, but there were still several significant quests that revolved around the Dwarves and their Queen that I got mixed up in. 
It was great. It just didn't have the touch of personal investment that I'd have got from having him in my party. You also don't have to have Losa in your party to wind up in a confrontation with the Doctor later in the game. But it sure is more interesting if you do. So, who are our six would-be saviors of the land? Well, first there's the exiled noble, the Red Prince. A truly charming fellow, to say the least. I'm sad to say I must deny you the opportunity to be my slave. His quest revolves around a fabled meeting with another red-scaled lizard, and the offspring that will come from their union. Then there's the enchanting bard with something sinister whispering in her ear, Losa. She has lived her life as a host to a variety of spirits, and now finds herself in the company of something very powerful and malevolent, that has no plans to leave now that it's taken up residence within her. Then there's the man with a voice like honey and eyes like fire, Ifan. He was once a soldier in the service of Lucian, and was tasked with releasing Death Fog into a Black Ring camp. A disgusting business for sure made worse by the fact the Black Ring was dug into the Alvin forests he had grown up in, and fighting the people who raised him. The bombs, through some fault, went off early, and he lost everyone that day, and was left with only a lot of unanswered questions. Sebel and Beast were not in my party for this game, but the pieces of their story that I did catch seemed rather interesting, and it'll be great to dive into those on a replay. And then there was the character that I mained, the absolute chad of all divinity, the arcane scholar and last of the Eternals, Fane. As per your own testimony, you have the taste buds of a dung beetle, the fashion sense of a monkey in a clown suit, and your personal hygiene reminds one of a carcass rotting in the sun. Man makes a good first impression. Fane isn't just a regular undead that shuffled out of some forgotten crypt though. He is an Eternal, a member of a lost Atlantean-esque race that existed before any of the others who has awoken from imprisonment to find no mention of the world he left behind or his people in any history books, and is now wondering, what the hell happened to them all? But all of these mighty champions, even Fane for all his greatness, pale in comparison to the true hero of Rivalon, Solora, and more importantly, his undead cat, Quirkus. Forward, Quirkus! Ride like the wind, my clacking friend! To go through each character in depth would take up a lot of time, and it's definitely something you should discover for yourself. I do strongly recommend using an Origins character for a first playthrough, if not for your main, at least for your party. It gives a wonderful personal quality to many of the events in the game, and while Circle of Protection is an absurdly useful spell, the powers some of these guys rock, like Fane's Bend Time, that lets someone gain an extra turn immediately after their first, are really useful. It should be noted here that while Fane is a scholar and his default class is Necromancer, that goes with his cool undead look, I had had so much fun playing a Shadowblade with Durzo in the first game, that I wanted to use that on my main in this one too. So maybe just imagine that prior to his scholarly life he was an eternal street urgent and picked up some skills. When recruiting party members too, they will also offer up a variety of roles they can fill in a party, meaning you don't have to decide who to bring along based on what your party needs, but rather you can choose the characters you are most interested in knowing the stories of. So we've got an interesting collection of heroes. So what's our conflict? The primary conflict of Original Sin 2 centers around our Godwoken characters attempting to achieve the power of divinity in order to stand against the invading forces of the Voidwoken, and once again cut them off from Rivalon, and return life to some semblance of peace. To do this however, they must first escape imprisonment from Fort Joy, an island bastion that is full of magisters, guards, and all manner of twisted things left behind by Bracchus Rex. Then they must unlock the full potential of their sorcerer powers, and get to a fabled island known only as the Nameless Isle, where they might drink from the Well of Ascension. I guess we can add Brandon Sanderson to the list of writers people at Larian like. And ascending to be the new divine. The problem is, there are plenty of people who don't want that to happen. Certainly our old enemies the Black Ring return, but there are now threats from within the very divine order itself. After Lucian's death, the Order became fragmented, splitting off into the Paladins, the Magisters, and the Seekers, all of whom have very different ideas about how to handle this crisis. 
Then there is the threat of the Voidwoken themselves. These things appear as beasts at first, but we soon realise that something very powerful is manipulating them beyond the veil, and whispers of the existence of a God King of the Void soon develop into a very real and dangerous threat. On top of this though, there are a host of other conflicts happening all at once. The Dwarven Queen has seized large supplies of Death Fog and seems to have her eyes set upon the destruction of the City of Arks. The Shadow Prince of the Lizard People stalks the Red Prince while playing a deadly game of cat and mouse with the Elves, who seem to have malevolent intentions of their own. And in the Great City, Ahila hides a terrible secret and has designs to ensnare our charismatic bard Losa. But more disturbingly is the actions of the gods themselves. These supposedly wise and benevolent beings act much more like spoiled children than gods, and each is adamant that their chosen be the one to ascend, even if that means betrayal and death for their companions. Why? Why, the greater good of course. That most bitter of lies, that the self-righteous and the zealous use to excuse and hide from the consequences of their actions and justify any amount of cruelty in achieving their goals. Say whatever you want about the Black Ring, kill as many of them as you can find, but at least you know where you stand with them, and whatever excuses they make to justify their actions, they won't try to tell you it's for your own good while they feed you your own guts and burn out your eyeballs. The game starts with the heroes imprisoned at Fort Joy. There's quite the drama on the ship getting here, but it otherwise starts with our main character washing up on the beach and making his way to the main keep and bumping into a few other survivors along the way who present the idea that they may be better off sticking together than trying to survive by themselves. It should be noted here as well that Original Sin 2 allows for four people to play together, so those four party members can be your friends. You can go on an adventure together, or if you disagree with how a situation should be handled, because there can be only one, become antagonistic to each other. I got my start playing this game in an online game with friends and strongly recommend it. Being imprisoned is actually a great hook to start this kind of narrative, as it establishes a goal and a common enemy without even saying that much. We meet a variety of magisters in our early exploration of the ship, some sympathetic, others anything but. However, they are all enemies as they stand between us and freedom, and we don't need to be told that we want to escape to start thinking about it. There is also the sense that this so-called cure for our source isn't something we really want to encounter, as while Bracchus Rex was known for purging the source from others, he wasn't exactly gentle about it. I mean, remember his cure for a soul forge? Remember Cassandra? Remember how that went? You never mess with my cat. One area where Original Sin 2 differs from the previous game is that it is divided into four hubs that mark four distinct chapters of the game, these being Fort Joy and its surrounding island, Reaper's Coast, the Nameless Isle, and the City of Arks. The major difference here is while you can revisit the entirety of Original Sin's map whenever you want, even going all the way back to the beach where you start the game, ending a chapter in 2 will close that area off forever, and in the case of the Nameless Isle, quite explosively. The Prison Break chapter reintroduces us to many of the game's mechanics and sets the ball rolling on the story. It introduces the plot threads for the main character's personal stories, lets us meet the likes of Dallas the Hammer, who is going to be a recurring problem throughout the game, and get a full measure of her character. It teaches us more about Bracchus Rex from the many cruel and demented torments he inflicted on others, and we even have our first encounter with our deity and gain the mantle of Godwoken. Still, the game really opens up around Reaper's Coast, and this is the location that takes up the majority of the playtime, so I'd like to keep my analysis to this area. Reaper's Coast is itself a collection of different locations, each with its own unique feel and interesting stories about them. At the most extreme end of this we have the Blood Moon Isle. This is a demon infested quarantine zone surrounded by death fog. The tile set here calls straight back to Nemesis in Beyond Divinity, with its many strange organic growths and sense of impending dread. But we also have a large cemetery filled with spirits and considerably more macabre things. 
ruined fortresses and cathedrals, farmland, a large quarry and subterranean mine, and a place that looks like a meteor recently smashed into it. All of this surrounds the fishing town of Driftwood. What is it with Larian and fishing towns? The driving force behind our exploration of Reaper's Coast is the quest Powerful Awakening that initiates when we wind up in communion with one of the seven deities who task us with increasing our powers so that we can ascend to become the next divine. To do this, we need to enlist the services of several very powerful sorcerers and have them teach us how to sorcerer better. Larian took their N plus one quest design to another level with this game, and there is little to no limitation on how to go about completing quests. In Fort Joy, you are presented with a multitude of options for escaping. So many, in fact, it's a wonder anyone stays there at all. But you also have the option to just figure it out for yourself, explore until something presents itself, and follow that course wherever it leads. It leads to some strange places. You there, boy. Did Brackus send you? Is he ready to apologize? There are seven sorcerers that you can approach, and given that you only need to get training from two to increase your source points pool from one to its maximum of three, you're welcome to ignore the rest, though I wouldn't exactly recommend it. For all the agency you have, you are still gated by your character's level. This game is much tighter than the previous. Everything from action point economy to the boosts you get from a single level up is something you are really going to feel. This means that fighting enemies even one or two levels higher than you could be nearly impossible, while any powers that grant more action points can make you incredibly formidable. This incidentally makes green tea, a drink that reduces action point cost of any action by two, quite possibly the most overpowered buff in the game. Imagine that, a world of magic and alchemy, and a little caffeine is still the most potent drink you can get. This basically means that there is a clearly suggested route through Reaper's Coast, and that you really don't want to cut out of here early, lest you be underleveled for what is to come. That being said, we aren't looking to rush to the end anyway. Reaper's Coast has a lot of stories and intrigues for us to get mixed up in. It's here we'll uncover the threads of the plot to gas the City of Arcs with Death Fog, encounter a powerful, immortal demon hunter who will attempt to help Losa with her unique problems, and even stumble into an ancient eternal crypt and find another survivor of Fane's people who has some very, very bad news for him. I am talking about the war. A war of such devastation. It was never thought possible. A war brought on by your unfathomable stupidity. It's quite the journey, but for all the excitement and intrigue, it's not without its frustration. My first big criticism here is that all of these stories are just roads to boss fights. Every. Single. One. Either the sorcerer in question tries to kill you, or they need you to kill someone on their behalf, and that gets more than a little tedious. Now, the combat is absolutely awesome in this game, don't get me wrong, but this is an RPG, and there is clearly a focus on player agency and immersive sim elements here, so it would have been nice to have some variety in these missions, especially because of how underpowered I started to feel the further I dug into this. Another issue that I had in both original Sin games is the puzzle design. If we consider the main gameplay loop to be a massive puzzle unto itself, where you have to figure out good builds, routes around the map, what it's better to spend your money on, how to divide and conquer larger enemy forces, etc. This part is great, but some of the actual puzzle puzzles just bring the pacing of the game to a grinding halt. There are several big offenders, but this mess in particular in arcs is probably the biggest. It's very slow, tedious, and obtuse. Of course, everyone reacts differently to puzzles, and they're not everyone's cup of tea. But as someone who played the entire Longest Journey saga last year, I think I'm entitled to weigh on this just a little. A good puzzle is one that I want to figure out. Many of the tougher boss battles in this game are a great example. Sure, I screamed and rage quit a few times, but I always came back. But these... I don't think I even gave them more than one try before opening a wiki page and getting the answer. I get that Lucian's Tomb is meant to be this Indiana Jones, Dungeons and Dragons style thing, 
But that's no excuse for grinding your entire game to a halt a matter of moments before the big final showdown to do something that has never come up at any point prior in the game. These puzzles are rare, but they were a big enough problem that I think it was worth bringing up. I'd say it was about the time I got to fighting Mordus that I began to feel underpowered for the first time in the game, and began to get very frustrated. At this time though, there was so much of Reaper's Coast that I hadn't explored, that it seemed entirely possible that I could grind up some levels to take the sting out of this. For a while, I was really trying, but I found myself coming up against a lot of brick walls in this regard. Much of the rest of the island is leveled to stronger characters, and I certainly wasn't prepared for that. While I did eventually crack this nut, I bring it up because in his GDC talk, Sven actually highlighted this area for this reason. As before, Larian had used early access to both promote early sales, but also get a lot of feedback from Kickstarter backers, who basically became playtesters. However, only the first chapter was available for early access, and while by release this was really tight, there were some problems with the other chapters. Reaper's Coast especially was too easy. It turned out that their in-house playtesters were so used to playing the game that they'd started doing runs with three-man teams to give themselves a challenge, and as such, the feedback on the difficulty was unreliable. This led Larian to basically brute forcing in a difficulty spike via a patch. While I am playing the definitive edition with all its updates and patches, I really noticed this. Still, I was, through perseverance and cunning, a lot of cunning, able to get enough XP and gold together to boost my overall damage output and finally crack this nut. It would have helped if I'd known I only had to kill Mordus and not his minions, to be honest. And after that domino fell, the rest came down like a house of cards in a very satisfying way. In fact, let's take a minute to talk about how all that works. The principal change to combat from Original Sin 1 to 2 is the armor system. It's something that might seem small on the surface but actually has a massive impact on how you approach combat and character builds, especially for the late game. In his GDC talk, Sven explained that the new armor system was meant to be much easier to read than the older one, and would signal clearly to players when a status effect was going to stick, and when it wasn't, versus just doing the rolls under the table. As such, armor-based damage reduction and protection from any debilitating statuses are displayed at energy bars above your character's head. Grey for physical, and blue for magical. While some attacks have a piercing effect, meaning they can negate armor to directly damage health, you'll need to wear these energy bars down first before you can both get at someone's health, and remove the threat they pose with statuses like knockdown or shock. The first difference this poses is that you, mostly, won't be initiating fights with some kind of devastating AoE attack to remove combatants before things have even started. There are a few exceptions like Thunderstorm that are so powerful they can rend armor from enemies and get to work on them straight away, but these spells come with a greater price attached to them as we'll discuss later. While high damage output attacks like Cripple combined with their reasonably short cooldown time means they are still viable in the opening rounds, people coming to this game after finishing the first one could end up blowing all their good skills way too early and finding themselves in a tougher position later when they have their enemies vulnerable but all their battlefield control skills are on cooldown. So, how you start a fight and the skills you pull out first is something you need to think about. In an enemy group, for example, it's usually quite easy to pick out the major threats, such as named boss enemies. If they happen to have high initiative, which they usually do, yep, that cheap tactic is back, you'll very often get a taste of their strategies and abilities, and know whether or not you want to strip them of armor as quickly as possible, and get them under control, or thin out their allies first, as they'll no doubt go down faster. It's an interesting balancing act, and I will say that for the most part, you are better off putting most of your energy into bringing down named enemies rather than cronies. Their damage output is just too high to leave unchecked, and on several occasions entire fights can end once the named enemy is killed, or at least brought to very low hit points. This does however mean that minion enemies will be free to gang up on certain characters. My guess is conjurers go a long way to easing that load by summoning various things to distract them, 
but it's also possible to control some of these early in the battle, as they may often only have one kind of armour. And just like in the first game, any enemy shown of magical armour is wide open to a charm arrow or grenade. Losa was my main magic user, and I invested heavily into Aerotherge and Hydrosophist skills to basically remake the build that Jahan had been from the first game. He had been far too useful in my playthrough with his abilities to slip and stun enemies while healing allies. The tactician players watching this will already be screaming bloody murder at my 3-1 setup here. That is to say, three members who can damage physical armour and one who damages magic. This is a huge tactical misstep for higher difficulties, but not such an issue on balanced. Since there were usually enemies in a group with low magic armour, I knew Losa could stun one or several of them in her turn, removing them from the fight and allowing me to focus my attention on more dangerous targets with the other three. Hypermobility is another incredible upgrade to combat. There are numerous powers from Cloak and Dagger to Phoenix Dive that are basically super jump powers, and enable characters to rapidly move around the battlefield and get into and out of all kinds of trouble as quickly as possible. I cannot stress the importance of having at least one of these on every character, and in the case of a good rogue, maybe even two. Since I was playing Fane as a Shadowblade, I'd routinely have him diving behind enemy lines to shear the physical armour off potent enemies, turn them into chickens, it never stops being funny, and then turn invisible or just play dead. For a good chunk of the game too, I had him wearing the DLC Vulture's armour that, as well as looking insanely cool, though not quite as cool as the pirate one. Yeah, this is what winning looks like. Also grants a permanent set of wings to prevent surfaces and ground based traps from doing any harm, and provide an extra super jump, granting him an additional option to escape sticky situations quickly. The utility of this meant I kept wearing the armour long after its meagre defensive powers were all but useless should he be hit. Fortunately though, that almost never happened. He almost felt like playing Predator Mode Batman for the way he could pop up and attack people before slipping away to safety. These abilities are also great for getting archers to high ground where they'll gain a damage bonus, and getting melee characters up close and personal fast. Just expect the same tactics to be employed against you as well. The surfaces that were such a standout feature of the first game are very much back. In early builds of the game, Larian experimented with introducing a variety of new surfaces, but found that players had a lot of trouble intuiting what these meant at a glance, and were often forgetting what they did or mixing them up. So instead, a much simpler system was introduced. All of the existing surfaces return, but they now have a blessed or cursed status. The most common one you'll come up against is Cursed Fire, that sets the Necrofire status. This fire cannot be put out by simply casting water on it, as it must be blessed first to reset it to normal. I can say without any reservation that Cursed Fire was a terrible idea. It's one of the few additions that honestly made me enjoy playing this game less than the first one. It may not be such a problem on a replay, but given Larian had abandoned multiple new surfaces because the feedback was people couldn't easily intuit their effect, a slightly different shade of orange for a much more serious version of fire was clearly ill-advised, especially when you consider that some people who play this game could be colorblind. Either way, this frustrated the hell out of me, especially when I'd cast Bless on the fire, put it out, only to have an enemy just reset the status in their turn. Remember, source points are a finite resource, and have many uses beyond putting out fire so I always found this stuff to be immensely cheap and annoying to deal with. Oh come on Arkham, I hear you say. It can't be that bad, can it? Really? Can't it? So I mentioned Bless and other source point related powers. This is one of the new additions to the skill system and has a considerable impact on the game. Firstly, it's much quicker to level up skills now, as you need only one skill point per level versus the exponential cost increase in Original Sin 1. It's also possible to rank skills all the way up to 10, 
and skill books have much lower level caps and are more readily available. This is offset first by the memory system that limits the number of skills you have readily available based on your memory score, similar to how wizards in D&D can know many more spells than they can cast in a day. And by some skills requiring the expenditure of multiple action points and source points in order to execute. At the start of the game, after you've got that wretched source collar off, you only have one source point available, and can only charge it by finding pools of condensed source on the ground, or, if you're lucky, a big tank of the stuff stored up by the likes of Bracchus Rex. The entire Reaper's Coast chapter is about expanding that collection of points to three, gaining the source vampirism skill to literally suck source out of ghosts, and learning how to use this power on other targets such as animals, corpses, and even Void Woken. This is all to power the most devastating attacks, and turn you into the avatar of godhood you have been chosen to become. The most basic power is Bless, which acts as a counter to curses, and can be cast on characters and surfaces. If the surface is neutral, it will create a Bless surface, or if the surface is cursed, it'll be reset to neutral. The individual characters all have their own unique source powers too, though these probably needed balancing a little better. While Fane's Bend Time Power was easily one of the most useful, I hardly use Losa's Madness or the demonic based ability she acquires later at all. Ifan's Wolf was useful as a distraction for certain enemies, but doesn't pack that much of a punch. And I can't tell you off the top of my head what the Red Prince's power is, as I don't think I ever used it. All of the class skills have potent source powers like Thunderstorm and Daggers Drawn. These became staples of my late game tactics, especially after my big respec in arcs, which we'll talk about later. The majority of these changes, along with the better animations and sound effects, made the combat overall smoother, clearer, and much more exciting and tactical than Original Sin 1. But there were still a lot of problems, the biggest being the number of ambushes and learn by dying scenarios that I kept running up against. Of course I expect to be ambushed and thrown onto the back foot at points in a game like this. Hidden enemies or surprise resurrections can be exciting. The Salaman fight is a great example. When he came back from the dead both hastened and enraged, my heart was pounding as I rethought all my next moves. I was already worn down from the fight and I couldn't let him have any actions on my characters at any cost. Likewise, the Titan pop at the end of the Nameless Isle was a pure adrenaline rush. I never once entertained quick loading and trying to get a more advantageous roll of the dice. I was in the fight, I was in the game, and I was going to pay in blood and tears to win this. But there are, as with the first game, too many moments where I found myself screaming, how was I supposed to see that coming, before quick loading and starting again. There likewise weren't enough fights where I got to case a location first come up with a clever strategy, and place my characters in advantageous positions before things started. This led to me once again employing cheesy tactics like sending one member ahead to start the fight, draw out any hidden enemies, and then hold up the initiative while I snuck the rest of my team into position, and gave them each an out of initiative action to bring them in. I'd still call this a feature rather than a bug, but I'd have been overall less inclined to try and screw the game over if it wasn't so obsessed with doing that to me. It was around the later half of the Nameless Isle though that I started to feel underpowered for the second time, and found myself looking for even more creative solutions to my combative troubles. There are some bangers to be sure. This whole robot fight can be won just by stealing the power cores out of them, and I managed to avoid an entire fight with some elves by dropping a death fog bomb and fleeing the scene to let the Shadow Prince detonate it. When the Kraken turned up in the Ark's port, I brought it down by simply finding a well-covered position outside of its range of attacks, and picking it off with arrows from afar. But I soon ran out of battles that could be cheese like this, and I was starting to wonder if maybe I'd done something wrong to always be feeling so out of my depth. In the end, I took to Reddit with an overview of my party, and asked if I'd made any errors. The feedback was mostly from serious tactician players, who said that I wasn't killing things fast enough, and I should be building a party focused on overwhelming offense to rip through armor and gain battlefield control as fast as possible. This made perfect sense, but what did shock me was the overwhelming consensus that Constitution 
is trash. The far more aggressive AI in Tactician play means that any character who loses their armor is as good as dead, as they won't be able to recover from debilitating statuses. As such, extra hit points and even healing spells are a waste of time, and I was advised to move all those points into my primary offensive stats. Understanding the armor system, this made sense, but it conflicted with every impulse I have as an RPG gamer, and strikes me as a massive oversight in the armor system. I'd had numerous encounters playing on balance difficulty that had ended with my characters all shorn of armor and almost out of HP. I wanted to tell them that they were wrong, crazy even, but after reading through it all, I knew they weren't. So with great reluctance, I moved my constitution points into strength and finesse and swapped the prince from sword and shield to two-handed and oh my god, things changed. I had gone from barely hanging on to utterly decimating foes in single turns, especially when high on caffeine, and this continued through all the late game battles. I was a demigod, an unstoppable force of nature, and anything foolish enough to get in my way was gonna have to deal with it. When it comes to gods, the old religious pantheons of civilizations like Rome or Egypt make a lot more sense to me than where all the main religions of the West have wound up at this point in time. The gods of the old religions were really just personifications of natural forces, and their mythology no doubt developed over longer periods of time between different cultures that eventually got smashed together through wars and other societal movements. These gods are not all that different from the mortal races. They are as much slaves to their vices as we are, and in some cases, even finite creatures that can and will die someday. It makes sense for a world and people made by creatures such as these to be flawed and unfair. And we've got our fair share of heroes who even go so far as to challenge them for a better deal. One of whom actually wins. Within the Divinity Saga, the gods have, with one exception, been as aloof and separated from the world as those in most stories. Their only direct intervention that we know of was sending an angelic being to mark Lucian, and their work in actually making Lucian into their agent to battle the Demon of Lies. We have always then assumed that while the Seven Divinities may be fickle or capricious as other gods like Zeus or Odin, they are, for the most part, on the side of good. Divinity Original Sin 2, however, is about pulling back the veil and revealing some ugly truths hidden behind it. Far from being fundamental forces that combine to create something beautiful with only the most benevolent of intentions, we discover that the Seven Divinities are in fact members of the lost race of Eternals who conspired to empower themselves with Source and elevate themselves to the level of Divinities. They didn't create Rivalon, but rather shaped it from what it was into what it is now, and their motivation in creating their chosen races is really about maintaining their own power by siphoning the source of the people who worship them. They are in effect, no different from the demons. This part of the story is related by the Eternal Aetira, and it seems Fane was instrumental in this transition of power, as he was the one to discover the source. The King of the Eternals forbade Fane to research this power for reasons never fully explained, but seven Eternal Nobles conspired to undermine the King's wishes and overturn his rule. In the resulting conflict that came from all of this, Fane was caught and imprisoned, an act that actually saved him because the Seven Divinities eventually overpowered the Eternals and cast them into the Void. They are deceivers and parasites. They are self-serving and terrified of losing their power and finally having to face the consequences of their actions. This becomes more and more apparent with every interaction we have with them as we discover that something has been sapping their power which is what has weakened the veil between Rivalon and the Void, and enabled the Eternals, now the Void Woken, to invade. I am not a fan of gods at the best of times. The idea of an overbearing parent who constantly looks over my shoulder and casts judgement on my every action doesn't sit well with me. The concept of someone demanding I show constant love and gratitude for a gift they supposedly gave me smacks of insincere motives in giving that gift as does the threat of eternal punishment for not bowing and scraping at their feet and teaching my children to do the same. These gods in particular though, really disgusted me. They are con artists, charlatans, and I must say, when we finally came to blows on the Nameless Isle, 
I was very flattered to be paid such a compliment by Amadia before we battled. You are the worst mistake I have ever made. The journey to Ascension comes to an end when, at the moment we reach the Well of Ascension, now revealed to be ancient eternal technology, Dallas and her Majesties appear and destroy it, preventing the chance of anyone ever becoming a divine again. The end of this thread leads us to exploring the city of Arx for answers. In Arx, all of our threads are finally tied up. We see the tension between the Paladins and the Magisters come to an explosive conclusion that does not go well for the Magisters. We finally encounter a drama leak, the demon that has been trying to dominate Losa and steal her life away. It goes about as well as the battle with the Demon of Lies to be fair, maybe a little faster. Actually, time this. The Red Prince finally meets the woman who would be his bride, and meets their children, and they are just adorable. Look at this little dude! And there are reckonings aplenty for Fane and Ifan beneath the cathedral in the crypt of Lucian the Divine. Getting in there though, requires us to look up our old friend Ahu in. What the hell? Yo, 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 bro. 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 Did you hurt my cat? And once below the cathedral, this mystery is fully unraveled as we discover that Lucian the Divine is far from dead. I wanted to bring up this particular thread because it really is a hell of a way to wrap up this exploration of the Divinity Saga. Remember, we started this journey as Lucian. In my case, he was a mage who wanted to use his magic to heal the world. He went on a quest fought evil people and powerful demons, and rose to become not just a hero, but a champion of the Seven Divines, and an exemplar of all things good and right in the world. But the man we meet here, this man, this man has seen too many terrible things, and has made some truly terrible choices. Lucian was informed about the truth of the gods and the threat of the God King by Dallas, who is in fact Fane's daughter. She too was imprisoned and spared from being cast into the void, and assumed this new guise thanks to the Mask of the Shapeshifter. Learning of this new threat, Lucian decided that he needed to repair the Veil and cut out the Void Woken completely from Revelon. To do this though, he would need to return all the Source back to where it came from. This meant that all Sorcerers must be purged of their power, that the Gods themselves must die, and that he must also give up his divinity. While I think Lucian in the first game would have willingly sacrificed himself, and maybe even fought the gods to save Rivalon, I don't for a second think he could condemn so many sorcerers to having their souls hollowed out and being turned into mindless puppets. And it's worth pointing out at this point that his own son Alexander was also a sorcerer and a godwoken, and that he too wouldn't be spared from this genocide. Faking his own death and hiding in this vault was a way of becoming invisible to the gods, and operating without fear of their retribution. When we explore the Academy of the Seven on the Nameless Isle, we find out just how dirty his hands got. Here we meet the spirits of many sorcerers, and even Godwoken, who were training to ascend, and here we see the memories of their end laid bare. Some were poisoned, some had their throats cut, but all could clearly see that it was Lucian who ended their lives. The Divine traded the lives of the sorcerers, inflicted pain and misery on their families, brought terror to manipulate the masses, and ultimately murdered hundreds if not thousands of people, all for that worst of lies, the greater good. So what happened? What could possibly have poisoned this man so much that he would transform himself from a saviour into a murdering tyrant, and not even have the courage to let people see what he had become? Well. Damien happened, Yagurna happened, the Black Ring happened. Lucian no doubt blames himself for every life that Damien took. He sees Damien's fall as the fault of a single decision he made to spare the boy, 
and not as a collection of events, some of which were especially orchestrated, that led him there. His heart is broken for the son he raised as his own and ultimately betrayed him, and now he discovers that even the divines he served and stood for are barely better than the demons. And so, faced with the choice to spare innocent sorcerers but endanger the lives of many, many more, he can't risk making the same mistake twice. The burden of leadership is a heavy one, and I could almost forgive Lucien were it not for one person. Dallas is a vile creature, filled with hate and vengeance. It's clear even from our first meeting with her what a truly disgusting creature she has become. She is right in seeking justice for the harm done to her, and to fear the return of the God King, for the Void has truly twisted him up into something wretched. But she is also filled with hate and vengeance herself. She doesn't want justice, she wants to hurt those who hurt her, and I've no doubt her influence in this played a big part in how it played out. This doesn't excuse Lucien for heeding her advice and not seeking other options, unfortunately. In a way, it's just as bad, if not worse. He let himself be led down a very dark path. He may have had limited options for dealing with the Void Woken, and none of them may have been that great, but Dallas is the reason he chose this, she, no doubt, playing on his existing weaknesses. They even go to the lengths of reviving the Source King Bracchus Rex and enslaving him. An arrangement that, I'm actually glad to say, doesn't work out. I'm going to be honest, it was very difficult to choose an ending here. On one hand, I fully embrace shaking up a status quo, especially one that places tyrannical creatures like the Seven Divines on the top. But I also had no desire to see Lucian simply return from the dead and resume his job of running the world. While I wouldn't have condemned so many to seal the veil, the fact that it was already done made surrendering my source a viable option, but it would mean that Lucian gets to walk away from his crimes without repercussions. It wasn't an easy choice, but in this case, by giving up my source, I feel I chose… the lesser evil. You might even say, I decided to put a little faith in the greater good, after all. In the aftermath of it all, we find ourselves back aboard our ship, the Lady Vengeance, a living boat that has been our second home through most of this adventure. There are tearful goodbyes and, well, despite it all, Ethan really didn't agree with my final choice. And so with all that finished, the wind calls to our hero and they set sail for their next adventure. Original Sin 2 released in September of 2018 for PC and hit consoles a year later. It received resounding praise from review outlets and players alike. To date, it has sold over 7 million copies and is considered one of the best RPGs ever made. Since most of my favourite games have a considerable nostalgia value attached to them, it's difficult for me to throw around words like favourite RPG or top 10 RPG until the game has withstood the test of time and several replays. But this is a very strong contender, that's for sure. I certainly want to do a few replays and explore other ways of enjoying the game. But let's stop and think about this now. When Larian began making RPGs all those years ago, they envisioned a game where people started shipwrecked on a beach. The characters would find each other and form into a party. They'd get involved in a huge variety of deep and interesting quests that would make the game feel unique, and be met by a world that felt very much alive and not focused on the player thanks to all manner of intricate systems running under the hood that the player might never even notice. They wanted all the characters to be playable in multiplayer so that people could go on great adventures together, and maybe even become antagonistic towards each other if their goals weren't aligned. They wanted to create a world and fill it with interesting races, each with their own rich histories, societies, and aesthetics that really helped separate their game from others, and they wanted a deep and intricate combat system that would allow for great strategy and absolute chaos, and it's all here now. For all the mistakes and setbacks they made along the way, Divinity Original Sin 2 is the game that Sven dreamed of making back when he and a few friends got together to try and make the next Ultima 7. 
It's all of that. And so, so much more. But this is not the end of Larian's story. For beyond the game you've always dreamed of making, or the story you've always dreamed of telling, is the one that you never even imagined you could. Twenty twenty three has been an incredible year for games. I'll be the first to admit to being skeptical at the end of last year. The sheer number of sequels and remakes had me concerned about a lack of innovation, but oh my god, am I glad to have been wrong. From Dead Space and RE4 Remake to Dredge, Sea of Stars, and A Space for the Unbound, to the final form of Cyberpunk 2077 and Starfield, we have been assaulted with hit after hit after hit. And most, if not all of those, have been single-player, story-rich experiences with solid gameplay and little to no post-sale BS. <sighs> what a tragedy. I guess it's possible that the current popular multiplayer FPS was terrible again. Given the amount of big names in that community complaining about games being stale, I can only assume it wasn't good. But... But then again... I hear the Battlefield crowd dropped onto a little indie wonder that is really scratching their itch. To rise to the top of this pile, especially with something a little more niche like a turn-based RPG, well, that takes something really special. So I think it's more than fair to call Baldur's Gate 3 a triumph among triumphs. Between its incredible adaptation of the 5e system, all the beautiful visuals that are far, far beyond anything any other Larian game has produced, its high-stakes plot and cast of outrageous and wonderful characters, people just haven't shut up about this game since it launched. And I'd be very surprised if it didn't take home a huge pile of Game of the Year awards. It certainly has mine. The game finished a prolonged stint in early access to release on PC an entire month early and was met with near universal praise and adoration. A little controversy did spring up about it, but Sven saw fit to weigh in on it, and I'd say that is the last word in that conversation. Of course, we can chalk up much of Baldur's Gate 3's story, world, and polish to its seven-year development cycle. But maybe, if you've watched this far, you can see that in a way, this game has been in development for much, much longer than that. As a studio, Larian have had to fail forward with previous projects, and battle with disappointments and shortcomings, but each time they learnt something that enabled them to make the next game better than the last. Every step of their journey has manoeuvred them into this position as one of the largest fully independent game studios in the world, and one that knows how to make RPGs and isn't afraid to spend time iterating on every aspect of their work to slowly but surely tease out the very best from their ideas, stories, and gameplay. The end product of this process is a game that is finished, fully functional, and hella fun to play. Remember this? The best approach I've learned is that you, you try to have fun as you make it, and then hopefully that fun is going to brush off on the player and he's gonna have fun too. While they're still all about fun, even with this darker and more realistic looking adventure, if there is a message here for developers, I'd say it's this. Make what you want and don't compromise. If you can't find a publisher that really wants to work with you to create your vision, then cut them out. I know that Larian took a lot of risks and there are plenty of versions of their story where it all goes wrong and the studio shuts down. But as we've seen on this journey, there's nothing safe about being with a publisher either. And you can fail at doing something you don't want to do as well. So don't feel like you can't do this without them. The world will be far more beautiful for the things you create without them. I know there are publishers out there that are willing to really work with developers to help them create their dreams, and if you can fall in with one of those, then great, but otherwise I'd suggest running like hell. In the end, if you deal with the devil, he will come to collect. And we can't all have legendary reborn heroes backing us up when the beast comes knocking. While Baldur's Gate 3 is not the end of Larian's story, it's a hell of a climax to everything they've endured so far. 
to face disappointment, strike out alone, leaping into the void if you will, to chase a dream and fail forward and end up creating RPGs that are loved by people all over the world? Well, that'll do I think. That'll do very nicely, indeed. In 2023, game development is much more accessible than back when Larry informed, and yet back then, a small group played Ultima 7 and started a chain of events that created so many wonderful games. I can only imagine what the people who played Original Sin 2 and Baldur's Gate 3 and thought, hey, I should make an RPG, are going to create one day. But I'm sure looking forward to finding out, and I can't wait to see what Larian makes next. Until then though, they are Larian. I am Arkham666, and this was The Legend of Rivalon. Come to me, the night is dark. Come to me, the night is long. Sing for me, I'll sing along. Sing for me, oh sing for me. You're still here. Now that is a surprise. Well, come closer to the fire. It's getting very cold out there. Thank you for seeing this through to the end with me. This has been one hell of a project. It's basically been half a year's work. I started playing Original Sin 1 in May, and back then I was naive enough to think I'd actually have all this finished by August. How wrong I was. Certainly this has been an endurance match, and I almost threw in the towel at quite a few points. I think the fun of content creation is how you can pivot between playing a game, taking notes, writing a script, recording audio, and editing the video. It's the cycle of these things that keeps it all fresh and exciting, so doing it in extended sessions covering 5 games like this was less fun overall. Still. I won't deny that this was a great experience, and I learned a lot in the process. I knew I couldn't just use my regular review format for 5 games, as that would probably get very boring, and so I needed to level up my writing editing skills and try to find a more integrated and fluid way to talk about these games. A lot of things got cut, as they were interesting but overall non-essential, and I may want to revisit a couple of these games one day in individual videos to explore them more deeply. The highlight for me though was discovering all about Larian's journey, and I'll definitely be diving more into development and studio history in my future content. It is unlikely that I'll be doing a project this big again for a very long time. If the day ever comes when I can do YouTube full time then maybe I'll do another one, but overall I think I prefer taking one game at a time. While this was a lot of work, don't think that it was unhealthy or that I've been living in my room for half a year. I'm not that lucky. I climbed several mountains in the summer, including one of the highest peaks in the northern Japan Alps, as well as going to amusement parks and having barbecues with my friends. A great deal of gaming has passed me by though. I still haven't finished Baldur's Gate 3 yet, and I'd like to have a complete playthrough for myself before I think about doing one for content. Then there's Starfield and Cyberpunk 2.02 to say nothing of a lot of little indie titles that caught my eye over the last few months. I'll probably take next month off to just enjoy my free time and play something short and fun as a palette cleanser. Maybe I'll finally get around to getting good at pixel art or Unreal Blueprints. December will be a fun review, I think. Maybe something very retro or a game I got for Christmas one year. I do however tend to play more horror games in the winter, so it may be that we go back down that rabbit hole. For now though, I think I'll just rest here by the fire and enjoy the scenery. Until next time, peace out my friends.